desktop audio on. There we go. Uh, before I get into anything else, I have to read this donation message from Leslie Meek. $20. Hi, I finally got into playing slash reading Umi Neko after catching up on your streams. Your Sea Cats plan is working. Your range of voices is incredible, and it's amazing you're doing this. So here's some thanks for the work. Thank you so much. Glad to get you all into this ride with me. So let's continue that ride, shall we? Let me just turn down my headphone volume a little bit. Oh, and there's the notification. Right on time. Well, not right on time, but... How was my dinner? My dinner was great. I love Lazagi. Okay. <clears throat> Let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Every year, the relatives who visit Rokenjima let out a sigh of admiration at the rose garden which first greets them. They stood there, talking with each other about the rose's beauty and the state of their blooming this year. There was a single unhealthy rose among them, and Maria became overwhelmed with dejection at its state. But George used his quick wits, and saying she should look after it if she felt that sorry for it, he marked it with a candy wrapper and immediately restored Maria's good mood. Wow. Austin with the soda foley. <laughs> Hi chat. Don't mind me, I'm just gonna be drinking root beer back here for the next five hours. And once Battler, with whom she had been getting along well all morning, raised the subject of Halloween that Maria loved so much, she began playing around energetically again. To Maria, those marshmallow jack-o'-lantern candies that her mother had bought for her were probably a treasure greater than any other. It seemed that several of them had been bought for her, and she demanded trick-or-treat from every person she met, giving them candy instead of the other way around. I wonder why Maria likes Halloween so much. I thought that event was pretty difficult for Japanese people to get used to. Isn't that because it's a kids' festival where they get to parade around in costumes? It's fun to play around in an outfit that's different from usual. No, I think there's probably a slightly deeper reason. After all, she's Maria-chan, the witch. Come to think of it, when we were at the airport, didn't Maria say that if she was going to wear a costume, it would be a witch? Does Maria like witches? Yes, she loves them. So much that it becomes a problem. Well, admiring fantastical stuff like that's to be expected of that age. If she'd at least chosen a heroine of some TV anime to admire, that would have been cute. <sighs> Judging by Rose's reaction, it seemed that as a mother, she did not find her daughter's love for witches pleasant. Seemingly all the cousins other than Battler were able to understand this, and they shrugged their shoulders, smiling awkwardly. Hmm? So, if you like witches, you also like Halloween, is that how it works? I guess I should just ask her myself if I don't know. Hey, Maria. What kind of relationship do Halloween and witches have with each other? As Battler asked that, George and Jessica let out a small, ah, noise. It seemed they were too late. It almost looked as though Maria had been waiting for that question. After looking happy for an instant, her expression turned a little mean, as if to say, you don't know anything, do you? It was the expression of an enthusiast who had been enraged by the ignorant statement of an outsider with a wrong impression. Literally, special interest activate. Oh. The Celts thought of the, cha the changing strength of the sun over the course of a year. As its birth, its growing up period, its aging and death, and then its revival. I get it. The sun, weak and warm in the spring, starts to grow up and become hot. And then it gradually gets weaker and worn out. Yeah, I can see how you could think of that as passing of the sun's life. Yep. So they thought that at the end of October, the sun died, rested its body in the land of the dead, and then revived again at the winter solstice. And so they celebrated the day that the sun ends its one-year lifespan and dies, calling it New Year's Eve or so- I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Sam Samhain? Sa Samhain? I don't know. I'm sure somebody in the chat probably knows better than I do about that. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm taking a sip of my drink. <coughs> Sawin. Okay. I see. 
That is c completely off from what I thought. See, I told you. I don't know anything. <laughs> that way of thinking is very interesting to say that the sun is revived on the day of the winter solstice, when the daylight hours start to grow longer again. It's an episode that makes you understand how much ancient people de deified the sun. I see. And what do witches have to do with this? It seemed that my casual urging forward had slightly infuriated Maria. She glared at me with eyes that told me to let her explain without interrupting. Maria looked like she was having fun telling me, so I decided not to interrupt. <clears throat> uh... Not excusing Rose's behavior, of course. How she treats Maria can't be excused, but I'm curious if Rose is written both as a criticism of the lack of mental health resources and lack for single moms. I would say absolutely yes. That definitely plays into the way that uh, Rosa is written. Uh, they get into that more in episode uh, four as well. In the interval between October and November, life and death become the closest they ever will. The Celts believed that this was a time when the world of the living was at its closest to that of the dead, and those not of this world. And when they would vi be visited by many inhabitants of the other world. It was like the Bone Festival in Japan. <laughs> at the time, the people believed that the souls returning to the physical world would go into people's houses or possess people to do bad things. So in order to avoid harm from them, the people invented protective rituals. One of those was to imitate creepy monsters and scare the souls instead, which was apparently a way to avoid being possessed. So that part became a festival, which turned into a costume parade. Maria's really knowledgeable. Ain't it the truth? Even I never knew Halloween had such a history. Hey, welcome MangaFan1491 uh, as a channel member. Thank you so much. But where did the whole trick-or-treat thing come from? Her knowledge was so extensive that the adults had started listening in at to, in two at some point. Maria, who was normally always treated like the youngest, puffed out her chest in pride. Rosa tried to say this was just a kid's story, and she wanted to quickly break up the circle and set the luggage down in the guest house. But nobody else agreed, and she let out a heavy sigh. Ooh, trick or treat is just for fun. It has nothing to do with what was originally a Celtic ceremony. That was created later when Christian customs were mixed in. But I think Halloween should be that way. According to Maria, the souls of the dead weren't the only ones who visited from the world of the non-human. There were also spirits that had an intimate connection to how people lived. It was because humans received the favor of those spirits that they were able to earn a wonderful blessing. And a year's worth of good crops. So, in other words, Halloween was also a bit of a harvest festival? I see. Now that you mention it, I get the feeling that October's a turning point in various ways. Seasonally, too. <clears throat> uh, ERA, so that's the purple pin. Am I a channel member, too? Yeah, you probably got gifted it at some point. I mean, it's exactly on the other side of the year to Japan's April. Yeah, that might be a good place to mark it. Hmm. And you know, the witches that held a, co they held a coven during that time, called a Sabbath. The witches would thank the spirits they gave out blessings of prosperity and reward them. Halloween costumes are an imitation of the visitors from the other side. So then, the reason we give candy to them must be because of a feeling that they should be thanked for it for the, they should be thanked for the yearly harvest. Uh, Wayward Nebula, five pounds. So happy to finally catch your stream live. I drew a quick sketch of you as Beatrice and was wondering if it's okay to send it to you on Insta. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. I would, I would love that. Also, yeah, sorry uh, if you hear any um, plate noises. Uh, Austin's got to eat his food, too. Oh, what? Do they hear me chewing? No, they hear your plate noises, your little plate scratching. Oh, yeah. Why don't you just pick up the lasagna and eat it with your hands? Well, you see, uh, I, I tried doing that, but then it just, like, slopped all over my front. And, uh, you know... I used to be more into it when I was younger, but I don't really like just, like, lapping my food off the floor like a dog anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Understandable. We all grow out of rituals like that. Rosa, Rosa, on the other hand, she's she's in the perfect age to continue doing that, and I hope she finds something. Are you talking about Maria? No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Anywho. <laughs> oh, just 
like George and Ichan says. So, Halloween is a time when this world and that world intermingle. So, in other words, it's a precious opportunity for witches to interact with visitors from that world. Is that what you want to say? Hmm. Just like Battler says. So you know what? You know what? October is the time when the power of witches and demons is at its most vigorous and prosperous. <laughs> I'm sure Beatrice will come too. And then we'll eat the marshmallow candies together, and she'll take me to the Golden Land with her. We'll sing magical songs together, learn magic spells together, learn how to draw magic circles together. And then I'm going to learn the secrets of runes and become a great witch really, really quickly. My, my. Isn't that wonderful? It's best for kids to have dreams. By the way, Rosa, how old did Maria Chan turn this year again? M Maria, that's enough of that topic. Don't worry about it, rosa son. It's a dream that any girl has at one time or another. Th Thank you very much. But Maria has already outgrown that age. Hey, I'm telling you to stop. Rosa scolded Maria, trying to shut her up before her di cheery disposition about black magic earned her the snickers of the relatives. Well, that's a pretty large-scale dream. By the way, who was Beatrice again? Uh, what was it? Um, uh, I've heard that before. Battler had been gone for six years and had completely forgotten about the legend of the Rokenjima Witch. However, when he said that he didn't know Beatrice's name, Maria's mood, which had been so bright until just now, became sour in an instant. When he saw that, Battler immediately remembered that it was the name of the Witch of this Island, but the damage had been done. Until Maria's mood improved, many mysterious and fabulous episodes regarding the Golden Witch were drilled into his brain. That is enough, Maria. Uh, I can't remember specifically when it's going to happen, but, like, there's going to be another brief, like, Rosa being Rosa kind of moment coming up here in, like, I think a little bit somewhere around here. So, yeah, again, sorry. Uh, Rosa gets a lot of focus in this episode, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> Thank you, Batlerkun, for going along with her stories. Kanonkun, don't you have work to do? Please, leave now. Godasan, I think everyone wants to set down their bags for the time being. Sorry, but could you guide everyone to the guest house? Certainly. Well then, everyone, I will guide you to the guest house. Then if you'll excuse me. Led by Goda, the relatives headed off in the direction of the guest house. Their minds on setting down their luggage and taking a quick rest, they didn't notice that Rosa and Maria had stayed in the same spot. Yeah, that's why I was thinking I probably needed to warn for that. I, I was pretty sure that that's what was happening. <clears throat> After watching them leave towards the guest house, Rosa's features changed suddenly. She let go with the hand that had been gripping Maria's arm the whole time. There was a bright red mark there, making it clear how much excessive force she had been gripping Maria's slender arm with. That hand then smacked Maria over the head and pulled her left ear up into the air, pinching it sharply. I'm always telling you not to talk about witches. Haven't I always said that that was our promise together? Mama, it hurts, Mama. It hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Halloween, Halloween, do you ever stop? A witch festival? Who cares about the Celts? Who cares about black magic? Are you an idiot? You are nine years old. Nine. Because you made that ruckus in the train, I had to go to all the trouble of getting off and buying you those disgusting monster marshmallows that look like they, they have fluorescent paint on them. We were even late because I bought them for you. How much more will you have to embarrass me before you're satisfied? As Rosa cursed, she twisted Maria's ear up, making it seem like she was going to snap off. An expression of anguish spread across Maria's face, and she stood on her tiptoes as though her life depended on it trying to soften the pain on the air that was being pulled. If only Maria could know about the depraved slop that Rosa gets up to in her free time. Yeah, the lasagna. She has no room to, uh, to be speaking to her like this right I now. I know. Talking about marshmallows and paint and stuff. Her lasagna looks like it comes from Planet Greeble. Kay has entered the Golden Land. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Rosa suddenly stole the candy that Maria had been holding in her hand. 
Then she threw it on the ground and stepped on it over and over. To Maria, it was supposed to be proof of her memory of that span of time, however brief, when she had enjoyed going shopping with her mother. But it was being trampled by that very same mother. It was as though a brand was being pushed against Maria's eyes, leaving a mark that couldn't be erased. Who cares about this disgusting candy? Disgusting, disgusting! This is why, you see? This is why! Disgusting, disgusting, disgusting! She struck Maria's head over and over again with her palm as she spoke. She didn't hit Maria's face, because the red swelling would stand out. Maria closed her eyes tightly, patiently bearing her mother's violence. No, that wasn't quite it. Come back, Mama. Come back, Mama. Save me, Mama. Save me, Mama. Beat the bad witch. She kept bearing it, muttering that over and over. Will you listen? I told you to stop saying witch! You little... you... you... Rosa's shoulders shook as she breathed, tired from he hitting. Maria grasped her hands together, withstanding it, hoping her mother would come back quickly. Mama, Mama, come back quickly. Save me, Mama. Finish off the bad witch. Why don't you... Why don't you just stay there doing that forever? And then you can just stand there mumbling about witches and Halloween forever. After throwing those words at Maria, Rosa went off towards the guest house, leaving Maria behind. Maria, unable even to remember that it was all right to cry, kept staring down at the trampled, unrecognizable jack-o'-lantern candy. Uh, is this a thing like as the last born of her siblings, Maria is one of the few things she has power over and then when even she does what she wants, it's like she has nothing or is that not right? I would definitely say that's like an element of it. Yeah, Rosa was definitely like put down and bullied so frequently by her siblings that uh, I feel like part of her is kind of almost jealous of Maria for being so carefree and spirited despite her circumstances. She's like, you know, why should you get to be happy about something and interested in something when I suffered as a child. So like she kind of externalizes that frustration on Maria, her own daughter, because, you know, she's jealous of her happy disposition, which is super screwed up. It, it sucks. <clears throat> um, Pining tree with the $5. Rosa would be have a heart attack at the sight of an American girl sleepover. Witchcraft galore. Yeah, uh, Rosa, you, you have no idea. You have no idea, truly. <clears throat> uh, and yeah, uh, Ava is definitely not helping right now because she's kind of trying to get the one over by being like, oh yeah, how, how old's your daughter again? Hmm. Oh, curious. By basically just trying to like put her down to uh, elevate her own superiority, which is what Ava does all the time. Oh, Rosa, where did you go? I'm sorry. The roses were so wonderful, I got a bit carried away. Rosa, go set your luggage down quickly. We're gonna greet Aniki. Hmm? What happened to Maria-chan? She's still by the flower beds? Yes. It looks like there was a rose she liked, and she said she wanted to look after it and wouldn't listen. I decided to let her do what she wants for a while. We sometimes forget that girls have their own little world. Sometimes we have to respect that, right? That's right. Thank you for caring, Kyrie and san Go to san Where's our room? I'll guide you. This way. Allow me to hold your luggage. I'm fine. I can carry it myself. Thank you. <clears throat> Rosa went into the room that Goda had guided her to. Closing the door somewhat violently, she threw her luggage on top of the bed. She got down on her knees in front of the bed and buried her face in it. For a while, Rosa made as if to shred the sheets with her fingernails, sobbing continually. Maria-sama, are you all right? Kanon, who had been hiding behind a thicket, appeared after watching Rosa leave. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Maria laughed unpleasantly, but to Kanon, who had seen the whole thing, 
It looked like she was enduring as best as she could. She's a horrible person. I can't believe that was a mother. It can't be helped. Such pitiful things enter such pitiful vessels. I'm just fine. <laughs> Kenon got down on his knees and picked up the trampled candy. It was just tra it was tragic just looking at it. He thought about dusting it off and returning it to her, but really couldn't do so with it in that condition. As he was at a loss for what to do, he met eyes with Maria. No, they didn't meet. Maria was looking at the candy that Kenon had picked up. Right now, Maria's heart was surely the same as that trampled candy which had been crushed into a pulp. Kenon realized this, but he didn't know what he should do. I know. I'll exchange it for the one I received earlier. Kenon remembered that an identical candy which he had received from Maria was in his pocket. Maria stuck out her hand. Kenon thought she was trying to accept it, so he held out the candy, but Maria didn't try to grasp it. Then Kenon realized. She was asking him to give it back. No matter how tragic it was, the trampled candy was Maria's. Her mother had bought it for her. No matter how tragic, it had to be this candy. It only could, it, if only it could be made pretty again by dusting it off. Kenon hung his head. I can't do anything except dust it off. Sorry. Kenon held out the miserable candy she wanted. Maria took it and spoke. Thank you. A human can't do anything except dust it off, but a witch can repair it to how it was. It would be easy for Beatrice. <laughs> Maria-sama, do you know about Beatrice-sama? There couldn't be anyone related to the Ushiramiya family who didn't know Beatrice's name, with Battler as an exception. But just now, Maria had told Battler about her proudly. She had spoken almost as though she had had been meet meeting with Beatrice regularly. The inside of the fist Canon made with his left hand hurt sharply. In the past, a witch called Beatrice had appeared and had tempted him and Shannon. He had always tried to make himself think that it had been a bad dream. However, Shannon insisted that it had definitely been a real witch. Uh, our Habaki Gaming with the $5. This scene, along with Golden, the Glo Golden Slaughter a bit in one, made me break down in tears. My autistic girlfriend's experience. Experienced Maria's experience nearly one-to-one. -one. Yeah, uh, it really digs into a lot of, like, deep and, like, sensitive uh, topics in a, in a very well-done way. Like, very uh, difficult to handle sometimes, obviously, but done so with a truthness to life that I think definitely speaks to a lot of people. <clears throat> and then, this summer, the shrine to the local Shinto god had been hit with lightning and had disappeared without a trace in the span of a single night. He had known that Shannon had broken the mirror, and he remembered too that upon the witch's departure she had left him with the words that she would ev eventually be revived. And now, this girl who had no end of faith in Beatrice spoke as though she had met her. Kanon couldn't suppress a sense of something ominous welling up in his heart. For a while, Maria remained silent, as though she could see into Kanon's heart, as though she was waiting for his memory of Beatrice to come back to him. Then she spoke matter-of-factly. <laughs> you know, I'm friends with Beatrice. I'm meeting her today to play. <laughs> P play Yep, play. We're gonna study magic together. <laughs> the face of the witch, who Kanon had tried to pretend was a bad dream, began to slowly creep into the back of his mind. If Maria existed today, she'd have uh, 99 magic and old school runescape. True. She absolutely would. Father said he was extremely busy with his research. He said that unfortunately he will be unable to make an appearance. Come on. We put this conference in our schedules and come all the way out to Rokenjima during the very busy fall season. I wish Dad would act a little more sociable. So true. Dr. Nanjo, is it really a problem with his research and his mood? He's, he isn't already bedridden and unable to get up, right? Well, I wonder. There's not much I can say. Nanjo glanced at Natsuhi. 
as though he wasn't qualified to disregard Natsuhi when he spoke on this topic. Father is healthier than ever, calling him bedridden as the height of rudeness. But he only has three months to left to live, right? Normally, wouldn't that mean that he'd be wasting away, unable to get out of his bed? Right, Dr. Nanjo? For a normal patient, that would probably be the case. But Kinzo-san has extraordinary willpower. The force of his will may even have the Grim Reaper too terrified to approach. If he's that energetic, then we can at least be a little re reassured, right? Although, if he's that energetic, I wish he'd at least allow us to greet him. Isn't the point of the family conference to come and see Dad's face? Now I don't know why the hell we came. Don't say that. If, we, if he were here, you would complain the whole time about how you couldn't relax. I say we should celebrate that all of us siblings are here together as a family again this year, as we were the last without even one of us missing. You realize we couldn't meet him at last year's family conference either. I wonder why we can't get him to understand that his children bound by, by blood want to see him after two years. If you have words of greeting for him, then I will tell you. Then I will tell him for you. areva son, perhaps you had something other than a greeting you wanted to discuss with father. <laughs> Come on, what are you talking about, sheesh? Give it a rest, Ava. Natsui san, forgive us. Ava's just concerned about father's condition, as his daughter. Uh, please understand her feelings a bit. That's right. Ava, how suddenly you've become respectful to Father since he was told how long he has left. Yes, I can just about understand why you might be desperate to see him. Hm. What exactly are you implying? Quit it, Aniki. Why don't we just pray his mood will improve by dinner? And we've just arrived. In any way, we only came to give a light greeting. We can hold the family conference even without Dad. No. There should even be a few things that we can't talk to him about until we form a unified opinion. Right, Hideyoshi Nisan? Yep. Just as Rudolf Kuhn says, we can only gather our faces here once a year. We gotta value this precious time we've got and talk together frankly. Even though the tea hadn't come yet, even come yet, they were very strong-minded. But before that, I wonder if we have enough leeway to enjoy some black tea at our leisure, surrounded by the wonderful furnishings of the mansion's parlor. Kyrie's words seemed to hold some slight admonishment toward all of the people gathered in that place. They all understood, and as they cleared their throats and straightened their neckties, the atmosphere in the room returned to normal for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've brought some tea. Hey, Shannon-chan, you just keep getting prettier and prettier. Shannon entered the parlor, pushing the serving cart. Everyone decided to slowly enjoy some black tea for the time being. A wonderful aroma began to spread throughout the parlor. Looking at the scene, it would have been impossible to guess the strained atmosphere which had been there until right before Shannon had entered. Of course, Shannon, who was setting out the tea, probably didn't even notice. Kyrie made a gesture that seemed to laugh at everyone's adult appearance. Rudolph didn't like it when Kyrie took the initiative and spoke at the family conference. It was his worthless male pride. He probably didn't want to look like a weak man taking his wife's advice. She understood that and was doing her best to refrain from saying anything unnecessary. So she separated herself from the circle of siblings, which was good-natured only in appearance, and slowly enjoyed her tea near the window. Oh, Rosa-san, I thought all you siblings were having a friendly discussion together? <sighs> You're joking. Sorry, don't take it the wrong way. I'm just rolling my eyes at my husband. It seemed that Rosa hadn't been able to keep up the charade of amicability. They had come here to fight bloodily and dirtily, each trying to steal the inheritance from the others. She probably didn't want to pretend to be fellow conspirators at this stage. Or maybe she was still too much, much too inexperienced for that. It looks like the wind has started blowing hard out there. The plants are all shaking so much. The typhoon's probably already come fairly close. I wonder if it will rain a lot tonight. Maria-chan really has grown a lot this past year. Does it look that way? She still can't even fold her own clothing yet. Yes. It's because she has such an affectionate mother. She'll grow into a girl who's rich in heart. Rosa was silent. Maybe she was unsure as to how Kyrie meant that. Me? I'm not fit to be a mother. Children can't choose their parents. A poor girl. Doesn't that go both ways? A parent can't choose what kind of child is born either. 
Rosa bit her lower lip. It isn't a matter of who's at fault. You just need to have the mindset of going through life together with her and slowly watch over her as she grows up. rosa son, you spend every day with Maria-chan, so you probably don't notice the gradual changes. But the rest of us who have been reunited with her after a year really understand that she's grown up a lot. If you mean that sincerely, then thank you very much. Then, if you'll excuse me, if there's anything you desire, please call for it at any time. Shannon bowed politely and left the room. After Hideyoshi and Rudolph watched her go with turned heads, the atmosphere in the room began to revert back to where it had been right before Shannon visited. Menlo Marseille's $5 can't shake the feeling that Kyrie is playing the piano here like Ava could only dream of. Oh yeah, Kyrie is, uh, she's a clever, clever woman. Um, I'm, I'm a little mixed on how she addresses the whole thing here with like the, the you know, like, uh, oh, a parent can't choose their child either. But like, I do think she does sincerely have a bit of a good natured intention here, kind of trying to like, I, Kyrie isn't dumb. I think she knows exactly what's going on with uh, Rosa and Maria. I think she's just kind of stepping in to sort of try to uh, bridge the gap a little bit in her own way. <clears throat> if Father is unable to be here, then that itself opens up the opportunity for some certain topics. Right, Rudolph? Yeah, that's right. We didn't come all the way out here just to drink some dusty tea, you know. Mm, very well. Why don't we hear this topic that you're scrambling to get to? My, my. Those people sure are strong-minded. They really started fast. I must join in as well. If I don't assert myself, they'll quickly forget that there are four of us siblings. Can't be easy for you either. Maybe I didn't choose my words well. I'm sorry. No, I don't mind. I'm the one who should be apologizing. We're both mothers with daughters, so... Really, we should have more of these conversations. But every time we meet, we talk about something strange. That's the fault of the atmosphere in this mansion. Once we breathe in this air, everyone gets so strained. Just once, I want to drink a nice long cup of tea with you, rosa son, when we aren't attending a family conference. There's a wonderful coffee shop in Ginza, which is a favorite of mine. Please, let me invite you sometime soon. Thank you, Kyrie son That sounds good. How horrible. The sky's suddenly gotten dark. It's almost as though the people in this room have made the weather worse. Daughters. Wait, Kyrie has a daughter? Yes, it is uh, mentioned very, very briefly toward the beginning of episode one, when uh, everybody is in the airport, that uh, Kyrie has a daughter named Anje, who was not able to attend the conference because she is sick. And she's being taken care of uh, by other family. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's already thunder. Oh? Do I see the first signs of rain? Hmm? There were really small splashes of rain on the glass of the parlor window. It seemed that the weather had gotten worse faster than they had expected. Just then, a silent thunderbolt struck inside Rose's head, and she remembered that her beloved child was in the Rose Garden. A normal girl would think about going into the house if the weather got bad. But Maria was different. She would sometimes become stubborn and wouldn't move no matter whether rain or even spears fell from the sky. Is Anje and Ushira Mia? Well, uh, she's the, uh, she's the daughter of Kyrie and, um, Rudolph, so yes. <clears throat> That's right, I... I told that kid just stay there doing that forever, didn't I? Oh. Oh no! Maria! At this small exclamation, everyone turned to look at Rosa. What? What happened? I, I'm sorry. I'm going outside for a second. I'll be right back. What, what, what? What's going on with her? Seriously. Does it matter? She'll be right back. Why don't we just get started? With our main topic. Good idea. We can move on even without Rosa. Let's return to the matter at hand. Rosa dashed from the entrance hall into the Rose Garden. When she opened the door, the wind that hit her was too strong to be called a breeze, and told her that the typhoon was approaching faster than she had thought. Just as Kyrie had said, small droplets of rain were mixed in with the wind. There was also a low rumble of thunder. It could start raining any time. 
Rosa headed for the Rose Garden. She headed for the place where she had scolded Maria a short while ago. It was almost lunchtime. The children had been told that they could just come to the mansion at lunchtime, so they were probably in the guest house waiting to be called. Even if Maria didn't come, they would surely think that I had taken her to the mansion with me and wouldn't worry too much. That's Rosa narration, I suppose. Damn. The typing foley. Oh, the TF2 typing foley, I see. He can't hear me, chat. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Except I was here and had thrown my daughter into the worsening weather outside, all alone. Maria, are you here? If you're here, answer me. <sighs> it really was as I'd thought. She was standing stock still, exactly the same way she had been in the place where I had scolded her. Held in her hand was the candy I had bought her, given her, and then stepped on and crushed. With that gripped in her hand, she had been standing there as the strong wind whipped her hair about, tormenting her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, Maria. Forgive Mama. Oh, Mama, welcome back. I waited a long time for you to come back, Mama. Got pinched by the scary witch, but held out and waited for Mama to come back without crying. Maria, forgive Mama. Forgive Mama. It's not your fault, Mama. You were just possessed by a bad witch again. I'm fi so I'm fine. I love you, Mama. I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mama, lost to the bad witch. Forgive me. Rosa buried her face in Maria's small chest, crying and begging forgiveness. And those tears dripped down again, as they had countless times before. If only the brilliant sun had been shining on the two of them, all of their cares would have evaporated, and they would have felt like they could begin anew. However, what surrounded the two of them was the worsening weather. The strong winds mixed in with the sound of thunder were saddening. Rosa noticed the sound of Maria sniffling. If she stood exposed to the wind for too long, she would probably catch a cold. So, Maria, it will be lunch very soon. Come back to the mansion with Mama. Oh, I'm not coming. Uh, what? Why? Rosa thought that Maria had already forgiven her, so she never imagined she would refuse. But that expression on Maria's face didn't look like that of a child resisting her mother. So Rosa wasn't able to understand why Maria wanted to stand still in the Rose Garden, pointlessly as the weather grew even worse. Maria answered that question. It's Beatrice. She'll come really soon. So I'm waiting. Maria. Rosa started to say something, faltered, and then fell silent. They had just gone to great lengths to make up with each other. She chose her words carefully, trying to get Maria to come with her to the mansion, without denying the witch outright. Beatrice is coming? Mm. Really? Then, instead of waiting here, why don't we wait in the mansion? If you stay in the wind too long, you'll catch a cold. She'll come. Beatrice will come. And when she does, I'll give candy to her. I'll do trick-or-treat. I'll give her a jack-o'-lantern marshmallow candy and say, Happy Halloween! Mm. Maria pulled yet another sweet out of her handbag, moaning, Ooh, mm -hmm. Rosa was bewildered, not knowing what to do as Maria started being difficult again. Just then, there was a sudden and massive roar of thunder. It was probably a sign. A sign that indicated this island had become closed off by the storm and detached from common sense and reality. Therefore, as of this moment, all common sense would no doubt be useless. The wind blew even stronger, and in the middle of a blizzard of scattered rose petals, a figure appeared leaving Rosa momentarily unable to imagine that this was a scene from reality. No, probably it was. It had to be fantastical. Because that figure was shaped like... Beatrice! Maria dashed over to the figure. Normally, Rosa would scold her daughter if she dashed over to a complete stranger. But Rosa forgot about that, unable to do anything but stand there, shocked. It's been a while. Have you been in good health? Mm, I'm in good health. 
Witches don't catch colds. Hmm. <laughs> Witches make people catch colds with curses, but how foolish would it be if they caught one themselves? You should focus your energies on ensuring that you do not catch a cold yourself. She patted Maria's head as she said this, smiling roguishly. Rosa couldn't have known the name of the woman who was happily spoiling Maria. However, Maria had called to her in the beginning when she had appeared. Therefore, even though Rosa had never met her, and even though she didn't know, she hadn't named herself, Rosa was able to learn her name. However, that name held a special meaning on Rokenjima and in the Yushirimiya family. There's no way something so stupid could... Beatrice! Happy Halloween! Look, bought these! You can have one too! Hmm. Hmm, happy Halloween. Oh, for me, you say? Even the single and only light given to man lost in the darkness of purgatory, unable to go to heaven or hell, looks truly charming when made into a candy like this. Right now, on this island that has been cut off both from the world of humans and the world of non-humans, there may be no sweet more suitable. <laughs> hmm? Maria, what has happened here? The witch noticed the sweet that Maria was grasping. It was like Maria- it was Maria's candy, which had been stomped on by Rosa, and had taken on a pitiful shape. Oh, Stepped on and smashed. Can you return it to normal, Beatil? Maria deliberately didn't say that it was her mother who had stepped on it. However, when the witch saw the candy, for some reason, she looked at Rosa and grinned. A chill went down Rosa's spine, as though she felt that this gaze could see through every part of her. It will be easy. Give it to me. Oh. Maria held out the candy gleefully. Rosa could do nothing but watch this unfold, stunned. How could this person gloss over the fact that the candy was pitifully trampled in a way that could satisfy Maria? Maria looked as though she believed that it could be fixed as good as new. There was no way that could be done without real magic. My, my. It is quite crushed, isn't it? Uh, Dull Sonic 3, it looks fine to me. It's just because they didn't draw a different CG for it. It is supposed to be way more smashed than it actually appears. <clears throat> Come, Maria. Close your eyes and try to remember. Because it really was that wonderful little candy. The candies in our memories are always full and fluffy. So you too must close your eyes and try to remember. What kind of candy was it, really? Along with those strange words, spoken as though singing an improvised folk song, the witch threw the sweet into the air. Maria had, had her eyes closed, just as the witch had told her, and was focused on remembering. The shape that the crushed candy had really been. Therefore, only Rosa saw that scene. The sweet witch had been thrown, which had been thrown into the air burst into a gold color. No, those were golden butterflies. It scattered into several golden butterflies, and they began to assemble in the witch's hand, held up to the sky. And when they had, unbelievably, the candy had returned to its beautiful original form, just like the time it had been bought. Only Rosa and the witch had watched that scene. Unable to understand the event that was occurring right in front of her eyes, Rosa stood with her mouth open, forgetting to shut it. You may now open your eyes. Take it. Now your sweet has returned to normal. Hmm. Beatrice, you're always awesome, awesome! <laughs> there was a very bold contrast between Rosa's shocked appearance and Maria's innocently joyful one. Was that... Was that what the witch was laughing at? A smile floated to Beatrice's face, different from the one that she had shown Maria. Does my face look familiar? If you stare so fixedly, you might burn a hole through it. I, 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 I'm sorry. At those words, it hit Rosa strongly. Rosa knew her face. She knew it from the portrait of the witch. Iconic laser with the five dollars. A treat for Maria and you. Thank you so much. I hope Maria gets many more treats before this episode is over because boy, does she deserve it. <clears throat> but no, wait. Was this woman really? Maria. I will give this to you in exchange for that sweet. Hmm? Letter? The witch pulled a western envelope from her pocket and gave it to Maria. However, when Maria made to open it, the witch stopped her. K with the 1,000 yen, oh my gosh, let's go. 
Thank you for reading Umineko and making it accessible with your superb voice acting. I've been a fan since it and the English patch released in 2008. It's so hard to get others into it by recommendation alone. Uh, yeah, gosh, I, I must have read it for the first time. Uh, I tried reading it around the time that it came out originally when I was like a teenager or well, I don't even know if I was really a teenager at the time. It was, it was, it was pretty early on. Um, and I had difficulty getting into it as a, a young person, but when I went back to it several years later, I adored it. And then rereading it again as an adult made me adore it even more because, you know, I had more reading comprehension on my side. So, uh, I've just been blasting it from the rooftops ever since. So we're, we're in this together. We will, we will make this propaganda happen. <laughs> The witch pulled a western envelope from her pocket and gave it to Maria. However, when Maria made to open it, the witch stopped her. You must not. The time will come soon to open it, but until then, you must not open it under any circumstances. Take good care of it. It will become an invitation calling you to the Golden Land. The Golden Land? You're going to- you're finally going to take me there! <laughs> take it and tuck it away safely. You must not show it to anyone. Hmm. Promise. I always keep my promises with the witches. With witches. <clears throat> and this is for you. Huh? M me She probably hadn't imagined that the witch would speak to her, too. Rosa was bewildered by the second western envelope which had been thrust before her. She remembered having seen that western envelope before. There could be no mistake. It was Kinzo's special envelope used when he wrote with his own hand and bearing the Ushiramiya crest. Moreover, it was sealed with a red sealing wax. And further still, it had an imprint which seemed to have been made by the head's ring. In other words, irrespective of what was written inside, this woman, who Maria called Beatrice, was trusted enough that she was in charge of a personal letter from the Ushiramiya family, the current Ushiramiya head. It could, be any, it could have been any of the four siblings. However, the fact that I have met you here probably means that you were chosen by Kinzo's roulette. So take it, and read its contents aloud while seated at the dinner table when all of the siblings are gathered. What did you say? Rosa looked back and forth several times between the witch's face and the envelope she had been handed. Today was the family conference, and the biggest object of discussion was the inheritance problem. So, she had joined together with Ava and Rudolph and they had planned to force certain conditions upon Kraus to try and extort a prompt payment of several hundred million yen out of him. If it... It was as if the witch could see through all of that. And when all the siblings are gathered, what is she planning on announcing to us? With a personal envelope that no one but the Ushiramiya head can use. Maria, the weather is getting worse. Return to the guest house and wait for lunchtime. Sorry, just looking at the chat for a second. Yeah, I don't know if you were talking about the uh, the tea party from episode one, but uh, yeah, please no uh, spoilers for anything that we haven't read up to in the chat, please. Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of people here who have not read it before. <clears throat> well then, Rosa, let us meet later. Allow me to name myself there. <laughs> the witch turned her back to her, laughing and headed off towards the mansion with an air of composure. Is her ring the one that Kinzo threw out? Yes. Maria saw her off with an energetic reply and then dashed off towards the guest house, leaving Rosa where she was. As though she didn't want to waste a second in informing the other cousins of her good fortune at meeting the witch. Okay, yeah, you did mean the chapter one tea party. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, Rosa was left alone in the rose garden as the winds grew stronger, unable to do anything except pray that what had happened was just a daydream. Hold, hold on just a second. I, Arahabaki Gaming. Uh, Austin, can you, can you please read this chat message in your Oishi voice? Oh, yeah, sure. Hold on. Uh, let me kill myself. I'm playing the board with two. <laughs> that you just limply fall over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which one? Uh, where is it? That. <laughs> <clears throat> 
My bar, Sean. I have hair conditioning in the mansion. Let's talk in there. <laughs> we've we've been reading Higurashi uh, in this house recently, and that's that's the voice that Austin does for Oishi. Yeah, I, I make him sound like a Kanjin House bit character. <laughs> uh, I also read for uh, Keiichi and Sadako, and uh, when I read for Keiichi, I give him, like, the Aaron Hansen Game Grumps, like stock visual novel protagonist voice. So whenever I'm reading for him, I always make him sound like this because I'm very cool and don't care about what's going on in the game at all. And then uh, I make Sadako kind of sound like a like Vegeta-esque. Uh, she's kind of like, Oh, ho, ho, ho. so you, you're going to do curry. I'm going to mess it up. You know, very fitting for, like, a 12-year-old girl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, that, that's all I wanted. Yeah, you, okay. You, you, you can go back to your your team of fortress. Yes, thank you. Maybe I'll find Beatrice J in there. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, Cthulhu with the Canadian $2. I am a simple woman. I see hot witch woman. I simp. Understandable. Have a nice day. <clears throat> when the witch entered the ent entrance hall, Genji was there. With a respectful bow, Genji welcomed the guest who approached from the entrance hall. We have been waiting for you. We have been awaiting you, Beatrice-sama. Ah, let's see uh, what we got here. <clears throat> I assume that this is an addition for... Yep. Beatrice, mysterious visitor and 19th person who appeared on the day of the family conference, goes by the same name as the golden witch who granted Kinzo his gold. Both the reason and the purpose of her visit are unknown. She was ushered into the VIP room, which no one had been allowed to use in the past. It's been a while, Genji. <laughs> You've gotten old. No matter how old it is, furniture will only carry out its work like furniture until the end. I remember how his wife used to be jealous of you. Is Kinzo well? He's full of life. <laughs> The witch's laugh was probably because she knew that Kinzo's own doctor had told him that he would not live much longer. However, if anyone actually looked at Kinzo, his energy and vigor, which made it extremely difficult to imagine that his remaining life was really was slim, might make it natural to call him full of life. Maybe the witch had laughed at that. Then let us greet him. It would be good to hurl curses at each other after thirty years. The wife jealous of Genji, huh? Yeah, no, literally, yes. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what episode it's in. This isn't spoilers, but there's literally, like, a line later in the VN where, like, Kinzo is talking to Genji, and he's like, Ah, uh, if, if only you had would have been born a woman, I would have no need for my wife. Like, it's it's crazy. <laughs> As the witch grinned, she started walking, leaving Genji behind. Her gait was like that of a family member who knew the inside of the mansion well. Genji followed her as though he served her. At, the very, at that very moment, Kyrie came out of the parlor. She had probably come out to fix her makeup or something. And when she saw Genji following the witch, she was surprised, although her expression did not change. There was a visitor for Kinzo, whose remaining life was not long, on the day of the family conference when the fate of the inheritance was to be decided. And furthermore, this person was well enough acquainted with the Ushiramiya family that Genji was following behind her. Kyrie immediately realized that this person, who she had never met before, was someone deeply important. Kyrie met eyes with the witch. Realizing that it would be rude to pretend not to notice, she greeted the witch. Pleased to meet you. Rudolph's second wife? That's correct. This is Kyrie-sama, Rudolf-sama's current wife. From this exchange, Kyrie realized that this woman was a guest of considerably high rank within the Ushiramiya family. And the, fact, and the fact that she was a guest of that level, coupled with the face of the entrance hall portrait behind her, made Kyrie's eyes open wide in an instant. the Coke Foley once again. <laughs> it 
It just makes it sound like Kyrie, like, opened a can of soda in the middle of the stair off. <clears throat> Pleased to meet you. My name is Kyrie. I wonder if this is our first meeting. If we did greet each other before, I apologize for forgetting your name. You already have a vague idea, yet you expect me to waste my breath. Kyrie had thought she had given her a sociable and humble greeting. Her expression grew slightly cloudy at that openly impressive response. It didn't seem like this was a person you, she could grow to like. But if Kyrie's imagination was correct, this witch likely held a huge key to what her own husband was most interested in, and one that stood a great chance of influencing tonight's family conference. So she did not shoot back a retort, and could only watch in silence as the woman went up the stairs to the second floor with Genji following behind. So when someone tapped her shoulder from behind, she was so surprised she almost choked. It was Natsuhi. I'm curious on. Standing still in a place like this, is something the matter? Uh, I'm sorry. I was just a little fascinated by the portrait of the witch. The Golden Witch Beatrice, was it? Something like the revival of the Ishiramiya family to what it is today would never have been possible without the gold she gave. A fantastical story, very much like Father. Not so he spoke of her in an unusual way. She spoke from the position that the idea of a witch was just foolish, and that in the end, it was nothing more than Kinzo's ramblings. However, for some reason, that no longer felt right to Kyrie. Just now, she herself had seen the Golden Witch come in from the entrance hall and climb up the stairs, so Natsuhi's choice of words seemed almost like a refusal to accept her existence, or as if she was leading her to think that she did not exist. I'm sorry. I think I'm feeling a bit of a headache. I think I'll rest for a little while. Oh, is that so? Then I have some good headache medicine. Allow me to prepare it for you. The hallway in front of Kinzo's study was filled with the scent of sweet poison particular to that green liquor. Genji, who was completely used to it, did not grimace, and the Golden Witch didn't grimace either. When was the last time he left this room? I believe that it has already been several years. <laughs> is he, is, he is that intent on making me a bird in a cage? Alas, now you who made that wish are the bird in the cage? The ghost of the study, are you not? What a pitiful man not to recognize that. He would probably continue his research until the day he could meet you again, even if he literally became a ghost. Is it love or madness or obsession? I suppose they too will become magic if well enough developed, you sad mage. The witch grasped the doorknob to the study. When she did, there was a sound like that of flesh burning and splitting open. It was the sound of the doorknob literally burning the witch's hand. Beatrice, Sama. What is this? A magic ward? That fool, is he unable to get by without relying on something like this? I've heard that this door is painful for you, Beatrice, Sama. Or shall I open it? No. It's fine. If he wins, I will be a bird in a cage for all eternity. If he loses, only the life of a laughing laughingstock will be left. The life of a pitiful mage who went mad with love and lost everything. Already, Kinzo and even I are no more than pieces laid out on this game board. All that's left f is for the result of the roulette to decide who wins and who loses. Until the roulette shows its result, there's no need for me to be reunited with Kinzo. The witch looked at her hand, which, although horribly burned, was beginning to heal bit by bit. And so the ward, perhaps. <laughs> I see. That's also honorable. Now everything is on top of Kinzo's game board. I like it, Kinzo. Allow me to enjoy my game with you. Allow me to enjoy the final gamble and fall of an aged mage who fell in love with me and threw away all his life. <clears throat> who is it? Excuse me. I've brought lunch. Enter. Excuse me. 
After receiving approval, Canon entered the VIP room, pushing the lunch serving cart. The servants called this room the Witch's VIP room. That was because they had been strictly ordered by Kinzo to always keep it cleaned so that it could be used at any time. And yet, guests were never allowed into this room, no matter who they were. That's why, at some point, the servants had started calling it the Witch's VIP room. Supposed to be set aside to only welcome the special person Kinzo was waiting for, the witch from that portrait. And today, Canon learned that this was entirely correct. When he entered the room, the witch with golden hair was gazing out the window. Outside, the rain had already started to gather strength. As she looked out the beautiful rose garden, which had taken several days' work to make ready for today, and saw the winds and rains ravage it, was she lost in some sentimental feeling? Canon was not able to infer anything more from her back that faced him. I will prepare your meal, Beatrice Sama. So Canon went out of his way to call out the witch's name because he wanted to make her turn around. He wanted to know. He wanted to know whether the witch who had tempted him and Shannon in the past really had appeared again. When he did, the witch whose name had been kept, who, bah, the witch whose name had been called, kept her back to him and laughed, laughed in a subdued voice. Canon was startled. It was almost as though she had read his mind, and knew that he had called to her out of a desire to make her turn around. It smells good. It appears the Krause has employed a good cook. <laughs> yes. He's a cook called Goda, who was employed in recent years. There's nothing better than being skilled at cooking. Gourmet food forms one of the three pillars of the pleasure of life in the human world. The secret to not tiring of a thousand years is to have it in sufficiency. <laughs> Canon and the witch's eyes met, and she grinned. There could be no doubt, not even the slightest. This was without a doubt the witch from that day, Beatrice. The witch that was once visible only to him, and Shannon now finally held a form, and had arrived openly through the entrance hall as a guest. Beatrice. Summer. It's been a long time. Furniture called Canon. <laughs> it has been a long time. Canon tried not to forget a modicum of, how, of courtesy towards the guest, but dark clouds had begun to enshroud, enshroud his heart because of the visit of the suspicious witch, and on the day of the family conference at that. It looks to me that you are dying to know my purpose in appearing here. Isn't that so? Canon didn't force himself to answer. This witch probably read minds, so it would be pointless to go to all the trouble of saying it out loud. Of course, even that rebellious spirit of his would be read. So the witch snickered at Canon's childish resistance. I came to resolve my fi final promise with Kinzo. Your final promise with the master? I lent Kinzo a mountain of gold. When Kinzo gives that up, it will be returned to me with interest. I came here tonight to receive that. I don't know what you're talking about. However, anxiety began to gather in his heart. This witch never had anything good to say. <laughs> you're not wrong. Witches have nothing good to say. You're correct. Be that as it may, witches, like blunt scissors, can be put to use. Sometimes there are people like King Solomon who succeed in great exploits. In most cases, one does not meet with a good fate such as those described in fairy tales, of course. <laughs> but Kinzo is crafty. He has incorporated even my collection of interest into his own ritual. Is he a tremendous mage surpassing even me? Or else a fool possessed by madness? Interesting. Truly interesting. Canon couldn't guess what the witch was muttering and laughing about. All he knew was that anything this witch deemed worthy of laughter must have the exact opposite meaning to the rest of them. Jim Pop 45 with the $20. Can't watch the stream at the moment, but Beatrice gave me these doubloons for you. Have fun. Thank you to you and thank you to our marvelous golden witch Beatrice, who is definitely standing in front of us right now and is in fact real, just as magic is. Of course, we all know this. <clears throat> Did you think I would lend them that power without any compensation? I'll lend a hand in love, and my compensation shall be one ticket to watch the cruel fate that the two of them will eventually meet. Even after 1,000 years, no better show exists. <clears throat> I 
could it be? You... <laughs> Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved home of old. You who seek the Golden Land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. The witch suddenly began to recite a bizarre poem. It was something he remembered hearing. Could that be the witch's epitaph? There was no doubt. It was the epitaph accompanying the portrait of the witch that had been hung by Kinzo. The relatives imagined that it almost certainly pointed to the location of the hidden gold. Are you are you guys inventing a, a parallel version of me for every letter in the alphabet now? <laughs> this is this is going very far compared to before. <laughs> the uh, the um, oh god, what is the name of that Vocaloid song? What is the name of that Gumi song? Oh shit! I'm gonna have to look this up real quick. Hold on. Um, Jiminso Ten Faced. Yes, ten-faced. Uh, are we gonna get the ten-faced AU? Where, like, you draw different versions of me or something? <laughs> oh, oh gosh. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> the relatives imagined that it almost certainly pointed to the location of the hidden gold, but no one knew what it meant. The witch had suddenly begun reciting that epitaph. A copycat is really good, too, though. <clears throat> Canon, as furniture, you must have heard about this from Kinzo. The day when everything will be returned to the Golden Land has come. Rejoice! The time has finally come for your shameful days as furniture to end. <laughs> I believe you've been wanting that for a long time. To furniture whose existence has no value, just existing day to day must be nothing but agony. For those with souls, the world of the living is worth clinging on to, but those without it find to be nothing but suffering. <laughs> Complicated expressions flitted across Canon's face. It was the day of release that they, he had been long looking forward to. However, the coming of this day had been mercilessly sudden. And the hateful tone of the witch, who had proclaimed this day of rest, made it somehow difficult to accept. Canon wasn't even able to decide what emotion he should feel. Why are you not happy? Could you actually still have some attachments to this world? As furniture? I have no... attachments. Because I'm... furniture. <laughs> you truly are a model piece of furniture. Very good, very good. However, to have no lingering regrets at all. Hmm. How deeply uninteresting this is. Are you saying that your regrets are your pleasure? Precisely. Most witches who live for a thousand years get tired of life. In order to escape boredom, I adorn people's fates with fruit and brandy and cook them like cakes. I find humans dancing through oppressive fates inside an oven to be so very entertaining. <laughs> I've made somewhat of a name for myself in this field, you know. So much of that unexpected guests occasionally come from afar to witness my culinary skills. <laughs> Mere furniture can't understand this. I'm wasting my time. Canon wasn't able to understand what the witch was saying. However, he realized well enough that this was a terrifying being who treated the fates of human as a sh humans as a show, and was getting enjoyment out of doing them some kind of harm. However, furniture had no soul or life, much less a fate. Pitiful furniture did nothing but serve until the day they would be released from this world. To furniture like that, the witch, who had come to release them from everything, was also being a being overflowing with mercy. Even though the day that Canon had been waiting impatiently for had come, he was unable to readily accept it, and this greatly bewildered him. Why was that? The face of Shannon, the person he loved as a sister, rose to his mind. And for some reason, Jessica's face did too. <laughs> Canon bit his lower lip painfully. Thinking of Jessica was not permitted for furniture. He had been aware of that and had found fault with Shannon's relationship, so how could he remember Jessica at a time like this? He felt a little ashamed by how weak he was. And to forget about Jessica, he turned his thoughts to Shannon. Shannon is also furniture. On the day everything returns to nothing, there was no reason she shouldn't be happy. 
but Shannon, through her relationship with George, had come to know an emotion that shouldn't be known by furniture. Even though she wasn't qualified to be bound with him, she was still wallowing in a dream that she wasn't permitted to have. Could Shannon accept something like this now with open arms? Impossible. Shannon would have lingering regrets. That would probably become a great source of pain and torture for Shannon. And those regrets had been planted by none other than this witch. Why? Just because that would be more interesting. Shannon should have been waiting impatiently for this day, but now she will have emotions that she must not know, and will probably have a very hard time forced upon her. I thank you for gifting us furniture the day of our release, and I hate you for making this day difficult for Shannon to accept. I wanted to make you feel pain from your regrets as well, just like Shannon. However, with stubborn simplicity, you continued to remain furniture, never allowed me to lead you on. However, it looks like you loved Shannon too dearly, didn't you? <laughs> Shannon's regrets became your regrets. Will that turn into hatred for me? If you want to kill me, you can try. <laughs> As Kinzo's furniture, you should have that much power, at least. However, if you kill me, the day of rest for you furniture will not come for all eternity. Could you withstand that? Can you really reject your release by me? <laughs> Neil. What? Neil, and kiss my shoes. Otherwise, I'll leave this place. I'll go back and never show myself again for all eternity. So, Canon, could you withstand that? If the door to the Golden Land is opened, your life as furniture that has been full of hardship will end. If you desire, I'll even give you life as a human. After that, you'll be on the same level as Jessica. Surely you want to know of it, the taste of love. I know even if you try to hide it, you see. You grew jealous seeing Shannon wallow in the swamp of sweet love. You're sorely tempted to know the taste of love. <laughs> Stop it! Are you trying to lead me on again? I won't be reduced to a toy to please you! Oh, then I will make do with Shannon. You weren't the one only seed I sowed. There are sometimes those that don't bear fruit. You who laid hand upon the key must journey as follows to the Golden Land. On the first twilight, sacrifice the six chosen by the key. On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two who were close. The witch recited the epitaph again. It was so sudden and diverged so strongly from the current topic. However, her challenging smile made it seem almost as though she were using that epitaph as a threat to Canon. Do you not understand? For the ritual of the epitaph to succeed, on the second twilight, two who are close must be sacrificed. It could be any two who are close, a husband and wife, or even a pair of lovers. Who will be selected is up to me to decide on a whim following the rules of the ritual. Don't you think that there's no one more fitting to be a sacrifice for the second twilight than Shannon as she is now? <laughs> what? what a dirty... Canon learned then. He had thought that he had given up on everything and lived until today as furniture, like furniture, sh furniture should. But in reality, that wasn't true. He had loved Shannon too dearly. And so, when Shannon was in pain, Canon shared in that. If only Shannon had continued to exist as furniture, living indifferently like Canon, without any attachments to this world, they wouldn't have to have been in so much pain. The witch planned to toy with Shannon, who had learned the taste of love, no, who she had taught the taste of love, as she killed her. She would not invite her to the Golden Land as a merciful release, but would make her a sacrifice for that evil ritual, after dealing her the limits of torture and pain. And this witch would probably actually make Shannon meet this horrible fate for no other reason than that, that it would be interesting for her. Furthermore, she was threatening to do that so she could make Canon, who hadn't submitted to the witch even once until even now, finally surrender. It was that simple. In the end, though he had tried resisting the witch to avoid pleasing her, he had only made things interesting for her. After all, he was furniture. No, a 
toy. They were nothing but toys meant only to distract her from boredom. Damn it! What will you do, Canon? If you kneel, I may even hold back from choosing Shannon as a sacrifice. <laughs> I always wanted the chance to break a toy like you. <laughs> Without even a fragment of elegance, the witch sneered at Canon with a vulgar laugh. Yes, even before Canon had made up his mind, she had seen through to his surrender. Canon got down on one knee and chose to gen genuflect? Gen what? Huh? Words? <laughs> to, I'm, I'm just going to say he prostrates himself, I guess. <clears throat> Before the witch. He didn't care what happened to himself. However, just the fact that Shannon, who during his days as furniture had given him his only reason to live, was being to toyed with. Genuflect. Okay. I thought so, I just, yeah. That alone was something that he couldn't overlook. Therefore, something like kissing the shoes of the witch was an easy oath for Canon to make. At the time that his quivering lips actually touched the witch's shoe. <laughs> Hold on. Dawston the Dark Austin AU? Austin doesn't need a dark AU because he's already dark by nature. He can't hear me right now. But that's true. He hasn't contested it, so it's true. <clears throat> Beatrice, after allowing a look of ecstasy to rise to her face, let out an ear-splitting laugh. In that moment, the witch who had tired of a thousand years of life was completely filled with the evil emotion that was her own, her only, uh, oh, I've, I have pronounced this one before, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Hold up. Raison d'etre. Yeah. Raison d'etre. <clears throat> Sorry, if you heard the little Google voice. <laughs> Lunch had ended, and the relatives have mo had moved to the parlor. Rosa had bought a high-class brand of black tea from a famous store in Ginza. That had been served, and the inside of the parlor was filled with a very nice aroma. Since the children were together with the adults, the adults were, at least on the surface, interacting like relatives, talking peacefully about recent events and how their children were growing up. It had started raining outside, so the children were unable to go out, and had no choice but to sit here like this, watching TV. Like a true TV kid, Maria was watching vapid daytime programs one after another without getting bored, and was giggling all to herself. It seemed that Battler had joined in at first, deepening his relationship with Maria. But he had gotten up early that morning and was so gradually attacked by waves of drought and so was gradually attacked by waves of drowsiness. He eepy. <clears throat> <sighs> oh, that's a big yawn. Did you get up really early this morning? Well, something like that. I started to relax and release all my tension, and then I got sleepy while I was listening to the sound of the rain. <laughs> tension? <laughs> you go around making yourself the center of attention, and now you're saying you were tense? That's me, I guess. <sighs> Battler gave a great yawn once again, and slowly lay down on the sofa. Canadian $2 from Catthulhu. What about Boston, Bart Austin? That's also just regular Austin. <laughs> Hold on. Oh. Mm. Uh, I've been proposed both the I the idea of Dawson, which is Dark Austin. I said that's just you. Yeah. Uh, uh, then Boston, Bart Austin. I also think this is just you. I think this is me, uh, but when I have jaundice in particular. Oh, okay. That, that's when I fully evolve. <laughs> right, that's like your, uh, your crystallization, your Pokemon evolution. Yeah. <laughs> Under very like, specific conditions. You get, like, spikes on your head. Yeah. <laughs> For most people, this is a debuff, but for me, this is just a straight buff. <laughs> okay. I understand. <clears throat> he really did look tired. George and the others had started talking to him, taking his yawns as a sign of boredom, but when he realized he really was sleepy, they decided to let him be. My, my. They say that if you lie down right after eating, you'll become a mackerel. 
<laughs> Stop kidding around. Goda san said that tonight would be calf steak. In a minute, it's gonna end up as mackerel steak. Kumasawa san, the guy really does look tired. Think you could bring him a blanket? <laughs> Here you go. Kumasawa brought a blanket over from the shelf. The spacious parlor wasn't cold, but the air had gotten a little chilly. So, when the blanket was placed over Battler, he immediately wrapped himself up in it and curled up like a turtle retreating into its shell. You really were sleepy. When do you want to wake up? I'll take care of it. Nah, I don't care when. You can wake me up if there's something you want. And if there's nothing, you can let me sleep forever. Good night! Hmm? Battler sleeping? Nap time? Nap time? Mm -hmm, me too. Hey, Maria. Battler's sleepy, so you gotta leave him alone. Kumasawa-san, could we get another blanket? It was doubtful that Maria really wanted to take a nap. She probably just saw Battler wrapped up in a blanket and wanted to do the same. When she received the blanket from Kumasawa, she joyfully wrapped herself up in it and set up camp again in front of the TV. Sheesh. Even though all of us cousins are finally together after six years, dude doesn't have a clue that he's the main guest of this family conference, does he? I can hear you. I've had a nice peaceful lunch, and there's an e even a typhoon and rain outside. There's nothing to do, and what that means is, it's not my turn yet. I wonder about that. If you have a passive attitude like that and don't do anything unless something happens, your life will be pretty boring, you know? No, that's not what I mean. How should I say it? In times like this, I've decided to think this way. It isn't my turn. If this were a play, it wouldn't be my turn to go on stage. So the best thing to do is stay on the wings. You're always the main character of your own life, right? Why are you acting like a supporting actor? You have to get up on the stage yourself without being pushed. That's not what I mean. I'm just saying that it's not my turn right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sleepy and my mind's a mess. Just let me be. So it seems. So it seems. You're so sleepy that you aren't making any sense. Let's leave him alone for now. I can't let that one slide. You're always the main character in your own life. I kind of want to have a serious argument with Battler about that. He's just half asleep. Don't take him too seriously. I don't know why, but... That kind of personality. Saying you don't want to get up on stage because you can't be the main character. Something about that really pisses me off. With distant eyes, Jessica gazed out the window at the gray rose garden obscured by rain. When she put her forehead up against the glass, it felt as though the pleasantly cool sensation would chase away memories that she didn't want to remember. It wasn't your, your, your turn yet, was that it? Then, when will you get up on the stage? In that case, who is the main character on this stage? <laughs> You're just doing whatever you goddamn want. What the what the shit is this? This is just demented. <laughs> Your argument regarding 18 or 19 people which you use as a basis to deny me was truly ludicrous, you see. So I merely tried a different move. The greatest basis upon which you deny me is simply that I was not laid out as a piece on the game board. In that case, I can simply play the queen first like this, can I not? Isn't opening the path for the queen in the first move one of the classic plays in chess? <sighs> Real fucking funny. How the hell <sighs> can I accept something like this? A witch just came walking in right through the entrance hall? What a royal load of bullshit. What's this? In the last game, I let you make moves as, as and when you please, do you know? All I've done on this occasion is move a piece to match your moves. Are you resigning already on the first turn? Up yours. Like hell I am. Who's gonna resign? Great move, why don't you just keep on playing however you like? I get it, your turn's far from over. Move however you like. Form a huge battle formation while you can. I will definitely endure. I will definitely corner you. Come at me as best as you can. I don't want you to have any excuses. This much isn't even close to, en to enough to make me accept something like a witch. That's right. Just now, it looks like you fixed Maria's candy with magic, but you might have actually had another one of the same candy hidden in your pocket and switched them with some fancy showmanship, making it only look like you had fixed it with magic. 
Yeah, that's right. That has to be it. And it's no good. It's no goddamn good. Ho <laughs> ho. Rosa saw the moment when the candy split into butterflies, did she not? <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. That was a hallucination or a trick or otherwise she just saw it wrong. That isn't a big problem. <laughs> so you throw out the part you can't explain as trivial. I see. Is that your move in response to mine? <laughs> You've dug your own grave. Ushiro me a battler. <laughs> it still isn't your turn yet. Allow me to continue my move for a little longer. It's barely begun. It has barely begun. The turn of the golden witch. Oh, the turn of the witch, rather. But, but that's the name of the episode. <laughs> also, uh, King Dongo said a minute ago, I don't remember this much swearing in the witch hunt translation. That's because it is not the witch hunt translation. Uh, Umineko Project has its own translation. <clears throat> <clears throat> When they started hearing Battler snores, the relatives went their separate ways, leaving the parlor and letting Battler sleep in silence. Even though it had been so lively in the parlor with so many people gathered there, when all of them scattered at once and were sucked into the vast mansion, it created an eerily si eerie silence with no sound except that of the rain. Witch Hunt Jessica swears a lot, though. <laughs> yeah, seems fitting. Nope. Never once met a person like that. Aniki? I've never met her. Kyrie-san, is that true? Even I, only, even I only greeted her quickly when she came into the entrance hall. She looked like she was a little over 20. I told her my name, but she didn't tell me hers. She was being guided by Genji-san, and I saw her go up to the second floor. So it'd probably be faster to find Genji-san and hear the story from him directly. Still, what a strange turn of affairs. The mystery woman had spoken to Kyrie. Without naming herself, she had sneered that Kyrie already had a vague idea of who she was. And the person that brought to mind was her lookalike, the Witch of the Portrait. Is she trying to say that she's... the Witch of the Portrait? And that's what I understood her to be laughing at. Even though it was our first time meeting, she spoke as though she knew I'm your second wife. Aniki, you really don't know someone like that? Stop asking me that. I've never seen a blonde woman like that go in or out of the mansion. None of that matters. The problem's what happens if that woman starts calling herself Beatrice, if she starts calling herself the manager of father's assets. Or maybe she plans to call her, herself his mistress's daughter and demand a portion of the inheritance. Either way, an outrageous joker has been slipped into the deck. Did Nissan call her? Or did Father? This is bad. We've been thinking that if we did a good enough job cornering Aniki in our discussion, we might have been able to work things out. <sighs> this takes us back to square one. I don't know what kind of schemes you've been plotting when I'm not around, baby. But it looks like we've been given a little time to form a counter-strategy. Yeah. Thinking about what would have happened if Miss Blondie had suddenly appeared at the dinner table and scared the shit out of us. We should be glad that we've been given at least a little time to discuss a counter strategy. There's only so much counter so many counter strategies we can use if we don't know what she came to do. What could she be after? Isn't it obvious? It's to claim that she's the rightful heir to father's inheritance. Father is still captivated by Beatrice. If the two of them had a daughter, he'd be bound to say he wants to hand all of her assets to all of his assets to her. She might even thrust some strange will before us. Sure, if we took it to court, we might be able to claim a quarter of a half of it. But we probably wouldn't be able to split the inheritance until that was resolved. That's a problem. For me and for Rudolph. And of course for Rosa too, right? For all of our various situations, we need a large sum of money. Urgently. It's our biggest weak point. Then, what are they after? Kyrie, can you tell? Mm. It's the first I've heard of it, but one of the premises here is that we have an urgent need for a large sum of money, right? Uh... Curious, son. When you're on the offensive in a man's business, that's the time you need funding. Please, understand that. What's this, Rudolph? You haven't told Curious on about it? <sighs> Sorry. I wasn't really hiding it. The truth is, we've been having a bit of... It's alright. You decided it wasn't necessary to tell me about it. 
so I won't press you about it here. What's more important is finding out what the Golden Witch is after, right? Yes. Putting together everything we've said, can you see what move the enemy will make against us? Rudolph had a certain measure of trust in Curie's unique thinking technique, chessboard thinking. Of course, it didn't give him any more peace of mind than fortune-telling, but every time Rudolph was concocting some important strategy, he would give a great deal of thought to Curie's advice. For a while, Curie pressed her finger against her forehead, considering. Judging by the fact that her coming here was kept hidden until today, one of her goals is some kind of surprise that she wants to give us. We can't know whether that has something to do with assets or being recognized as a relative. However, because her visit was kept hidden until today, maybe we can say that she didn't want to get hit with a countermeasure by notifying us in advance. Which means that it seems her goal is one where it would be disadvantageous to her if we did say take some countermeasure. Understand? I get it. For example, if it was something like a will which Dad had written previously, or acknowledgement as a blood relative plus accompanying proof, if we assume she's brought something like that, then it was completely unshakable. If it was completely unshakable, if it was rock solid proof, you'd think she'd actually have announced it beforehand. That's right. Since we're in a position to doubt her, she should have made us bring our lawyers and experts, and thrust some completely undeniable proof before us, if she could. Hmm. So just given the enemy's aiming for a surprise attack, that alone tells us she couldn't beat us with an honest attack from the front. Makes sense. If you got a trump card that'll win for sure, you gotta play it out boldly. Play it in a roundabout way, and odds are you're gonna tarnish its impact. To skip to the conclusion, we should probably expect that some huge surprise will be thrust in front of us. Something related either directly or indirectly to the inheritance problem that everyone is so infatuated with. The other party is probably under the impression that this will be able to overpower us with the impact of this alone. However, even if this carries it with, a, with it a significant impact, it is not absolute. In other words, we have enough leeway to take advantage of this. You really got brains. Even understanding just this much is really reassuring. So you're telling us not to get sucked into our opponent's pace. In the end, it's an extremely simple conclusion. No matter what the opponent brings up, interact calmly without panicking. And that's negotiation 101. I really can't call that predicting our opponent's thoughts. Come on. Just like usual, that was pretty good. Now that we know that we have a little leeway to attack, it gives us a little more room to relax. What we don't know is how, that she can, how she's connected to Kraus Nissan. Is it a surprise for Kraus Nissan too, or was the person who called her here none other than Kraus Nissan himself? If it's the latter, it might make things very troublesome. Yes. Secretly calling a mystery woman on the day of the family conference, that detestable style somehow feels like Nissan. Aniki, let's handle it like this. As long as she can't clearly prove her identity, we won't acknowledge her as having any status whatsoever. That would be best. In point of fact, she hasn't even named him herself to Kyrie-san. We can't let our conference be disturbed by the statements of some unknown woman. She might have shown us- she might show us proof that she's a blood relative or something. If she can show that father's blood runs through her veins, like with a maternity record document, there's nothing we can do. We can suspect any proof of being fake. Even if it's the real thing, in order to prove that she's the person mentioned, we would need to involve a hospital. At the very least, it'll be impossible to prove that now on Rokenjma. Yes, that's it exactly. In other words, what it boils down to is this. No matter what is shown to us now on Rokenjma, it can't be accepted as the truth. So we can't believe anything until the typhoon passes and they prove it to us as the, at the proper place. <laughs> Constantly finding fault like that's your specialty, Aniki. This is all going to be down to you. Are you an idiot? You'll be helping too. We need money. And quickly, a large sum. We're all in this together. There's no way I'm having my prospects of an inheritance destroyed now by some mystery woman who popped up out of nowhere. It was only at a time like this that Rudolph and Ava united as siblings, sickened by the idea that their own inheritance might be snatched away by an outsider. Kyrie noticed how indomitable they looked, shook her head slightly, and gave a small sigh as she looked out the window. Outside, there was still a strong rain falling, and everything was gray, having lost all vibrance. It felt like the lush garden that the sun had shone on earlier had never existed. For some reason, the words Ava had just said just a short while ago kept repeating in Kyrie's head. It boils down to this. No matter what is shown to us now on Rokenjima, it can't be accepted as the truth. There was an odd nuance to those words. 
Right now, this island was closed off by the typhoon and isolated. There were no official institutions here and no hospital. So no matter what institution had issued what kind of documentation, on this island, one could claim that it was all fiction. It was impossible to prove that something was the truth. They were cut off from the outside world, and all truths proven in the outside world would be called fiction. So did that mean that now, on this Rokenjima, there was nothing that was truthful? That everything would be controlled by fiction? It almost gave the illusion that separate from the human world, that's, yeah, separate from the human world made from truth was another world called fiction in which they had been shut away. Kyrie remembered what that woman had looked like one more time. And she remembered the woman's figure, the witch of the portrait. On this island, which had been isolated from the world of humans and shut away in the world of non-humans, a non-human being had visited. No matter what she did, Kyrie couldn't help think of the smile that had appeared on that woman's face as anything other than ominous. In trying to understand that ominous smile, it feels like my chessboard thinking mistook a vital premise. That's right. That smile seemed like that of something non-human looking down on me. I had reasoned based on the assumption that our opponent was a human like us. However, just like this island now, she may be a being that is not human, and human values may not apply to her. In that case, all reasoning is useless. For what reason was the witch invited here today? Only one thing is certain. Right this very moment, she is staying somewhere in this vast mansion. Maria, around lunchtime today, we... we met someone outside, right? A woman. Who was she? Hmm. Said it a lot. Beatrice. Maria, have you ever met Beatrice before? Hmm. See her every year. E every year? In this mansion on Rukenjima? Hmm. I don't know what oo means. Is that true? Yeah. How long have you been seeing her? How many years ago did it start? Uh, dunno. You don't know? Why? Last year? Two years ago? Longer. Uh. Rosa was aghast. Only the Ushiramiya mansion existed on this island. So there was no way that there were any humans other than themselves on this island. And yet, Maria said that she had been meeting with that suspicious woman every year during the family conference? If what Maria said was the truth, then that strange woman called Beatrice had been at the family conference every year. That's insane. Is she saying that some eerie woman was at the family conference every year and none of us ever noticed it? Even though Rosa had just met her herself a couple of hours ago in the Rose Garden, she was overcome with a strange emotion which told her not to accept her existence. What in the world did I meet with earlier in the Rose Garden, as the typhoon grew close and the winds blew strong? Maria, so you said that you see her every year. What do you do together? Hmm. Sing songs. Learn magic. Learn how to draw magic circles. R really? That's incredible. Maria, you often scribble... Uh, Sorry, draw magic circles in your notebook, right? Did she teach you that? Hmm. Beatrice draws what they should look like. Look, look! Maria joyfully fished around in her handbag. Then, she took out a notebook and started opening its pages. Most of the pages were covered with drawings that were literally scribbles. All of them were occult-like things. And while it might sound rude to Maria, who was joyfully f flipping through the pages, they were all creepy. Look, here! Beatrice drew this for me! Hmm. On each page Maria opened to, there was an eerie magic circle that had been drawn. Furthermore, at a glance, Rosa realized that Maria hadn't drawn them. The strength of the strokes, the thickness of the lines, how clean the shape was. This by itself wasn't enough to guess the background of the person who had drawn it, but it was enough for Rosa to understand that it was definitely someone older than Maria. Rosa had to accept it now. There really was a person on this Rokenjima who even she hadn't known existed. And this person had been playing with Maria during the family conference every year. Maria, um, 
Does this witch Beatrice live here? Or does she live outside the island like us? Hmm. Beatrice is the witch of Rokendima, so she lives on this island. So you're saying that she's on the island even when it isn't the family conference, right? Hmm. I don't know what ooh means. Well? Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. How long has this unknown witch been living on this island? I used to live on this island. I lived on this island, passing the time in the mansion, in the Rose Garden. And even so, I never encountered a witch like that. Never. I think. Mama? Mama? What's wrong? Mama? Uh, my head... <sighs> hurts. I was probably getting a little mixed up with my memories from when I was a young girl. When I was a young girl, unlike Maria, I was very frightened of witches. So for me, the name Beatrice was a synonym for something frightening. So it must be that my feeling of fear from my days as a young girl has been revived because a woman calling herself that appeared. So she couldn't be a witch. She's obviously a human calling herself Beatrice, right? Oh, yes. That witch entrusted me with an envelope. What in the world could that be? Rosa pulled that western envelope out of her pocket. It was the western envelope which bore the, the Ushirimiya crest which Kinzo used on his personal letters, and it had even been sealed with the red sealing wax by the head's ring which Kinzo held, which meant this envelope belonged to the Ushirimiya head. In other words, it was from father. Why was a woman calling herself Beatrice holding it, and why did she give it to me? That's right. I'm sure she said this said to read this out loud at dinner. What in the world could be written inside? Anxiety gripped Rosa, as if opening this envelope might release some kind of monumental disaster. However, at the same time, a little curiosity sprouted up, causing her to want to find out what was written inside before the other siblings. Using common sense, one could guess that was a, that was a huge decision somehow related to father's inheritance was probably written inside. Actually, since he had given it to a woman calling herself Beatrice, there was no way that wasn't related. Did that mean he wanted the inheritance split not between four, but between five, including her? I need a large sum of money, and I can't wait long. I do feel like a sinful daughter for discussing the distribution of father's inheritance while he's still alive. However, I'm no longer at a stage where I can afford to keep everything pretty. And I'm even consulting with Rudolf Nissan and Eva Nissan in order to get some money out of Kraus Nissan. With myself in this situation, I can't help but sense something ominous in the appearance of the witch. What could be written in here? I'm sure there must be something frightening written. Shall I first read it secretly myself? The witch had requested it be done at the dinner table when everyone was gathered. Oh, whoops, clicked on the wrong window. However, in that case, couldn't she just read it aloud at the dinner table herself? Why did she go to all the trouble of entrusting it to me? Did that mean basically that it didn't matter whether I secretly read it beforehand? It would be better to secretly read the contents first. I understand that it would be breaking my promise, but this is no longer the time to keep things pretty. It would probably be good to discuss it with Eva Nesan and Rudolf Nesan, depending on its contents. Nesan and the rest are all really good thinkers when it comes to this kind of thing. As I gulped and put my hand to the red ceiling wax, something suddenly pulled on my sleeve and I let out a small shriek. What? What? M Maria? Don't scare me like that. What? Oh, no. Uh, huh? Maria was making the same ominous expression Rosa had seen on the witch, sending a tingle up her spine. Beatrice told you to read that letter during dinner, Mama. You can't break a promise with a witch. <laughs> Th that's not it. I just wanted to look at the envelope for a second. I'll keep my promise. After all, Mama always tells you to keep your promises. Of course Mama will keep her promise. Yep. Mama's a good girl. <laughs> that laugh. It isn't cute, so stop it. Mm. 
Come to think of it, you received a letter too, Maria. What was written inside? Haven't opened it. Beatrice said I mustn't open it until it's time to open it. So taking good care of it. Hmm. Uh, I see. You listen well to what Beatrice says, don't you, Maria? Hmm. I am Beatrice's disciple, so I listen well to what my master says. Uh, I see. Hmm? Rosa realized something. Mixed in with Maria's gaze was the light of a person other than Maria. If she broke the rules and opened the envelope here, Beatrice would definitely find out about it. Because Maria was the witch's disciple. Maria communicated with that witch. Mama will keep her promise. So tell Beatrice not to worry, okay? Oh, I'll tell her. Hey, Maria. I want to speak with Beatrice, so what could I do to meet her, I wonder? Don't know. Beatrice is very fickle, so she only she always shows herself suddenly. I don't know a way to get her to meet me. But you know, she's always watching me. So when I get in trouble, she'll definitely save me afterwards. She's gone invisible and is hiding close to me. I just know it. <laughs> don't I always tell you to stop that laughing? Rosa reflexively hit Maria on the head. That put a stop to Maria's laughing voice, but it wasn't able to erase the ominous color that had risen to her eyes. Rosa made a pact with herself. She swore that at least until they left this island, she would not leave Maria alone. She couldn't allow an unknown being to make direct contact with her daughter anymore. Maria hasn't come back. I wonder if she's being scolded by Auntie Rosa again. Ever since they had met Maria in the airport, she had constantly been making a huge fuss about Halloween, but it seemed she had cut loose a little too much, and acted a little too boist boisterous on the plane, on the boat, and during lunch, because Rosa had warned her several times. In times like that, Auntie Rosa would rarely scold her in front of people. More commonly, she would call to Maria into the shadows and scold her when they were alone. So since Maria had been called off somewhere, they thought she must be getting scolded. When they looked at the clock, they realized it was almost six. They couldn't really imagine that Maria had been being scolded this whole time. Perhaps it had come time for some anime she watched every week to start or something. She had probably just decided to stay in the mansion's parlor. It could be that Butler Sama has woken up and they're playing together. Well, Maria-chan must, must have thought of Butler Kun as sort of a new friend. I'm sure she had tons of fun when she played Halloween with Battler Kun at the airport. Battler was messing around a lot himself. That dude's gotten big, but he hasn't changed a bit on the inside from how he used to be. That's true. I get the feeling that Battler Summer was gracious enough to remain as he was six years ago. Shannon, you remember how Battler Kun was six years ago? Yes, and because he was, well, very energetic. <laughs> I also remember how the four of us used to play six years ago. Shannon acted a lot like a big sister. Yeah, I get the feeling she was more level-headed back then. <laughs> but back then, I, um, didn't know my place, so I, am um, must apologize for all of my poor conduct. There's no need for all those professional matters. Your work aside, when you're taking your break like you are now, I'd like it if we could all be friendly together like we were back then. Yeah, totally. There's no reason why you can't separate the servant, Shannon, from the off-duty Sio. You aren't a slave, you're just working a job as a servant, right? I think of you, Shannon. No, Sio, as my oldest friend. Thank you very much, milady. It seemed that Shannon understood what lurked under Jessica's words, because she heard a little bit from Jessica and Canon about what had happened between them. Apparently, George had also been informed about that, more or less. George approached the window and looked up at the darkening, rainy sky. Kenonkun is still young, and I think in some ways he tries a little too hard to be mature in his way of thinking. <laughs> Come on, quit it already. Well, um, it's my fault too. I think part of it was I got sucked in by the atmosphere. And, um, maybe after looking at you two, I got a little bit jealous and started feeling a little rushed. There might have been a bit of that too. Who 
who cares about me, anyway? More importantly, how's it going between you two? Looks like it's going pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder about that, too. Yes, it's going very well. Shannon was lost for words, her face red while George answered brightly and immediately. That carefree attitude made it obvious that their relationship was proceeding so perfectly it would make anyone envious. Tch, I'm jealous. Does that mean Shannon's going to be resigning and cutting up a cake pretty soon? I wonder. I don't... um... I wonder, right? How could I know? George laughed like he was being mean and drew closer to Shannon. It was probably the way they usually flirted when they were alone. Jessica could only smile awkwardly and say, Yes, yes, thank you, that's enough. I have a dream. It isn't my only, only my ambition to become the leader of my own domain in business. I also have a dream to build a family together with a partner I can spend my life with. I want two kids at the very least, and I'd like to do some sports that the whole family could do together, and many more things besides that. I often talk with Shannon about that kind of thing. Why? Don't. Although every time I talk about that sort of thing, Shannon always laughs and says I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, no, yeah, you, you think? For some reason, even at the age I am now, I already find myself thinking about my retirement and settling down, with my healthy grown kids and grandchildren running around, about how nice it will be to spend my final years at a slow pace, surrounded by that and together with Shannon forever. Cthulhu, Canadian, two dollars, Emperor Palpatine. No, 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 no. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> That's how I feel every time George starts talking about shit like this. <clears throat> You're definitely getting ahead of yourself. But how should I say it? Sounds like you, George Nissan. Being surrounded by a family like that would probably be so wonderful. The ideal family that I painted in my mind when I was younger was something like that. To Shannon, who had been raised in a welfare institute, that harmonious image of a family was probably something she yearned after. And George, who promised that he would definitely grant that wish for her, was surely a fitting person for her to spend her life with. Shannon was an important friend to Jessica. George was surely the one most fit to entrust that friend's f future to. Well, I don't want to throw cold water on you guys, but Uncle Hideyoshi aside, what's going to happen with Auntie Ava? Won't it be tough to convince her? <laughs> There's no reason for anyone to worry about something like that. No one can influence my choice of partner. I'll make Shannon happy. Whose permission do I need? Uh, probably Shannon's, perhaps. <clears throat> Whoa. George Nissan, that was cool. I can't believe you can say something so embarrassing out loud. I thought you didn't used to be that kind of character. Mm, leave a boy for three days and you'll hardly recognize him after all. Even I grow up. I plan to study more and more, to grow to be a suitable man who can make Shannon happy. It seemed that perhaps George had some kind of awareness of how embarrassing the words coming out of his mouth were. His face turned very slightly red and he scratched his head. George, son. It's all right. I'm sure mother will be difficult, but you can leave that to me. I'll show you that I can make the whole family accept you as my partner. Awesome. I'm jealous of you, Shannon, seriously. If you'll go so far, then I'm, I'm very grateful. Wait a sec. I'm starting to feel like a third wheel here. Maybe it's better that I leave? Smiling awkwardly, Jessica stood up from the bed that she had been sitting on. And at that very moment, the phone rang. Before Jessica picked up the receiver, wondering what they wanted, Shannon looked at the clock and was taken aback. It seemed that she had taken too long on her break. Uh, I'm sorry. I forgot that it was time for work. If you'll excuse me. Oh, thank God. At the same time that Jessica picked up the phone, Shannon began dashing out of the room. Uh, uh Shannon. Again. Same time. Same place. I, yes. I, excuse me. Hello, it's Jessica. Ah, Genji-san. Yeah, Shannon's headed your way as we speak. We held her up, I'm afraid. Please don't scold her. Yes, okay. I see. So, it'll be time for dinner to be prepared soon. Uh, let's see, where, whom, what, uh, David J. George is the kind of person Shannon feels like she's expected to want and will give her something acceptable instead of thinking about what she actually wants. Uh, and a interesting interpretation, yeah. 
and also Fizzy Pop. George treats her like a blank slate he can paint his dream on like she doesn't have a say in it. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, this will become more obvious with time, but on Shannon, George sees a person that he can paint his ideal onto. Um, when it actually comes to what he knows about Shannon herself and like her personality, her dreams, her aspirations, stuff like that, pay very close attention to the way George talks about that sort of stuff because it is very telling in terms of what he actually knows about her in their relationship. <clears throat> Many plates were lined up on the counter in the kitchen, and preparations for dinner were proceeding steadily. The number of plates that were lined up there was 19. That number was one more than that were lined up during the family conference every year. I can't accept it. Why can't I deliver it directly? Godosan was flaring up at Genji, paying no heed to the pot that was boiling over. The master enjoys having his food alone in his study, so the food must be set out in the study. Of course, this is nothing new, you understand. Godasan would really like to set the table for the master with his own hands, as he puts his heart and soul into his cooking. But the master had imposed a strict rule that none but the servants bearing the crest of the golden eagle could enter his study. So while Godasan could greet the master from the outside the study, not once had he been granted the honor of carrying his cooking into the study. Godasan was always unsatisfied with this. Of course, he knows he is a newcomer in terms of years of service. However, he has accumulated plenty of experience from his previous jobs, and he's strongly confident that he would be able to conduct himself properly, even in front of Kinzo, in a way that would not insult him. And yet, just because he has not permitted the Golden Eagle, he still hasn't been blessed with this honor. You can probably imagine what damage that's done to his pride. You might think that tonight is a mere resurgence of that old argument, but it isn't. Because tonight there is a person other than the Master who wants their food carried to their room. Apparently, this person is a very rare and honored guest, and there's been a strict order to treat this person in the same manner as the master, the family head. Godasan must have wanted to earn some points by serving this honored guest with his own hands, because he is a person of strong vanity. If he isn't qualified to serve the master, then at least a guest of the same rank. He simply couldn't make time during lunch, so Kanonsan had gone for him. Therefore, he truly desired to serve tonight's food personally, the best dinner of the year. But Genji-san had had a problem with that. Something about how Goda-san didn't have the one-winged eagle. After being once again scolded that he wasn't qualified, Goda-san had lost his patience. Ah, uh, how heart-rending, Goda-san. I cannot do anything more than watch like this from the shadows. Kumasawa-san, if you have enough free time to dawdle around, please prepare the dining hall. Is the tablecloth ready? Uh, <laughs> oh, my apologies. When it became her turn to bear the brunt, Kumasawa softly disappeared into the hall. Beatrice-sama is of exactly the same rank as the Master. We must respect the same rules that we respect for the Master. Goda, you will devote your attention entirely towards the task you've been given, and attend to the family. I don't mind if it's you, Genji-san, but is it really all right to let a child like this go to such a guest? If she made some blunder, it would be quite rude. I know that they've served here for a long time, but it's not as though they've undergone a proper apprenticeship. If you'll allow me to speak freely, they do not have the proper grounding to entertain guests. <sighs> Goda spoke, spoke bluntly, even though Shannon was waiting right there in the kitchen. Shannon was the one Genji had ordered to carry the food to Beatrice's room. By the ranking system among the servants permitted the Golden Eagle, Shannon was indeed the second highest ranked. If the highest ranked Genji went to set the table in Kinzo's room, then it fell to Shannon to set the table in Beatrice's room. Goda's pride was always horribly injured when he was confronted with this ranking system. In times like that, he would speak out bluntly and rudely about Shannon and Kenon. Goda kept raising example after example of Shannon's past failures, making a ruckus about how this was wrong and that was wrong. As Shannon listened to, the, to this with her head hung in shame, she heard Kenon's voice from behind her. Kenon had been listening from a blind spot, leaning against the hallway side of the wall near the entrance to the kitchen. He probably knew that if he entered the kitchen, sparks would start to fly his way. Let him rant. He's a horrible man. But, but this helps me to build up a grounding on how to entertain someone. Godasan has learned a lot, so what he has to say is very... <laughs> Mason, you sure are nice. More importantly, is the guest in the VIP room really Beatrice-sama, as they say? Yes. I met her when I was sent to set the table for her during lunch. There's no mistake. It's her. 
R really? Was she doing well? Kenon remembered that he and Shannon had different impressions of Beatrice. To Shannon, Beatrice was a cupid of love who had granted her magic to create her relationship with George. Judging her by her happy expression, it looked like she couldn't wait to inform Beatrice of how her relationship with George had progressed. However, Kenon already knew. That witch had come here with a terrifying goal in mind. That vague witch in the past... That vague witch, in the past only visible to them, had now walked in openly through the front door, and had revived enough that they could now carry food to her. In the past, when she had disappeared from in front of Canon, the witch had said something about how her own power was still weak. Now that the witch could e appear openly like this, did that mean that she had finally returned to her former power? And she had said, she had said clearly that he had sown the seeds of love, she had sown the seeds of love with the knowledge that it would fail. She had said also, she had said clearly that the day had finally come when the door to the Golden Land would be opened. Shannon, she'll perform some bizarre ritual with the Master, and will surely do something unimaginably horrible, and no one can resist that. What are you talking about? She came here, as the Master requested, so that the door to the Golden Land would open, and so that everything would be returned to the Golden Land. She said that to me clearly. <laughs> in the past, the two of them, as furniture working for Kinzo, had been told what the opening of the door to the Golden Land meant. Therefore, even without asking a single question in response, Shannon understood everything. So, she grew deeply hopeless. Something tore at Kanon's heart as he saw her expression twist with grief. How could... Why... Why now? Didn't I tell you? We're furniture. Because you acted like a human. Because you loved. You can't obediently accept the day when our service is over. One time, I used to wish that this day would come. But it never came after so much time. I didn't know how long we would have to be tormented as furniture. So I thought... I thought that the day of rest wouldn't come for all eternity. I thought that too. But I believed that it would definitely come someday. So I never forgot that I am furniture. But Nesa, you forgot that. It's my fault, isn't it? Mine. Yeah, it's your fault, Nesa. If only you hadn't known love. We would both be happy that this day had finally come. You built up meaningless attachments. Even though it was a world that would, you would definitely have to leave. Well, the ritual begin tonight? Yes. Also, she said this to me. Tonight, George Summer will probably give you an engagement ring, Nesa. That was a fact. George should have snuck in an engagement ring in his pocket today, and surely he would hand it over tonight. She joined you together, planning to use you and George Summer as the sacrifices for the second twilight. Understand? Nesa, she took advantage of you by tempting you. So that was it. I never thought of that. But she told me. She promised that if you don't accept the engagement ring tonight, she won't choose you as a sacrifice. I think that our chances of being able to go to the Golden Land together are very slim. There will be 13 people sacrificed. Only five will be left alive. The chances of us both being a part of that group are really slim. However, if you at least can take advantage of that promise, those chances rise higher. I want to take that bet. Our salvation is in the Golden Land. If we can make it that far, we can become human. And I want to walk through life as a human together with you, Nesan. If we do that, we might even be able to achieve true love. We used to dream about being able to go to the Golden Land, didn't we? If we go there, any wish will be granted. We'll be saved from this pain. We believed that. However, in this ritual, only a few people, chosen by fate and chance, would be invited to the Golden Land. Everyone else would lose their life as a sacrifice midway through the ceremony. But in the past, Shannon and Kenon had thought that whether they reached the Golden Land or were made sacrifices, it would all be the same, because they would be released from their duties as furniture either way. So in short, the ritual had begun something that would definitely grant release to furniture like them. Had been something, rather. <clears throat> I don't like it. Together with you, I want to take back all the hard times we had. 
I won't become a sacrifice. You and I will remain alive, and we'll reach the Golden Land together. So I won't let you become the sacrifice for the second twilight. Please, Nason, don't accept that man's ring. If you don't accept it, she promised not to select you as a sacrifice. That's something I can't do. Tonight's ring is very special. My heart won't permit me not to accept it. Nason, the witch decides the ritual sacrifices arbitrarily. That witch has promised to overlook you at least, Nason. You at least will be definitely be able to go to the Golden Land. Me at least? What about you, Kenunkun? The witch's game is enough for me. I'll slip through her evil hand. I'm not powerless. I'll grab that small chance and I won't let go. After all, our lives are temporary, aren't they? In order to begin our real lives, let's make it to the Golden Land and let's gain our humanity. And then, maybe, like you, Nesop, I'll be able to know love. Maybe I won't have to call myself furniture and make people cry anymore. Kenunkin. I don't want to be furniture anymore. I'm gonna become a human. No more pain. I'm gonna end it all. There were tears in Kenon's eyes. It had taken Kenon until now to notice. Shannon hadn't been the only one to know and suffer the taste of love. He had too. The tears Jessica had shown him that day and her painful smiles on all the days since as she tried to smooth things over and brighten her mood had slowly wrought some kind of change on Cannon's heart without him knowing it. Shannon, I've been calling you for ages. Shannon snapped to reality at the sudden sound of Genji's voice. Apparently, she had been called for repeatedly. She hurriedly answered. When she turned around, Kanon had disappeared. It seemed he didn't feel like showing his tears to anybody. Yes. I I'm sorry for being distracted. I had Kanon handle lunch, but properly speaking. As the next in rank after me, you should have been the one to take it to her. Beatrice Sama is the most honored guest of this house. There is no more honored guest than her. Please, think of her as another master of the mansion and be polite. I must impress upon you once again. Please be very careful not to make any blunders. It's quite painful for me to entrust this to someone inexperienced as yourself, but there's nothing we can do about this house's rules. I'm sincerely counting on you. Goda had officially agreed, but he threatened Shannon with an expression that told her that he definitely wouldn't forgive any mistakes. Shannon, too, thought that Goda should do it if he wanted to that much. But considering it as her responsibility, as one who had been granted the Golden Eagle, she had to give up. Besides, I wanted to meet Beatrice. What will I talk about? What will I ask? I don't know. Will I show gratitude? Or else grief? Or else what? I don't know. Shannon loaded the witch's food onto the serving cart and left the kitchen with a slow gait. The person knocking was Kraus. Father, today is our annual family conference. Haven't the siblings gathered here to get a glance at you, father? Uh, be silent! I've told you I won't leave. I imagine that you are there, Genji. Why haven't you had my food brought here as I ordered you to? Kinzo screamed through the door. Genji was waiting behind Kraus. Your meal has been prepared so that it may be carried to the study. However, Kraus-sama wishes for you to go downstairs tonight. Father, I don't mean every day. Even if it's just for tonight, won't you gather together with your family? Who are you calling family? When did you start calling those vultures who wait for me to collapse and die family? When did you start calling rotting, gushing maggots family? <sighs> my, my. Kraus shrugged at this answer, which he had half expected. Genji. Oh, wait, that's Kenzo. <clears throat> Genji, carry the meal here as you were told to. Why don't you listen to what I say? Why? Why? Genji-san, I'll leave the rest to you. My voice will no longer reach him. Kraus gave his head a small shake and quickly turned his back on the door to the study. He had only called out for his sibling's sake, knowing it was useless. After Genji watched Kraus go down the stairs, he called again through the door. 
My lord, we've finished preparations for the meal to be carried here. What about serving for Dr. Nanjo? Nanjo was also in the study. Because Kinzo had strongly pestered him about resolving their long-lasting chess game, Nanjo had been Kinzo's opponent since before evening. Nanjo had announced as a doctor that Kinzo's days were numbered. In that situation, if Kis Kinzo pestered him about finishing a chess game while he was still alive, Nanjo couldn't refuse. Kinzo was thinking deeply about his move, concentrating more than usual. It had been Kinzo's turn for quite some time, and Nanjo, who was tired of waiting, had started randomly pulling out grimoires that he couldn't understand and skimming through them. Kinzo-san, you won't think of a good move just by folding your arms and sitting in front of the board. I wonder if it wouldn't be good to take a break and refresh our minds. Be silent. Hmm. That should be good enough for defense. Will that hole be penetrated by the Bishop of the Night? Hmm. Today, Kinzo was insistent on a strong defense. Normally, Kinzo's motto was that offense was the best defense. However, today was completely the opposite. I'm also hungry. Shall we suspend the game here? And I've used my head so much without a break that I'm already feeling dizzy. Any more of this might limit my ability to make my best moves. That is a problem. In chess, both players must always make their best moves. Other moves are painful to understand, and ruin a game that is about reading thoughts. That considerably reduces our enjoyment. Kinzo sighed deeply and finally shifted his gaze away from the board. Chess needs an opponent. That opponent was tired and suggesting to suspend the game, so what else could be done? It's true that the goal of chess is for both players to aim for victory and make the best moves possible in order to achieve that. It's an intellectual game of being able to read each other. But Kinzo-san, are you forgetting that there's another goal separate from victory? What? What goal could there be other than victory? <laughs> It surprises me you would even you would forget even that. But through chess, you get to spend time some fun time with your friend. You see, uh, you got me. I believe those are words I said to you a long time ago. I shall have to concede to that. Kinzo, who normally wore a frown, surprisingly relaxed his face and laughed. Nanjo felt like he had been reunited with a close friend he hadn't seen in a long time. That's how it is. Now that I've taken a shot back at you, what do you think? Will you go down to eat with me? What do you say about discussing Kasparov's middle game over some coffee? A good plan, but I will refrain. I can no longer leave this room, because the ritual has begun. Is that so? Well, my stomach is growling. I'll go downstairs. Anytime you feel like it. Nanjo, thank you. Oh, <laughs> what could you be thanking me for? We didn't resolve our chess match. However, it seems that I've succeeded in that goal of chess which I forgot. It seems that was just as important as checkmate. This isn't like you. Why so sentimental? You said it, didn't you? My days are numbered. Now go. And don't come to this room again. We shall continue in the Golden Land. That's fine. But it shall be a rematch. Losing that rook was a serious blow. Well then. I'll see you later. Yes. Later. Maybe in the Golden Land. Or in Purgatory. Or in the next world. Nanjo didn't say anything beyond that. And with a practiced hand, he pushed the button on the table that would release the auto lock. Then, after looking at Kinzo's back one last time, he left the study. As he did, Genji's voice came from the hall. Well then, my lord. I'll now carry in your dinner. It will be my last supper. I must savor it. Please, get it ready. Certainly. Are your own preparations in order, my lord? Indeed. I have spent my time until today wrapping this room in a multitude of rigorous barriers. Even if that roulette chooses me, I will definitely repel it. I will remain alive, and I will definitely become one of those who reach the Golden Land. I will reject the visitations of the gods of death who try to drag me off to Hades.
Excuse me. I've come to prepare your meal. Shannon entered the VIP room, bowing her head and pushing the serving cart. The young woman by the window, apparently gazing out into the impenetrable darkness outside, was unmistakably that witch. So it is Shannon this time. How nostalgic. Ho, oh, your countenance has improved quite considerably, has it not? Unlike Canon, almost beyond recognition. Thank you very much. Shannon solemnly prepared dinner. There were actually they were there were actually several things she wanted to ask and talk with the witch about, but those things were all jumbled up, and she didn't know where to start. Her heart was also jumbled up with various things, and she didn't even understand her own emotions. Therefore, still remaining vague, all she could do was carry out her work indifferently. However, the witch guessed what was in her heart. You can't hide things from a witch. I won't apologize, because I am a witch. For what? Come. Canon must have told you about it. Helping out your love life was simply my mischievous spirit. It was nothing more than a seed I sowed in order to enjoy witnessing in what manner things would get complicated, become twisted, and fail. There are some who think it is more fun to hear about love than to have it. Surely. You aren't trying to thank me. Yes, I am. No matter what kind of ulterior motive you had when you gave me the magic of love, it doesn't change the fact that you gave it to me. So even if you sowed that seed knowing that the two of us wouldn't be able to stay together for life, I won't hold a grudge against you. Hmm. Furniture truly is interesting. <laughs> oh, furniture truly is uninteresting, rather. <laughs> Cooking it into something interesting is where my skill shines. I don't understand how you think, Beatrice Asama. You're a great witch, and people like us don't even reach your feet. Nor can we even imagine your grand thoughts. But there's at least one thing I can say. What is it? Thank you for teaching me to be human. You said it yourself. I am no longer furniture. Silence, furniture. If you were a true human, hearing the announcement of your death on the day that you were to receive an engagement ring should have you dancing around mad with grief. But what of you? Your face looks enlightened, as though you've accepted everything. Truly an anticlimax, furniture. No, I am not furniture. Silence, furniture. I won't be silent, because I am not furniture. Are you saying that you won't listen to my orders? Furniture obeys orders, but a human decides for herself whether to obey orders or not. So I won't obey your orders. <laughs> I'll take back what I said. You really are interesting. If I hadn't sowed those seeds, you'd probably have allowed the ritual to control your fate without any emotion at all. But now you've grown to be truly interesting, and you entertain me from the bottom of my heart. That's fine. Because I have no love for boredom. <laughs> I have finished preparations for dinner. Here you go. Hmm. Doesn't this look delicious? If Goda makes it to the Golden Land, it may be desirable to commission him as my chief cook. I heard it from Kanonkun. Something about, if I rejected George Sun's proposal, you promised not to make me a sacrifice. Hmm. I did. Although you were an ideal sacrifice for the Second Twilight, Kanon cried and screamed that I should pardon you of that, so I graciously listened to his words. With the condition that you give up your engagement. <laughs> How gracious I am. What a foolish condition. And what a foolish threat. You bullied Kanon Kun thoroughly using that, I suppose. Oh, so you can tell. <laughs> Apparently, Shannon had seen through it. Apparently, she could imagine how much Kanon had been bullied and humiliated by the witch, with that horrible promise as bait. I made him crawl on the carpet and kiss my shoes. <laughs> and that's not all. Do you want to hear the other ways in which I humiliated him? Shannon silently shook her head. I've finally come to understand you. You like to bully, confuse, and trouble people, and you do it to entertain yourself. So I'm now sure that this is the only way to resist you. What is? I will have nothing to do with you. I will carry out the fate that has been given to me, so I won't entertain you. Nothing to do with you? The witch's features twisted in hatred for just an instant. It disappeared immediately. 
but that expression that rose to her face for only a brief time was unusual for the witch, who had never broken her malicious smile. <laughs> I suppose that's one way to resist. Interesting. I like it. I'll kill you, together with your lover. If that's the fate you've decided, then that's up to you. I won't be afraid of that, or go against that, because I don't believe that the grim fate that will start occurring now is something controlled by your will. We humans don't know anything about our possible future fates. That is how we live to the fullest, following our own beliefs and destinies until the last. Fate is just a roll of the dice. You can't feel malice in it. Try as you might to inject some. I won't believe you. <laughs> oh. Even though you've stopped being furniture, you have no fear of death. It seems that you think that will bore me, but that's a huge misunderstanding. I am now all the more interested to see whether you really can stick to that until your last moments. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Why did you take the form of a human, appear in front of us, speak with human words and ridicule us? If you hadn't appeared in front of us, if you hadn't predicted the future, we would have been able to live life to the fullest until the last moment. That's what witches do. We live off your fates, reigning as a high order being does over low order beings. After all, your fates are merely fragments. If we cup our hands together, we can scoop out as many as we want. In the same way that beef cattle I raise can babble what they will, and it won't change the fact that they will add splendor to my dinner table. <laughs> We're powerless, so we can't go against your ritual or our fates. But I can do something that will make you unhappy right now. Oh, what would that be? I will walk away from this place right now. Answering your words only entertains you. Not answering your questions is the only way I can resist you. I see, I see. You may be able to take a shot at me, but you cannot defeat me, you know. I have the power to kill anyone for eternity. I can't wait to see how long you can keep up that resistance in an endlessly repeating cycle of death and rebirth. Don't forget it now. You spoke those words yourself. <laughs> well then, if you'll excuse me. If you have any business, please call me. Shannon gave a reserved bow as she would to a stranger, then faced away. With that gesture, maybe she really had taken a shot back at the witch, just as Beatrice had mentioned. Because when the witch called out again, she sounded a little more quick-tempered than she had before. Canon thanked me. Aren't you going to? Not going to thank me for giving you your day of rest? Furniture will be happy about their day of rest. But I'm a human, you see. I have nothing to thank you for. Will that be all? You plan to receive the ring from George? Don't forget that if you do, I will abandon the promise I made with Canon. The promise that you would not be selected as a sacrifice. If there's anything further, I'll have someone else come for you. If you'll excuse me. A flat-out interruption. Shannon gave no more answers, and the sound of the door closing came instead of an answer. It seemed that Shannon's resistance had probably struck far more deeply into the witch than Shannon herself had thought, because an expression of hatred had once again risen to Beatrice's face. She had made Canon submit, even though she, he hadn't been taken care of and taken in until the end. Yet after that, now it was Shannon who refused to submit, when until now she had been very easily taken in. Oh? This is interesting after all. <laughs> I'm supp I suppose I'm not so old yet. This is why I'm still not tired of living after 1,000 years. God, Shannon is so cool in that scene. She nails it. If only we could all be as cool as Shannon is. <clears throat> The most fabulous time in the family conference. That was dinner. But when back when Kinzo had been serious about the family conference, he had placed extreme importance upon this dinner, for which everyone would gather just once a year. Should the dinner not meet standards, he would take it as the deepest shame for himself as the host. And he had strongly ordered Natsuhi to make absolutely sure that it was one to be proud of. Because of that, she and Krauss had employed Goda, who had confidence in his cooking abilities. As a result, they could unveil a wonderful dinner they had confidence in. Yet by that time, Kinzo had started closing himself up in his study and no longer appeared for dinner. Maybe you could call that ironic. 
When the main dish for tonight, calf steak, was set out, Gota began to brag about it, further exciting everyone's appetite. The sauce here is Bordelais, Bordelais. The Baudelaire orphans, from a series of unfortunate events. I ground them into a paste and then made them into a liquid and put it over your dinner. <clears throat> no, no, no. Actually, now that you think, now that I think about it, though, there are some uh, strange overlaps with uh, Umineko and a series of unfortunate events, though, aren't there? Uh, everybody obsessed with a, a woman named, well, I mean, I guess, obviously, in a series of unfortunate events, it is literally pronounced Beatrice, but, uh, you know, just things to think about. <clears throat> anyway. Of course, the red wine I used was excellent, even among those made in B Bordeaux. But in addition, I prepared an original blend of this house, a blend of choice alcohols from around the world to further deepen the taste. This sauce will be exclusive to this year. It would greatly please me if you would enjoy yourselves. Hmm, isn't that wonderful? However, isn't Bordel Bordelais... Oh, God, keep using the word, I don't know. I'm just gonna say Bordelais. Bordelais sauce common to French cooking? It almost seems like using alcohol from outside France with, with that is heresy. Cross summer. Today's the annual family conference. <laughs> Borderland sauce! <laughs> oh, God. Tonight's dinner is garnished with a fine Fortnite sauce. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> As a dinner for those who normally live far away and have traveled far from across the world to gather together, I realized that a sauce made from a blend of fine alcohols from across the world that I would normally that would ne normally never meet would be most fitting. So I had, had it specially prepared. Wonderful. A truly wonderful cook, that's what you are. Food and medicine work twice as well if you advertise it, right? It's twice as delicious as normal food and the advertising makes that twice as good again. The taste keeps doubling and doubling. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Nissan. Didn't he see that question coming? No doubt. You let go to son run right off with your moment. <laughs> Is that so? I just thought there might be some people here who didn't know that today's food was in the French style. Just now, Ava said that not using butter was a virtue, but that's the Spanish style. Well, I guess they do share a border, right? Psychodoggy777 with the $5 cash for your Fortnite sauce. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll try to, we'll try to invent a Fortnite sauce. <laughs> Just... Austin, okay. I'm, I'm so sorry, but we have now been, uh, burdened with the task of inventing a Fortnite sauce. What, is, what does that mean? What, what does Fortnite sauce mean? That's what we have to decide together. <laughs> Like, okay, like, explain to me the rules. Like, what are the confines in which this Fortnite sauce must be made? Does it need to be, like, something on a dish? Does it need to be edible? Or is it, like, a hypothetical sauce? Like, like oh, you're goaded with the sauce. Mm. Well, he's goaded with the sauce. But, um, I, I think... It, I guess it has to be part of a dish. Yeah. Right? Like a Fortnite-themed dish. I mean, like, there's Chug Jug. Is Chug Jug, like, a sauce? No, that's too easy. Yeah. It has to, like, you know. I have to, like, actually get out of my game for this, because I'm just going to get kicked. Because this is going to turn philosophical. <laughs> well, I, I, I should probably get back to the game in a second anyway, so... But we can, we can talk sauce at the end of the stream. Okay. Because this is going to, like... This is going to vex me for the rest of the night if we don't decide what this is. Because I okay. need to know... Like... Someone give you cash for this? Yeah, five dollars. Five dollars for Fortnite sauce. Yes. Okay. We'll we'll figure it out. We'll figure okay, it out. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll think about it in my in my little corner uh, and be haunted by mm -hmm. extreme dread. During theory time, we'll talk about Fortnite sauce. <clears throat> okay. Anyway. That's not what I meant. Will you please not take part of the conversation out of context and misquote me? It's a very delicious sauce. Goda-san, you certainly are wonderful. It's a great honor to receive your praise. And this is all thanks to Madam's habitual guidance. No, it was all Goda's idea. I only listened to the recipe and approved of it. 
Yeah, we can figure it out at the end with Kyrie and Pat. That's true. <clears throat> it looked like the siblings quickly got into a loud argument about something as trivial as the sauce. <laughs> but for the most part, dinner proceeded peacefully. The See, now we've got them arguing about the Fortnite sauce. <laughs> However, the thing that they all really wanted to ask about smoldered inside each of their hearts. And that was the visitor, the 19th person, the Golden Witch. In actuality, Ava, Rudolph, and Curie were on alert during dinner. If the, mis the mystery guest was to be introduced, this dinner table was the most appropriate place to do it. However, no plates had been prepared at the table for the witch. The family conference would begin in earnest after the meal, and previous experiences told them that it could last until deep into the night. But they couldn't understand what meaning there could be in keeping this person, who should be introduced, hidden until late at night. So Ava, Rudolph, and Kyrie had started to suspect something. I made a meme, how should I send it? Um, if you have a Twitter, you can just tag me in it. Um, and if not, then if all else fails, uh, my business email exists as nesmeva at gmail.com. So. <clears throat> if she wasn't a saboteur called by Kraus to give him an advantage in the inheritance problem, they should probably speak frankly to Kraus beforehand and create a common front to resist anything disadvantageous to the four siblings. If she was Kinzo's saboteur, whose purpose was to keep the inheritance from being handed over to the four siblings. The enmity between Kraus and the other siblings could become nothing more than a weak point that benefited the enemy. Oh, no. I, I, yeah, I, I definitely meant that in a fun way as well. I wasn't, it didn't come across as aggressive or anything. Don't worry about it, Daniel. You can send memes to the business email confirm. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have enabled you all like that. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you don't have another method to do so with. Yeah, I would prefer social media tagging. <laughs> well then, please enjoy at your leisure. With the table set and the cuisine explained, Gota tried to leave the room, but Kyrie called to him to, and called him to a stop with a small voice. No, guys, really. I do actually need to check my email for important stuff. <laughs> yes, Kyrie-sama. What is it? Um, I'm sorry. I thought there was a guest here today. Will we not be seeing her at dinner? She had thought she'd said it nonchalantly, but unfortunately it reached the ears of Natsuhi, who was sitting in the next seat. It seemed that Natsuhi had heard it to mean, even though there are guests here today, won't the host be coming to dinner? In other words, that Kyrie had asked whether Kinzo was going to come to dinner. The head's condition is not good, so he said that he'll take his dinner in his study. My husband explained that in the beginning. Is something... I'm sorry. That's not what I meant. In an instant, Kyrie realized from Natsuhi's reaction that this unknown visitor was also unknown to Kraus and his wife. And what that meant. On the chessboard placed inside Kyrie's mind, she could feel the arrangement of the pieces changing, making loud, clattering sounds. Oh yeah, uh, there is a Discord server, but I basically have it uh, locked behind, like, you have to at least, like, become a $1 patron or something to get in. Uh, I d didn't really want it to be like that, but unfortunately we had a problem uh, a couple of years ago with uh, when it was free rain with people coming in and posting, like, really nasty shit. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's why it's like that. <clears throat> a guest? It seemed the battler, who was sitting next to Natsuhi, had heard Kyrie's words without misunderstanding them, and he let out a wild voice, questioning who else could have been invited to today's family conference. Thanks to that voice, the uncomfortable feeling in the sibling's chest suddenly explode. Cthulhu, y yeah, pretty much. Like, th there was something that was even worse than that, actually. Um, but I'm not going to recount what it was, because it was really upsetting and awful, and uh, obviously that person got banned immediately, but it, yeah, it sucked. <clears throat> Everyone looked at Gota at the same time. Judging by their appearances, it was obvious that at least no one here had invited this mystery woman. For an instant, Gota was startled to find everyone's gaze gathered on him, but because of his naturally vain personality, this actually gave him a feeling of superiority. <laughs> Therefore, he answered in an extremely calm and graceful manner. Yes, uh, she wanted to eat alone in the VIP room, so her food was carried over there. Therefore, Gota's extremely graceful and reasonable response made it obvious to everyone that a 19th person, a visitor, existed. 
the VIP room. A guest. What and who are you talking about? Natsuhi's words echoed the question that everyone who didn't know about the visit of the Golden Witch was thinking. Gota was slightly disoriented, as though he hadn't remotely expected to be questioned by Natsuhi. That honored guest had been spoken of so stringently, he hadn't imagined that Kraus and his wife might not have known. It has been tweeted. All right, let's see. Ah, hold up, hold up. I'll, uh, I'll save the image so I can put it on screen real quick. We just, uh, yeah, like, save over that. That should probably be fine. Okay, let's, uh, this is, uh, from Normal Gabro. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you for this wonderful image of Candelabra Canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Austin, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> uh, I, I think we should stop the stream and start ranking uh, Umineko characters by how well they would fare in Aladdin Return of the Far. Oh wait, no, the candle isn't even fucking from Aladdin, it's from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, you idiot. <laughs> okay, let's start ranking Umineko characters. <laughs> By uh, how well they would survive in uh, Bell's magical world. <laughs> Perfectly. All right. Anyway, <laughs> hold on. I'm, I'm gonna uh, retweet this image as well. There you go. <laughs> Has Austin read Umineko? Yes, just a really long time ago, so he doesn't remember it that well. I'm an original fan, uh, and I haven't read it since I was a teenager. So I remember characters' names and things that happen, but I, like, if you ask me to, like, recount a piece of prose from it, I probably couldn't tell you. <clears throat> he hadn't imagined that Kraus and his wife might not have known. Um, it is Beatrice-sama. Beatrice! See, see? Beatrice came! Mm -hmm. Maria had been telling the other cousins over and over again that she had met Beatrice today. The cousins had answered, saying, isn't that nice? But they hadn't believed. So their eyes grew wide. Sorry, I was sure you were just joking, Maria. So she really does exist. By Beatrice, you mean the Beatrice of the gold? Oh, I've been saying she exists the whole time. No one believed. Sorry, Maria Chan. We didn't mean to. Oh, uh, Capula in the chat wanted me to tell you that, uh, Vast Air. I have started reading Vast Air. Oh, I see. I was like, what do you, what do you mean, Vast Air? <laughs> what, do you, what, what about it? Uh, uh, good. Uh, we're about to update it, so uh, I have no idea where you are, but whenever you get to uh, where we're updating currently, uh, suffer. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're updating it tonight. Usually I post the social media updates for it, but uh, I'm streaming right now, so Austin has to do it himself. <clears throat> George, who was sitting next to her, tried frantically to calm her. Oh wait, Austin is vast error, Austin? Wild. Yeah, that's him. Why do you think he's obsessed with Bart Simpson? Goda, is that another bit of dinner entertainment? <laughs> Quite a good performance. Aniki, drop the act. You called her, right? You called? You called who? From where? Nissan. Let's have a clear answer. Who is that? Surely you aren't going to tell us that really is Beatrice from that portrait, right? I don't have a clue what you people are talking about. Goda, is this seriously not a joke? I... um... I was just ordered by Genji-san, um... Call Genji. Now! When Natsuhi yelled, Gota shot out, shot out into the hallway. Well, do not say he shot out into the hallway. That would, that would really be bad. <laughs> the sound of the door being thrown open at that time triggered a sudden uproar around the dinner table. So, you're saying you don't know either, Aniki? Who called her? Was it Dad? I don't know anything about this. It seems that you people believe that I've been pulling the strings behind the scenes, but this is a huge misunderstanding. Calm down, Krasnissan. We aren't at the stage where we can sound each other out anymore. If you're saying that you don't know who this mystery person is either, this situation becomes ridiculous. Hideyoshi-san, won't you be a little more discreet with your words? My husband would not invite unnecessary people to the family conference. Honestly, what are you people talking about? 
Are you saying that the witch of the portrait has broken out of her frame and appeared? There's no way that anyone has actually met this witch. I met her. Ava and Rudolph nodded at Rosa's proclamation. Oh, I met her too. Uncle Krauss, believe. Believe Mama. Mm -hmm. The brief tension was broken and Maria also started to make a ruckus. The room was by now chaotic. I don't have a clue what's going on. So what's going on? The witch who gave grandfather the gold is appearing as a special guest in this year's family conference? But really? Auntie Rosa didn't see it wrong, did she? I met her too! Uh -huh. Auntie Rosa, are you sure? Yes. Maria and I met her, and even talked to her. I met her. That was definitely a witch. Believe me, I definitely didn't see it wrong or hallucinate or anything. What was that? In the instant before the typhoon visited, Rosa had definitely met with the witch in the Rose Garden, but that scene had been so hard to accept as reality. And the more she spoke of it like this, the less she understood what it was she had met. Ironically, because she had lost her composure when she said that she had definitely met the witch, the more desperate she became, the more vague the witch's existence seemed. So it was a single composed sentence that affirmed her existence for certain. I met her as well. We exchanged greetings, well, they could be hardly called that, a few words at least. It's definitely not something that rosa -san saw wrong. curious son, are you serious? Yes, but she didn't tell me her name, so I can't conclude that she was Beatrice. However, sorry if this is subjective, but since I met her in the entrance hall, I was able to compare her face with the portrait. My first impression was that she was undoubtedly the portrait's subject. This is all just subjective, remember. This is impossible! In the first place, where did that woman come from? The only boat today was a round-trip journey of the one that escorted you all here. Was she riding on that boat? I admit, that's a bit of a weak spot. Of course, I have no memory of such a woman getting on the, off the boat with us. Oh, is it really? How can you prove that there wasn't a boat other than the one that we rode on? You can't. You can't prove that one didn't come. That's right. You could prove that- you could prove that it came. Someone who saw it just has to say so. But you can't prove that it didn't come. Even if everyone says that it didn't come, that they didn't see it, you can't deny that it couldn't have come secretly. Is that a thing they call devil's, the devil's proof? It's easy to prove that a devil exists. All you have to do is meet a devil. But it's impossible to prove that, prove that devils don't exist. Just because no one has ever met a devil doesn't mean that you can deny the possibility that they're hiding away somewhere that humans cannot go. You can't deny the existence of aliens for the same reasons. Until humanity searches the whole of space and can show perfectly that aliens don't exist, you can't be sure that they don't. And it's definitely impossible for us to check the entirety of space for the existence of aliens. Therefore, while there may be a number of ways to prove that aliens do exist, it's impossible to show proof that denies their existence. In that case, we, should be waste we would just be wasting our time discussing whether or not a boat separate from the one we rode in on came to the island. She wasn't on the boat with us, that much is a fact, but she must have visited this island through some other means. That's right. There may be no need to discuss how she came here. The essential point is the fact that she is actually in this mansion now and doesn't feel like having dinner with us. Let's review. Right now, there's another guest on the island other than the 18 of the Ushiramiya family. And that's a guest that even Aniki and Natsui Nesan don't know about, right? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Be silent for a while. Your headache will get worse. It's as my wife says. I have no idea what you people have been talking about up until now. Then there can only be one answer. Father called her. For today's family conference. For the family conference? Then for what reason? I don't know that. I thought you knew Nissan. That's why I thought I'd question you. Ava, could you give it a rest? Kraus Nissan said he doesn't know. So this is what we got. Father stealthily invited the Witch of the Portrait as a secret guest. And Rosa-san met her, Maria-chan met her, and Kyria-san met her too. That's all we know for now. If she has something to say to us, she could just quickly show herself. So what I want to know is why in blazes she shut herself up without greeting us. You think maybe even Dad had any interest? You think maybe Dad never had any interest in the family conference from the beginning and just secretly called a new mistress here? And had her dress up as his ideal witch? 
<laughs> nah. This day holds too much significance to come to that conclusion. There can only be one reason. To join in on the family conference. She wants to claim some right to father's inheritance. Preposterous. The head would never have something as filthy as a mistress. I told you to be silent. I've been in this mansion with father for considerable time, and I haven't heard about this once. Let me humor you as best as I can. You say father had a hidden child with a mistress of several decades past, and father searched her out and called her here today. Is that what you want to say? Dear, father would never have something like that, to waste the noble blood of the Ushiramiya family on a mistress. This is nothing more than a few people saying they saw something. It's obviously a fantasy, a delusion, a daydream. Or are you all taking part in some kind of act to entrap my husband? What act? If anyone is acting, it's you! Quit it, Aniki. She said that in a slightly reckless way, but Natsui sounds correct. Kyrie saw her, but I didn't. Neither did you, Aniki. But Rosa did. However, that means that she exists. Because there's someone who can prove that she exists, we directly conclude that she exists. It's the opposite pattern of the devil's proof. And I want to meet her too. And I want to ask her directly what kind of business she has with the Ushiramiya family. I agree with you on that. I truly wish to inquire as to what business she has on Rokenjima. Don't act like you don't know. She's after one thing. It's father's inheritance. We should form a forward-looking strategy with a lawyer knowledgeable about inheritance issues. If the mistress claims the same rights as the mother, then our shares will be cut right in half. W wait a second, everybody. genji san will come very soon. He knows everything. I'm sure he'll answer our questions. Until then, let's stop talking about this. Come on now, kids. Sorry, but we adults have to start talking about something a little complicated. Go back to the guest house. Rosa yelled at the children, slightly emotionally. The children didn't understand why they were suddenly being yelled at now, but Ava and the rest came to the same realization as Rosa after a delay. They were talking so grandly about the filthy topic of the inheritance in front of the children. There was no way they'd want their children to remain here. So they all immediately agreed with Rosa's plan. That's right. Just as Rosa San says. George, take all the cousins and go back to the guest house. You all play nice together, you hear? George, do as you're told. Take all of the cousins and leave, right now. Wait a second, Mother. We haven't even finished eating yet. Mmm, and we still have dessert. Haven't had dessert. Ooh. We'll have Goda San carry dessert to the guest house, so leave. Jessica, from here on the adults will be talking together. Go. Uh, fine. Even though it's only half eaten. So I guess I'm not going to be the only exception. Thank you for understanding, Bathakun. But you're lucky, you know. Huh? Why? I'd want to leave if I could. <laughs> I bet you would. I'll let you adults enjoy your happy family chat about the inheritance. I'll also leave my seat. It appears that I have no place here tonight. Nanjo softly rose from his seat. He had been calmly watching the whole discussion from his seat at the farthest corner of the table without pointlessly interrupting. His reaction was very adult, like a calm old gentleman. When Nanjo rose from his seat, it urged on the other people who were supposed to leave. As the children noisily rose from their seats, a commotion was heard in the hallway as the servants returned. I apologize for taking so long. I've called Genji. I was checking to see that all the doors and windows were shut, so it took me some time. My apologies. Come on, children, to the guest house. Goda-san, I'm very sorry, but could you carry the desserts for the children to the guest house? I see. Is that what you wish? It seemed that Goda did not appreciate that the dinner he had worked so hard on was going to be interrupted like this. He sent Natsuhi a look, as though asking her whether that was really all right. Do as Rosa-san says. Also, it will not be necessary to set out dessert for us. Be sure not to approach the dining hall until we call you. Tell that to the rest of the servants, too. Understood? It, yes. Certainly. Come, everyone. Shall we go? Maria-san, you too. You must not trouble your mother any further. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about Beato. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Maria-chan, will you tell us about Beatrice and the guest house? I really want to hear about the witch. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're really good, George Nissan. I'm impressed. You sure you don't have kids? You're too used to this. <laughs>
Maria's mood was completely back to normal at George's words, and she even took the initiative in hurrying every al everyone along to the guest house. Oh, is that the first use of Beato? Yeah, Beato is like, you know, just kind of a nickname based on the way you pronounce her name from Japanese to Italian, Beatorice. Oh yeah, Burn calls her that, that's true. <clears throat> but yeah, Beato. <clears throat> It looked like Gota didn't like being kicked out him by him himself, but he was unable to disobey Natsuhi and left the room with Battler and the rest, closing the door. Do you all have some business with me? Yes, we do. A bunch of it. And that goes for all of us. So much that we almost want to draw lots to see who asks the first question. Though I believe no matter who draws the winning lot, the first question would be the same. No doubt. Genji-san, answer us honestly. This woman called Beatrice in the VIP room right now. Who is she? No, 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 no. Okay, I guess we have to get through this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this scene again, but... Oh, well. <laughs> Hideyoshi's claim that advertising doubled the taste was apparently right. The kids and Nanjo, who had been chased out of the guest house, had gathered in the cousin's room and were eating the cake that Kumasawa had brought there for dessert. It was both wonderful and high class, with lavish amounts of cream and decorated deliciously with fruits. But even though it was delicious, for some reason it didn't quite taste quite as good. <laughs> Without Gota san's advertising, it doesn't taste nearly as good. Can we skip it? There's like one thing worth reading there. No, no, we can't skip anything, unfortunately. There is only one scene in the entirety of Umineko that I am going to skip through. And when I say skip through, I mean like skim through. Uh, and that's not because it's poorly written or anything. It's just, uh, it's one in, it's in a much later episode, but it actually just like genuinely makes me really fucking uncomfortable. But, uh. Uh, we'll talk about that when we actually get to it. <clears throat> uh, no, it does not involve George, surprisingly. And good frickin' luck asking Kumasawa Bachan for advertising. She'll just say it's made out of mackerel. Oh, yeah, and of course, except the bad anime boob jokes, of course. Yes, of course. <clears throat> oh. Episode 6 scene. Yeah, Egg Egg in the chat knows which one it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't. Don't hint too much at it, but you guys who mentioned some hints, you know which one I'm talking about. <clears throat> oh, really? You can make cake from mackerel? Is it uncomfortable in a bad way or actually good, but just a lot? It's well written, but it is really, really fucking uncomfortable. And it has, it, it is related to a very, very serious subject matter. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes, this cake, too. If you mix the squeezed juice out of a mackerel in with the flour and eggs and bake it up, it comes out all fluffy. <laughs> that would be incredible if true. Maybe mackerel cake will show up on the new menu at Father's stores. <laughs> because mackerel's full of nutrients and has a healthy image, it could be really popular with women and old people. But I'm not going to go anywhere near it. Girls won't eat something that weird. Even old people would wish to decline. <laughs> but it's delicious. Kumasawa was really raising the mood with the mackerel jokes that were to her specialty, but the sound of the downpouring rain invariably focused their concern on the mystery guest. In the end, they ended up shower showering Maria with questions again, since she was the only person here to have met Beatrice. I never believed that story was true. From the way you say that, it sounds like this wasn't the first time you heard that Maria was meeting a witch, even if you didn't believe it. Yeah, I thought it was pretty typical fairy tale for people of that imaginative age. Exists! Beatrice exists! Every year when we come to the family conference, I see her and we play together. That's right. Although Beatrice Sama doesn't usually show herself. I hear that she sometimes unexpectedly appears before honest people with clean hearts to play pranks. 
Beatrice was a name which referred to the being in that fairy tale about the Rokenjima witch. Because the family and the servants publicly accepted the image of the witch of Kinzo's delusions to keep him in a good mood. Uh, I definitely wouldn't check anything from as late as episode six beforehand, even if you were darkly curious, just because uh, you will be instantly swarmed with gigantic spoilers. <laughs> Because the family and the servants publicly accepted the image of the Witch of Kinzo's delusions to keep him in a good mood, it became established as Rokenjima's fairy tale, or maybe ghost story. To the family members who knew that history, the fairy tale of the Golden Witch didn't have much substance. However, they hadn't been able to say that in front of Kinzo. So, to those who didn't know the history, like young Maria, for example, it definitely wasn't insubstantial, but a real legend of a witch. So Maria believed in the legend of the witch. She swallowed it whole. That was natural for an imaginative girl who believed in witches. So no one said anything to betray her dreams. On the contrary, they arranged things together to get her excited about her dreams. So even on those times when Maria-chan showed off candy and said that Beatrice had given it to her, I thought that somebody had probably slipped a candy into Maria-chan's handbag or something to create that impression. I've also put on such performances on a few occasions in the past secretly placing sweets somewhere for her. Probably Kumasawa-san, too. No, I expect all of the servants and all of the Ishiramiya family have done it once or twice. So, if that will make a small, innocent kid happy, you sometimes plan it together and pl play some sweets somewhere. In that case, I'll bet you do that kind of thing all the time. Right, George Aniki? <laughs> Who knows? Admitting that would probably be unrefined. George admitted it while being extremely wary that Maria didn't find out. In other words, it's kind of like Santa Claus. To protect a kid's dream, the parents plot together and lie, setting presents at the bedside of a child fast asleep. I mean, you do want to protect kids' dreams. As for me, I obviously found out that Santa didn't exist a long time ago. But if it was okay not to wake from that dream, I'd have liked to believe it my whole life. Because they know that the world is tough. Adults want to at least protect a child's untainted dreams. Oh, Beatrice exists! Exists! Oh, goodness, certainly. Beatrice-sama does exist, you know. Some time ago, when I was drying mackerel to make some black tea, all of a sudden... Well, that's basically how it went. Or at least, that's how we thought it was. How we thought it went. I had to take off my glasses for a second, and I literally did not... <laughs> I could not read that word. My eyesight is getting so bad. <clears throat> To sum up, she's a witch that supposedly no one believed in, except for Maria. Those words don't quite explain it. It's not that we don't be didn't believe. We were trying to let her believe. So this was about not betraying a child's innocence. But Santa doesn't exist in reality. If you didn't, don't want them to be all disappointed when they learn that, you should just not give them that dream in the first place. Did I think that because I was still a long way from becoming an adult? Battler had finally attained a level of understanding about the true form of the Rokenjima Witch. But the current situation lay on an even higher level of understanding than that, and overturned all its premises. What are you guys talking about with Utena? <laughs> Who mentioned Utena first? Uh, having done essentially identical thing with Utena. I watched the first third of the anime and the movie. I can guarantee that would happen. Yeah, yeah, you would absolutely get super spoiled if you watched the movie early. <laughs> yeah, Utena's great, though. Uh, it is also, it, it also has some, like, difficult content to stomach, uh, handled in a good way, but, like, yeah. Um, I would definitely not just, like, there are a lot of people who just willy-nilly recommend Utena because it's gay, and, like, it is, but, like, People should really give some trigger warnings for that shit, because there is a lot of heavy shit in it. <clears throat> Anywho. Hold on, I'm actually gonna use an actual cloth to clean my glasses so that I can see. Oh, what heavy stuff? Um, Utena has lots of, um, like... How do I say this? Because I don't want to spoil too much of anything. Yeah, essay, misogyny, patriarchy, uh, sexual assault uh, being what essay means. Um, 
Also, there's... Uh, let me put this delicately. Um, some of that essay involves incest, so be careful about that, too. <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot. That's all we believed the witch Beatrice Sama to be, but then she actually appeared. Right. Furthermore, judging from our parents' uproar, it looks like she wasn't an invited guest. That sounds kind of interesting. There actually is no basis to say that a woman called Beatrice doesn't exist. It's what Uncle Rudolph called a devil's proof. None of us knew that a woman calling herself Beatrice existed. But that doesn't mean we can deny the possibility that Beatrice exists. Uh, oh, and Jesus and people recommend that. It, it's it's well handled. It's like it's not like it's exploitative or done like for fetishy reasons or anything like that. It is just a very uncomfortable topic, obviously. So, yeah, I, I think it Utena is a really good show. But yeah, if you're not the type of person that can handle that sort of thing, then like, please, you know, <laughs> do take care of yourself. <clears throat> Dr. Nanjo, you've been friends with Grandfather for a long time, right? Hmm. There was a period when I questioned quite a lot on this topic at the family conferences, by Krausan and the others. The topic of whether Kinzo-san may have had a mistress long ago and even a hidden child with her. I see. Our parents' heads are full with the distribution of the inheritance, so it's blindingly obvious that if the daughter of a mistress showed up, it'd mean trouble for them. Krausan and the rest probably asked Genji-san about it first. However, Genji-san has sw uh, sworn loyalty to Kinzo-san as his right-hand man, and is probably a more trusted friend to Kinzo-san than myself. I imagine Genji-san didn't tell them anything. And so they turned to me as his next oldest friend, I suppose. And? When all this is said and done, Dr. Nanjo, did Grandfather have a mistress called Beatrice? He did. No, I've never met her. However, I've heard from Kinzo-san that he did have a relationship with a woman like that. He said that she passed away a very long time ago. She's dead. And did he have a child with her? That I do not know. But Kinzo-san always said that he's researching how to revive Beatrice. Usually, if one loses a lover and has a child left from them, they would pour all of the love onto that child. Therefore, we naturally thought that there probably wasn't a child between Kinzo-san and Beatrice. Hmm? That makes that a devil's proof as well. It does. It's impossible to prove that he didn't have a child with his mistress. So now that she's actually appeared, we have to assume that he did. That's a bit of a rushed argument. It's more realistic that someone caught wind of the trouble over the Ushirimiya inheritance issue, found out about Grandfather's relationship with the mistress long ago, and impersonated her trying to work their way into the inheritance issue. It is more realistic. However, we can't deny the possibility that she really is a hidden child, who lived in isolation, forgotten by Grandfather, and who's returned for revenge, right? Revenge? The hell did that come from? Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. I'm a guy. We just like to embellish things to make them more interesting. I've seen too many weird dramas. <laughs> Normally, that would have been a light joke, but it hadn't come. But it had come when a mystery guest calling herself Beatrice, who no one had invited, had marched in on the day of the family conference, the day of the inheritance distribution discussion, which even without the witch was threatening to become a bloodbath. There was no way that Battler's joke would be welcomed with laughter. So it was a really big help when Nanjo laughed energetically to calm everyone down. <laughs> I see, I see. That does sound quite interesting. I should love to read a novel with a plot like that. Well, I don't think that could happen in reality. After all, right now on this island, there's one, two, three, eighteen people, right? If she did something weird, we can immediately restrain her. And thanks to the typhoon, she can't even leave the island. Basically, there's just no way she could begin to pull off a crazy crime like that. I agree. In a dead end without any way to escape, and in a situation where everyone is suspicious of her, I really don't think she could pull off a terrifying revenge strategy li tragedy like that. I imagine not. If revenge was her aim, it would have been more realistic for her to come in secret without showing herself. You don't often hear about people appearing openly for revenge except for in historical plays. 
I wouldn't be so sure about that. Revenge is based on emotion, not frickin' logic. And if she wants revenge so badly she's ready to give her life for it, she might not be afraid of the police or the numbers of people if there, or that there's no way out. It's all right, jessica John. Nothing as horrible as we imagine will happen. <laughs> like that battle royale between our parents over the inheritance isn't horrible. You're right. Dad and Uncle Rudolph are pretty tough, and Auntie Ava's even trained in the martial arts. We'll be okay. Yeah. Jessica didn't say it, but she had vaguely noticed that her own father opposed all of the other siblings regarding the inheritance. They acted like everything was good in front of the children, but when that pretense was lifted away like it had been, it, like it had been at dinner, it would become a tumultuous uproar. It was only natural that Jessica, realizing that, would be frightened that her father and mother had gotten into some kind of trouble, and were about to be sacrificed for something terrifying. Seriously. George Aniki is right. Nothing's gonna happen. It's probably not realistic, but I wish there could be a separate spoiler chat for this. My brain is exploding. Well, uh, if you join the server, I have a, uh, a spoiler channel for Umineko, so there's that at least. <laughs> even if she pretends she's a witch, what can a single human woman who can't even use magic do? <laughs> the sudden creepy laugh made all of us jump. And when we realized that this strange laugh was coming from Maria, we were shocked again. So that's how it is. That's your perception, isn't it, Battler? What? what is? Don't laugh all creepy like that. You accept Beatrice's existence, for now. At least you accept her as the 19th person and as a guest. But that's all, right? You don't accept that the 19th person Beatrice is a witch, right? You surprised us all for that? Of course I don't. There's obviously no such thing as witches. It's impossible for it to be anything other than a human woman pretending to be one. <laughs> hmm? That makes no sense, Battler. That's a devil's proof, you know. There's obviously no such thing as witches. But that just means you've never met a witch. And doesn't mean you can deny that witches exist, right? <laughs> That's right. That really is right. I can't prove that witches don't exist. However, even if I can't prove it, I can claim it. I can claim that witches don't exist. How? How can you claim that witches don't exist even though you can't prove it? Because stuff like that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's QED? Proof concluded without any evidence or bias? A classic example of how ignorance shelves its problems. A reckless suspension of thought. <laughs> In that case, I have one answer, Maria. The witch side has to show some proof of themselves. This is also part of the devil's proof. If you bring one, it'll be over quickly. In our case, this lady calling herself Beatrice just has to perform some magnificent magic like sending out sparkling stars with her wand or something and show us something that's impossible for humans, right? Come now, you two. Please settle down. Kumasawa noticed that the atmosphere between them was getting worse and tried to calm them. It seemed as though Battler quickly realized that he was acting immaturely. But Maria's expression didn't loosen. She kept staring at Battler as she laughed creepily. You quit it too, Maria. Let's get back in a good mood, all right? Hold on, I have a very applicable image for this moment. Where is it? I have it saved somewhere. I just have to find it. God, if only my memes folder was labeled better. Wait, is this it? Yes, yes, here it is. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> if that's what you want, Beatrice will show you, I'm sure. Something impossible for humans. And then you too will believe, right? About Beatrice? Sure. If she lets me have a look-see, I'll believe. It's a chess argument between the witch and you, Battler. If you get checkmated, you will believe in the witch. Oh, that's a stylish analogy. The witch shows her magic. My king's put into check. I quibble, saying that it would be possible to reproduce that by measures even a human could take and escape and create an escape from my king. If I can't do that, it's checkmate. That's a pretty good analogy. 
Battler, in chess, you and your opponent have pieces which move in the same way. That's why you can read your opponent's moves. But you know what? You haven't supposed that your opponent's pieces might be able to move in much more strange ways than yours. You've simply assumed that since witches shouldn't exist, the movements of Beatrice's pieces will obviously be the same as your own. But the thing is, sorry, Battler, but your chess partner isn't human. She's a witch. She can move her pieces, pieces in ways that humans can't. Try to send you the fan art I just made on Insta, but I believe you have messages limited. Uh, let me see. Let me let me check it real quick. I don't really use Instagram, so uh, it probably. I got a message request. Let's see. Accept. Let's see. Uh, I, hold on just a second. Am I? Okay, wait. Where is my, God, I'm such, I feel like such a boomer right now. Where are my messages? General, okay, there we go. Um, I see your message, but I don't see a drawing attached to it. Um, maybe try sending it again since I've accepted the request. <clears throat> but, uh, anywho, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll check it back in a second if you, uh, send it again. Cthulhu, the Canadian $2. Battler, nice argument. Unfortunately, your mom. Okay, uh, did it go through that time? Yes! Oh my gosh, that's so good! Holy crap! Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta save this. Uh, and let me find it on desktop real quick. I'm sorry to, like, hold up chat, but you guys gotta see this. This is really good. Continue, or, well, actually, I guess I should not, no, don't sign into my personal Instagram. Switch over to my, blah, log into an existing account. Let's see. <laughs> don't worry, you, you are not holding me up. I'll keep going, uh, but I do want to show chat. Here we go. Okay, hold up. Let me save it. Okay, here we go. This is uh, Wayward Nebula's art. This is so good. Look at this. This is awesome. I love this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This is this is really really good. Anywho, <laughs> now we will get back to it. <clears throat> Butler. You like Antikyrie's chessboard thinking, right? Yeah. I like that style of thinking where you stand in your opponent's position. And that's no good. Even though your opponent is a witch, you won't accept that. So you can't understand the moves a witch can make, and your chessboard thinking won't work. Your perception of your opponent is wrong. The very first premise of chessboard thinking is broken down. Oh? Is that what you say? You cannot win in chess against a witch. Uh, Sonata? Oh. What's going on there? Is there a note about this in the grimoire? There is not. Um, hold on. I'm actually very curious about this. Uh, no, not pronounce. Pronoun Japanese. Uh, what does Sonata mean? 
Originally a mesial deictic pronoun, meaning that side, that way, that direction, used as a lightly respectful second person pronoun in previous eras, but now used when speaking to an inferior in a pompous and old fashioned tone. Oh, so it's a very like archaic way of basically saying like you in a very demeaning kind of way. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess she's probably like trying to speak in the, in the way that Beatrice does. I do not know what happened after that. We servants were or ordered not to approach the dining room. I see. So, Shannon, have you uh, ever met this person called Beatrice before? I have no idea. That was a slightly odd way to say it. I I thought it Oh, uh, wait. Okay, this is George narration again. I thought it didn't sound like she meant her memory was vague. For us servants, Beatrice Sama is another master of this mansion. Some speak as if we spread that rumor due to have been, having been influenced by the master, but since the time I started working here, the story of Beatrice Sama was always, always, already whispered about. I heard about it before. How you'll get cursed if you don't respect her, and how there was a servant who actually had an accident this way. Yes, but it's true that some people believed more or less than others. I, um, believe that respect for that sort of thing shouldn't be forgotten, so I've never doubted that she exists. I dimly believed that a, um, uncertain being called the Golden Witch surely existed. And then, that witch whose existence was uncertain actually showed herself and came in openly through the entrance hall? Is that what happened? Well, at least they're talking about Beatrice and not their relationship. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything. When you brought her dinner, did you talk about anything? No, nothing. I see. Still, a witch that eats food somehow doesn't sound so realistic. Maybe it's just someone who knows about the witch legend on this island taking Beatrice's name on after all. I think you're prob you've probably come to respect Beatrice and think of her as something like a guardian goddess of the mansion. So when a person appeared actually calling themselves that, maybe you were a little disturbed. Yes. I think that definitely could be it. George was slightly at a loss for what to do about Shannon's downcast appearance. So this art is from the PS4 version? It's the PS3 version, yeah. Um, that was uh, put together by Alchemist. And it was only released in Japan. <clears throat> Possibly, not just Genji, but also the young servants, including Shannon, had been strictly questioned about whether they had a clue as to who this person called Beatrice was. Thinking that, he had tried to cheer her up somehow. Like Maria and Jessica, Shannon too must be unable to completely hide her agitation over the sudden visit of a person calling herself the Golden Witch. He thought that must be the case. But George had no way of knowing what was in Shannon's heart. Shannon was bitter and sad. The door to the Golden Land would be opened. The Witch had definitely told her that. That meant the demise of everything. Even if she accepted the ring from George, now they could never be married. ERA. Guys, I'm going to sleep while listening to this. See you in the morning. Uh, hopefully I don't blow your ears out with a witch cackle. Uh, if I give you nightmares, sorry. <laughs> uh, also, I'm sorry if you have dreams about us talking about Fortnite sauce later. <laughs> <clears throat> no, in the first place, did furniture like her have the right to be married? Even if the witch hadn't come to tell of their demise, wasn't it fated to fail sometime or other? Hadn't she turned her gaze toward the fun days with George and purposefully closed her eyes to the sad reality? What's wrong? You've really been seeming down for a while now. George, son, what does it mean to be engaged? Huh? Uh, um, it means making a promise to marry. But the way I think of it, it means the same thing as marriage. Honestly, I want to take you as my wife right now and take you back home. But right now I'm in the middle of training, and I'm still a long way from gaining the ability needed to create my own castle. That's why I want to become an independent man first, and only then proudly take you home with me. I'm not talking about the distant future. I just want you to wait a short three years. But even so, I don't want to lie about my feelings for the next three years. So I decided to give you the engagement ring. That might be a shameful reason as a man. 
An engagement because I want you to wait, because I can't balance a wife and a job, might be shameful. But I will never. Thank you very much. I now understand that you, and to you, an engagement ring isn't just another present you would give to a lover. Uh, of course not. An engagement ring isn't a simple accessory. It's an oath between lovers, a precious promise left in the form of a ring. <laughs> in that case, if we got married quickly, it would become unnecessary, right? Then it wouldn't be an engagement ring I'd give you. I'd give it to you as a wedding ring. Either way, it won't change the fact that I'll give you a ring. So it's like a sales contract, saying this woman is mine, nobody touch her. N no, that's not what I... <clears throat> George knew about his shameful character. When he had fallen for Shannon and sworn to become an excellent man, he had sworn to part ways with that shameful part of himself. Hi, Lambda Delto! So he chose to answer a little roughly on purpose, believing that Shannon would find it reassuring. No, that may be exactly it. Sayo, I'll make you my wife. I won't give you to anyone else. I'll make you all mine. So no one better lay a hand on you. That's what this ring is, without a doubt. Eh. Hack. <laughs> Thank you very much, George Sun. I'm truly happy. Then, George Sun, if it was decided by fate that this engagement ring, that this promise would not be fulfilled, would you still give it to me? Shannon was about to ask that, but she swallowed her words. Because George had already spoken the answer. George had said it. He had said that to him. He had said that to him an engagement ring was infinitely similar to a wedding ring. Therefore, accepting George's ring had a far more sacred significance than a promise to marry. Which is why, I will stop calling this an engagement ring. From now on, this isn't an engagement. It's a wedding ring. Is... is that alright? Is it alright to, um, just proclaim that we're married without God's blessing? Yeah. It's enough to tell God, Father, and Mother about it afterwards. We'll declare that the two of us have already been joined in marriage. No one can overturn it. George, son. I'm not saying this because of a momentary emotion. I'm not just looking at how you are now. I'm looking at how you will be tomorrow and the next day. I'm even gazing, gazing at you as you'll be in old age, in the future as I say this. I am able to see beyond the quantum realm, and I can envision you in your future, your many different myriad futures. I hate to break this to you, but I am actually from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <clears throat> You're always telling me that about, about that, George son. About how you want to spend your old age slowly, surrounded by sprightly children and grandchildren. Yeah. At that time, an older you will be beside me. That's what I predict. No, what I foresee. I'm playing some online Golden Fantasia while watching the stream. Yo, so cool. I'm not, I'm not really that good at Golden Fantasia myself, but I am hoping to continue improving at it so that when one day we finish this stream series, maybe uh, I'll play it on stream or something and maybe people could like join and play with me or something. I don't know. That'd be fun. <clears throat> yeah, at that time. Oh, wait. Yeah, I already read that. Because that day will surely come. Will it surely come? Is it okay? For me to believe. Yes. Surely. Definitely. And this ring proves it without words. Show it to me. Hmm? Uh, 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 here it is. George, thinking he was being told to show her the ring, hurriedly took out the ring box. Even though he had practiced so much, he hadn't been able to look cool. But Shannon wasn't looking at that. With a straight and direct gaze, with faint tears and a smile, she was staring right at George's eyes. No, into something she could see beyond his eyes. Uh, what's Golden Fantasia, Historian Sayori? Uh, Golden Fantasia is a Umineko fighting game. It has its own arcade modes and everything. <clears throat> but uh, I wouldn't look up anything about it if you are a new fan because it has a lot of spoilers in it too. <laughs> it, is, it is the type of fighting game that is chock full of like fan service for people who have finished the game. <clears throat> Show me the future, please. Uh, is Golden Fantasia canon or just spoilery? No, it, I, I mean, it's not really like canon. It's just, you know, kind of a for fun sort of thing. It's, uh, but yeah, it, it is very spoilery. 
Show me that future, please. Uh, yeah. I'll show it to you. For sure. I promise. And not just until old age. After we die, too. Even if we become spirits, we'll always, always be together. Shannon wiped away her tears and took the ring box. Inside was a diamond ring more than worthy of blessing the two of them. George said the line that he had practiced over and over again in his head. I... Oh, wait, that's George. I... I want you to put that ring on whichever finger you, finger you like, and have that be your answer. Um, so by tomorrow morning... <laughs> Shannon smiled, took the ring, and with a completely natural movement, put it on the right finger of her left hand. It really had looked like a very, very natural movement. This is a very big difference for Shannon. Um, if you recall in the last episode, she was too flustered to actually give him an answer at the time and ran off. Um, only after her body was discovered did they find the ring on her finger. But right now, she's actually just going ahead and plop, doing it right there. Um... You know, even though uh, this moment sucks for some reasons, obviously, uh, I, I do think it is nice to see Shannon coming into, like, a little bit more confidence on her own, like, asserting her own, you know, like, individuality. Um, and, you know, obviously, like, she shows that and when she stands up to Beato earlier as well. And for a while, George was stunned. This is my answer, George son. Shannon, no, Sayo. Even if we become spirits, we'll always, always be together, George son. There was no blessing from God, no pastor to witness, nothing. But the two to be married had proclaimed it. Two souls were joined here today. Uh, are you gonna see in transition? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, I was waiting for it. Nason, you're an idiot. Am I really? Even though you're furniture, even though you're furniture, I'm not furniture, not anymore. Liar! Why aren't you? Why are you fooling yourself? You know, you know that you can never become human. You know that you can't become human unless you go to the Golden Land. So why did you throw away the promise that enabled you to go to the Golden Land? Oh yeah. By accepting the ring, that promise with Beatrice-sama comes to nothing, doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry. No, me, you, George-sama, the master. Each and every one of us has the same conditions. Thirteen people will be made sacrifices. Only five will be invited to the Golden Land. And you rejected one of those places. Yourself. That's odd. It looks like you're the one with lingering regrets, Kanon kun You're the one with regrets. Aren't you, Nason? You got engaged, right? Even though you knew it was fate that would never be fulfilled. Yep. I promised that we would always, always be together. For eternity. So you know what? In that instant, our eternity was completed. Even if we become sacrifices, it's already completed, so it's all right. Kanonkun, you're the one who actually has regrets. We're furniture, right? No matter what the result, we will be freed. In that case, it doesn't matter whenever we go to the Golden Land, whether we go to the Golden Land or not. And yet, you're set on going to the Golden Land. You want to become human no matter what, right? Why? Because I want to become human. I've had enough of being furniture. Why? I wanted to fall in love as well. Tears spilled from both of Canon's eyes, and he howled. I, I liked my lady, and after seeing my lady on that day, I started liking her even more. And when I heard that my lady also liked me, I was really happy. But I'm furniture, and I can't accept my lady's feelings. That's where you're wrong. We may be furniture. We may be less than human. But I learned that doesn't mean we aren't qualified to love. I believed that if we couldn't make those feelings eternal, we were better without them. 
I just decided that someday, a day would come when I would disappear. And that would definitely hurt her. No, that's wrong. I was just frightened. I was just afraid and thought that if love could not be eternal, I was better off not knowing it. Cicadas fall in love during a span of only a few weeks out of their whole lives, and then they disappear. I don't think that there are any cicadas that don't fall in love because it will be over in a few weeks. <laughs> it seemed that Canon was still speaking of his regrets, but by now it was all jumbled up in his crying voice. I hate that witch. Why did she plant these feelings in me? If only... If only she hadn't pulled that weird prank, I wouldn't have paid my lady any notice. Beatrice-sama is so cruel, isn't she? To make you cry bitter tears, she played games with your fate. But the witch probably isn't achieving what she plotted. After all... Knowing love isn't a lingering attachment that ties you to life. It is the place we should reach on our journey through life. So there you have it, Canon. That promise you worked so hard for has come to nothing. <laughs> well now, with this, the conditions for all of the pieces are the same. There are 18 pieces. 13 will be sacrificed. Who will the five survivors be? Or will someone destroy this ritual? Who? How? <laughs> This isn't a chess problem. It's a game on equal footing. I won't be closing in one-sidedly. You can frantically run for my advances and make it a tie as a result of no con a result of no contest. Well, the best you can do is have that repeat over and over. And it probably won't be that difficult for you. However, these no contest results will continue forever, soon wearing down your mind and eventually killing it. And at that time, you will accept your defeat and surrender to me. The reason I said it was a fair game, that is because the rules for my loss have also been established. There's nothing so boring as a game you can't lose, you see. The way to defeat me, that is, the epitaph offered to my portrait, that is both the way to open the door to the Golden Land and the key to destroying my ritual. I complete the ritual according to the epitaph. You solve the epitaph's riddle, destroy the ritual and overthrow me. Solve the riddle hidden in the epitaph, and expose the location of the vast gold I gave to Kinzo. What result will this game show us? I'm expecting a good fight from you. Entertain me, Ushido Mia Battler! I have no objections. Natsuhi and I accept it. I can't believe it. And I don't want to, but that is reality, isn't it? Natsuhi, choose your words more carefully. She is this family's most honored guest. We accept it too. There's nothing more to say. Yes, I accept it. I have absolutely no complaints. I can't believe that you really... I have to honestly respect you. Me too. Incredible. I genuinely respect you. So I have to accept it. I accept it too. Still can't believe it. But what can you do? You've proven devils. You win. <laughs> the devil's proof was a convenient excuse that you li liked u using to show that something was impossible to prove. But now it's become your mortal enemy, has it not? Don't torture me, Great Witch. I've already accepted you. I resign. Kyrie, do you still have any objections? I must have everyone in agreement. If you alone will not accept my existence... As the witch laughed boldly, the siblings started to panic. They were afraid of displeasing the witch. Kyrie lightly closed her eyes, and after keeping silent for a while, opened her mouth. 
My apologies. I resign. Only Kyrie had faced the witch with stern eyes until the end. However, she had only been able to resist acknowledging the truth for a short time. The reality, the being, that was before her eyes, couldn't be denied. Devils had already been proven. I also accept it. You are Beatrice, the Ushirimiya family alchemist, and a user of great magic. I must accept the fact that you're a witch. Kumasawa and Goto are never called furniture by themselves or others. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. That may, yeah, that may not be the case. Genji calls himself furniture though, that's for sure. Hey guys, uh, remember how in the first episode there was a scene where we had a little head count of where everybody was at midnight? Remember what happened after that? Let's get to it. Seems like pretty much all of these adults are uh, in the chapel. All the siblings and their spouses. Kanon is in the mansion. Gota is in the servants' room. Genji is in the other servant room in the uh, in the guest house. Maria is in the cousins' room in the guest house. Jessica is also, and so are Battler and George. Kinzo is, of course, in his study. Beato is in the VIP room. Yeah, Menlo Marseilles. Uh, Rosa did also uh, uh, acknowledge uh, Beato and give up. The second day, October 5th, 1986. <clears throat> oh yeah, and they didn't show Shannon or Nanjo. Interesting. What was the sound that always filled their ears? The sound of the rain, the sound of a waterfall, or was it radio static? In that case, I want it to be the sound of blood flowing through the body. I want it to be the sound of blood circulating throughout my body, telling me that I am still alive. Oh, it's Kinzo. Hmm. Is it morning? The light entering through a crack in the curtain was faint, but it, it at least told him that dawn had broken. Kinzo, still in the same pose he had had when he awoke, still sitting in his chair and looking up at the ceiling, felt the blood slowly travel throughout his body. Judging by the clock, it was early morning, six on the dot. No matter how tired he was, no matter how deeply he slept, he woke up at exactly this time as though he had measured it with an hourglass. He didn't think that something like this was worthy of boasting of, but he told himself that while he could still do something like this, he was still in robust health. Morning has come, which means, hmm. It seems that I have escaped being one of the first sacrifices. Was the result of the roulette fortunate, or is this the fruit of my efforts? It is irritating that I cannot tell the difference, but I will not say that. Kinzo was very slightly driven by a temptation to look at the other side of the study door. Because he thought that he might find traces of a vain struggle to break the door, made by someone trying to select him as one of the first sacrifices. Hmm. Humans are cheap creatures. 
They claim to do their best and leave the rest to providence, yet when they're given good fortune they desire to flatter themselves that it arose not from simple luck but from their own ability. So he wanted to check whether there was a wretched mark on the door. That is only human. Therefore, Kinzo did not check. He repressed the things he wanted to do because he was human. By that, Kinzo could immerse himself in a feeling of sufficiency, as though he had become a being that surpassed humans. He became aware of human desire and forbade it. Things that a human wanted to do, he resisted. This eccentric and rebellious sense had surely given him a rare genius, which must have allowed him to succeed in his exploits as he revived the Ushirimiya family in one generation. Well then, Beatrice, what were the six pieces you took, and what will your next move be? Entertain me. My defense is perfect. I will not shame myself like last time. <laughs> The servants woke early. They had, to, they had to open the curtains, prepare brec breakfast, and complete various other tasks to welcome the guests to a new day. Goda was the most enthusiastic. He had been told to concentrate his efforts in particular on his work as a chef for the duration of the family conference, and had been specifically ex specially exempted from several tasks that servants must normally do. It seemed that Goda, who was a show-off, had a particular feeling of supremacy about that. He left the preparations of the inside of the mansion to Genji and the rest, and worked on preparing breakfast in the kitchen. Goda alive, too! Genji split the work with Shannon and Kanon, and they carried out various tasks. Shannon headed to the dining hall and knocked. Last year, the family conference had continued into the small hours of the night. It wouldn't have been odd for this year's conference to continue all the way into the next morning. So she had knocked out of consideration for the possibility that they were still having a discussion inside. But there was no response, so she opened the door and said good morning. Good morning. Is anyone there? The room was cold, and it seemed that the conference had ended a long time before. On top of the table, there was a tea set from which they had probably been drinking, arranged in a way that would make it easy to clean them up. Cleaning away, was, cleaning away the tea was the servant's job. So if the family was too caring and cleaned it up themselves, the servants would lose face. Therefore, just doing this much for the servants truly was a pleasing act of kindness. As she approached the table to clean it away, she noticed that something like a memo had been left along with the cups. It had been placed together with the tea set, so naturally thinking it was a memo for the servant cleaning up, Shannon took it. Written on it was not a request, nor thanks for preparing the tea, but just a single word. Shannon looked at it blankly and read it aloud. Chapel. Hmm? A small sound kept repeating over and over. It was a sound that would ordinarily have been trivial and insignificant. I hope I stop hearing it soon. Then I could return to my doze, someone thought vaguely. But no matter how much time passed, the sound did not end. It repeated over and over. Ah, shut up. Who is that? Banging on the door constantly. As soon as she realized this, she woke up. Someone was knocking. Then she noticed that there wasn't just a knock, but a voice, too. Rosa-sama. Rosa-sama. Good morning. What? Wait. I'm coming now. It had been Genji's voice. Looking at the clock, it was still before seven. It was clearly too early to wake the guests. Did something bad happen that was bad enough to cause this? She felt her sleepiness increasingly fade thanks to this ominous premonition. Because Genji had been a fa familiar servant to Rosa since her childhood days, she opened the door a crack and answered, even though she was slightly defenseless in her pajamas. Yeah, Rosa's alive! Good morning. I apologize for waking you this early. Did something happen? Yes. Actually, at the chapel. Genji spoke into Rosa's ear and told her something in a small voice. It seemed that Rosa couldn't understand what she was being told only after hearing it once. Wasn't Rosa in the church? Yes, she was. And after repeating the words back to him several times, she finally realized that apparently something strange had happened. Rosa closed her door for a second, and after changing her clothes, she immediately accompanied Genji, and they headed to the mansion.
The chapel requires some explanation. It wasn't in the mansion, but in a grove behind the mansion, which could be reached after a short walk. It had been built at the same time that the mansion had been constructed on Rokenjima. So while its outside walls had been repaired many times, making it look new from the outside, it was a very old building. Rosa and Genji dashed through the rain together. Just like the previous night, the rain was falling in earnest. Eventually, they began to see the chapel beyond a sparse grove. If all she knew of it was its appearance from the outside, it might have felt like a place of dazzling beauty, where a pair of young lovers might want to hold a ceremony. However, it seemed that in Kinzo's eyes, this was a very sacred place. And Rosa and her siblings had been harshly told not to approach it unnecessarily. So even at this age, and no matter what the reason for it, she felt some guilt in approaching this chapel, and was gripped by the fear that this would surely make her father so angry that he would slap her across the face. The servant silhouettes could be seen in front of the entrance to the chapel. Goda, Shannon, and Canon, which meant that all of the servants on the morning shift had gathered. A short while ago, Rosa had been told the nature of the situation verbally by Genji. However, without laying eyes on it directly, she really hadn't been able to understand. Probably, all of the servants gathered there were the same. Without seeing it with their own eyes, they couldn't understand what was going on. Uh-huh. Because on the door that was the entrance to the chapel, drawn very large, with a creepy, sticky paint-like substance that made one think of blood, was something like a creepy magic circle. What is this? When was it drawn here? The servants looked at each other. Goda was the first to open his mouth. My... my apologies. We do not usually trespass here, so we do not know when it was drawn. Then who was the first person to find it? Th that was me. When I went to the dining hall to clean away the tea set, there was a memo with, the chap with chapel written on it. Shannon held out the memo with a shaking hand. Whose handwriting? Isn't it Nissan's or Nissan's handwriting? It isn't Nissan's or Nissan's? Uh, June Pop 45 with the two dollars. Aw, shit, here we go again. Yeah, here we go again. And then you came here and found this, right? Yes. Rosa Summer, look at this. What? Happy Halloween for... <gasps> Canon was pointing at a single line of English written below the creepy magic circle. Until it had been pointed out to her, she had thought it just another part of the magic circle and hadn't noticed it. Written there, in English, were the words, Happy Halloween for Maria. Happy Halloween for Maria. A wish for an enjoyable Halloween for Maria. A creepy magic circle for Maria. Happy Halloween. The only person who said the words Happy Halloween to Maria yesterday. The symbols matched. The Golden Witch, Beatrice. What, what about Maria? That kid should be sleeping with her cousins, right? Did you check? My apologies. We've just now realized that Maria Sama's name was written here. We still have not checked. I shall. What are you doing? I'll go check on Maria and come back. Also, inform Cross Nissan and the rest. Receive their instructions on how to proceed. After saying that much, Rosa finally noticed that something was out of place. Her own rank within this family conference was the lowest of the four siblings. In an abnormal situation like this, why had she been the only one called when the other siblings hadn't? Even if Maria's name had popped up. Don't tell me. Huh? What? <laughs> the cat. The cat. The cat? Could you could you shut him out of the hallway? Oh. I couldn't hear him because I was blaring music. I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> no no. That, no, that doesn't mean you come in. It's silly. <clears throat> yes. We tried to contact Krausama but could not find him. And Madame was not in her room. Judging by the condition of the sheets, 
she may not have returned to her bed all last night. Uh, does the cat have a name? Yes, I will type it in the chat. It is pronounced Bakara. <clears throat> uh, he just got a new little feather toy yesterday. He's been going crazy for it. I'm uh, gonna try to get him into the vet pretty soon, thankfully. Uh, but I had to uh, get the name of his previous vet from my mother so I could uh, point them toward them for to, to get his vet records. <clears throat> Rosa felt something creepy crawling slowly up her back. Is he okay? Uh, yes, but like... I've just been a little bit concerned about him because he's been having a little bit like of behavioral issues related to like a lot of peeing and stuff. I don't think it's medical related, but I would still prefer to take him to the vet to be completely sure. Rosa felt something creepy crawling slowly up her back. Did, did you check inside the chapel? No, not yet. We did try to check inside, but actually the luck. Oh, wait, that's Gendry. Actually, the lock to the chapel is special, so the master key does not work. There's a single key which can open it, but that key is missing from the key box. She didn't want to get any closer to the door with the creepy magic circle if she could help it. Rosa readied herself and approached, and tried pushing and pulling the knob. All she felt was the resistance of the sturdy lock. We searched to see whether there was a window through which we could enter, but... I think that in order to check inside, we would have to break one of the windows. What do you think? There's no way I can give you approval to do that. It's Father's precious chapel. I can't do something like that. Then the events of the previous day swirled around in the back of Rosa's mind. That's right. When I met that witch in the Rose Garden, didn't she hand Maria an envelope? Yes, I'm positive she did. When Maria had tried to open it, that witch had told her not to do that yet, and then she had definitely said, the, the time will come soon to open it. There's cat pheromone diffusers that may help with the stress of moving, which may be causing the pee. They also have collars, but the plug-in may be better. I have gotten a little bit, uh, like a little sprayer for that was similar to that, I believe, um, but it doesn't really seem to have done much good, unfortunately. Um, maybe some little plug-ins may be better though, yeah. Uh, we're, we're trying a, a few different things, uh, but overall, I just want to take him to the vet anyway, just in case. <clears throat> Rosa became convinced. There could be no doubt. That letter which had been handed to Maria. After dashing back to the guest house, Rosa approached the cousin's room while hiding her footsteps. Softly opened the door and peered inside. From the inside, she could hear the healthy snores of young people. The four children were all there. Maria was there, sleeping soundly. After heaving a sigh of relief, she entered the room with quiet footsteps. She was after Maria's handbag, which was resting on the sofa. Maria always liked walking around with her treasures. She was probably imitating how her mother always carried her makeup with her. Of course, she was just copying her, so on the inside, it was full of junk. In Maria's case, it was full of small, creepy, occult-like items and a notebook with things like that written in it. Rosa hadn't been once happy to see her daughter walking around with those kinds of ungirlish things. However, after she had tried to force Maria to stop, they had gotten into a big fight and she had decided to let it be. Here it is. This is it a western envelope with the crest of the gold eagle. When she took it out, she could tell that there was a heavy, cylindrical object inside. She could tell by its feel and its weight. There was no doubt. This was a key. After turning around and checking that Maria was still sound asleep, Rosa tore open the envelope and tipped out the contents into her palm. It was a key with an old and intricate design. Rosa grasped that key and dashed out. It seemed that Battler noticed those sounds, but after grumbling and turning over in his sleep, he started snoring again. Yeah, you, you, having, you having a hard time with those cans over there? Oh, I was uh, dropping a popsicle stick into both of them because I was like, 
stimming with it, I'll, and I was just like flexing in my hand when I broke it. So I just put it in the empty cans. I'm done playing with you now. Yeah. <laughs> now I got another <laughs> popsicle, so it's fine. Genji-san, could this key be the key to the chapel? Where did you? Yes, this is the key to the chapel. Rosa approached the creepy magic circle once again and put the key into the keyhole. There was a strong resistance. After it resisted for a short while, it stopped that resistance with a clunk. Then, squeaking with a noise that hurt one's ears, it slowly, slowly began to open. Going on four hours now? Yeah, I'm thinking of just trying to do like last time and probably end somewhere around midnight. <clears throat> My time, that is, which is in about an hour. But we'll see. <clears throat> Is anyone there? Her voice reverberated throughout the massive room. Of course, there was no answer. The chapel had a high ceiling, and the air was cold. And even on this rainy, unsettling day, for some reason, it felt sacred. The servants timidly followed after Rosa. Rosa-sama, look at that. Canon noticed it immediately and pointed. Over there was the altar. In the place where normally a pastor would preach of God's love, there was a table that shouldn't have been there. At first, it looked like a dining table, and there was actually gorgeous plates and utensils set on the table, enough to make you think it was a child's birthday party or something. Upon closer inspection, the surrounding area had been decorated with pumpkins and black and orange ribbons. They were probably Halloween decorations. And there were people si seated at the table. Three people on each side facing each other, seated in chairs. They could be recognized at a glance. Kraus and his wife, Ava and her husband, and Rudolf and his wife. But if you were asked if these were definitely them, you'd still have to go even closer to check. Because they almost seemed like dolls. Rosa and the rest had opened the door, entering all at once with the sound of many footsteps, and called out asking if anyone was there. And yet, there had been no reaction. Even assuming they had chosen to ignore them, normally you'd expect there to be some kind of reaction. And there hadn't even been that. So at first, it felt like someone had set down some dolls that looked a lot like them. By now, it wasn't just Rosa. Shannon and Cannon, and even Goda, they were all fighting frantically against the rising, creepy emotion tightly grasping their hearts. Nissan? Nissan? As she climbed up the altar, she called out again, but since the others gave no reaction. Yes, by now, Rosa had accepted it. They were not dolls. She had accepted that they were those very people. This is... <sighs> they approached close enough to be able to see clearly what was on the table. Just like their first impression, it looked like a lovely banquet, reminiscent of a child's birthday party. Plates piled up with sweets, glasses with lovely drinks, several ornaments in the shape of pumpkins. They were all decorated in a Halloween style, and while it might have been an irrelevant thought at a time like this, she thought that this would surely make Maria happy if she could see it. They were seated in front of that table, and it looked like they were sleeping. It was an eerie scene, as though a small, fun-looking Halloween party had been stopped in time. They're all... sleeping? Hmm? When she approached even closer to them, she realized that candies were scattered all over the floor. There were candies in very fancy wrapping, cookies, fizzy lemon sweets, chocolates, and they were all distributed across the carpet, which was covered with blackberry and cranberry jam. <laughs> Rosa and the rest finally realized what the situation was. It was a Halloween party, a banquet for those not of this world. Kraus, Natsuhi, Eva, Hideyoshi, Rudolph, and Kyrie, six people in all, were seated in the chairs, dead as though they were sleeping. Let's give him a check. Ushiromiya Kraus, corpse found inside the chapel. The direct cause of death is unknown, but it seems his stomach was cut open and his intestines were pulled out after his death. 
Additionally, sweets and candies were packed into his stomach. Welcome, Maria. Happy Halloween. Ushidomiya Natsuhi. Corpse found inside the chapel. The direct cause of death is unknown. Same description as Kraus. See, didn't I tell you? Bellies are full of candy. Ushidomiya Eva. Everyone has a belly that's filled with sweet dreams. Ushidomiya Hideyoshi. A belly could never be full of disgusting things. Ushidomiya Rudolph. That's why we want to be simple and sweet like candy. And Ushidomiya Kyrie. So this dreamland is for you. Happy Halloween. How could you tell they were dead and not simply sleeping? That was because they were, from their chest to their stomachs, vertically sliced open. Cross summer! Ah! How cruel. The six of them were seated at a Halloween party, all of them killed with their stomachs sliced open. Cthulhu of the two Canadian dollars. Damn it, who spilled their code red? Ah, you can just never, you can just never hold on to it. We're always running out. Was the jam that covered the floor something that they couldn't finish eating, which had overflowed out of their stomachs? No. The contents of their stomachs had been splattered all across the floor. And that wasn't all. From their stomachs, almost as though, almost as though, as though they had spilled out. Sweets. Candies and cookies, fizzy lemon sweets and chocolates had spilled out, stained with blood, and had scattered across the floor. What could have happened to have caused this? It was almost as though the inside of their stomachs had been stuffed full with sweets, and when their stomachs had been cut, it had all flowed out. Rosa remembered a gross-out meal, a turkey that had been served at her own birthday when she was a young girl. When she had put the knife in, from the inside, her very favorite, but because no one had told her about it at all, bright red, bright red ketchup omelet rice had poured out like blood-stained maggots, dripping, slimy, pulpy, sticky. <coughs> the trauma of her youth was revived. Rosa felt a monster raging inside her stomach as the acid started to rise up. Unable to hold back, she threw up on the floor. Her empty stomach couldn't throw up anything but stomach acid. The scene in front of her was no longer a fun Halloween party by any means. The three couples had been placed there, with their stomachs vertically, vertically wrenched open. Wrenched open with a... I don't even know how you're going to pronounce that onomatopoeia, but... <laughs> lots and lots of sweets had been stuffed in there. Pulpy. <laughs> Blood and guts and sweets were overflowing onto the floor. Bloodstained, sticky, sticky, sloppy, pulpy, sweet candy stuck to each finger, gummy, gummy. <sighs> but it's stained with their entrails, sloppy, pulpy. What was that I stepped on just now that didn't feel like a candy or a cookie or a fizzy lemon sweet or a chocolate? <sighs> so scared I can't even look at the bottom of my foot to see what I stepped on. <laughs> What a gruesome Halloween party! From far away, it looked really beautiful, fantastical, and fun. And when you see it up close, it's really terrible, disgusting, and yet still somehow beautiful. <laughs> Rosa's wild thoughts tried as best as they could to escape her throat with a loud voice that was neither a scream nor a roar. Crow Summer. This is horrible. Just horrible! A ambulance! The police! Th that's right, the police! 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 If a word tied to reality like police hadn't come out of Goda's mouth, Rosa and the rest would probably still have been unable to escape this nightmarish party. But that wasn't because they thought the police might be able to do something. If they didn't say police, police, out loud, it felt like another seat would be set up at the this demon's party and given to them. It felt like their own stomachs were getting uncomfortably filled from the inside. Rumbling, churning. It was surely because candy was starting to overflow from their stomachs. Rosa was again tortured by a desire to vomit and threw up her stomach acid on the floor. And then she searched to see whether there was any candy mixed in. <laughs> any 
Anyway. <coughs> Rosa coughed violently again and violently spat up the stomach acid that burned her throat onto the floor. She realized that by now, her whole body had become covered in filthy sweat. So, like, is the anime like Higurashi where they show the violence that was only described in the VN as excessively as possible? Yes, it is absolutely like that. Uh, part of the reason why I don't think the anime adaptations are very good, because I think they lack restraint. I mean, I know there's only so much you can do, but I think the prose communicates it far better and focuses more on the actual, like, internal feelings of the characters and their internal monologues, which I think is way more important than the actual, like, surface-level, like, gore stuff that's happening. <clears throat> Genji-san, Shannon-chan, please ask Father for instructions. Go to Sun, go together with Kanon kun and call the police. Then have Dr. Nanjo come here and... Have Nanjo come here and what? It's way too late for medical care. The servants accepted their orders and dashed outside. After watching them leave, Rosa once again fixedly cast her eyes upon her siblings, who had been through life's joys and sorrows with her and their partners. Even though there could be nothing more tragic, for some reason, their fantastical deaths tempted her to describe them as beautiful. They're not here. Where'd they go? The servant room and the kitchen are both empty, too. What the hell happened? <sighs> Mama! Mama! Where are you? My letter! My letter I got from Beato! Give it back! Give it back! <sighs> uh, perplexing. Bathurkan, are you sure it was Auntie Rosa? Uh, well, I was half asleep, so I'm not too confident. But I get the feeling that, at dawn, Auntie Rosa came in and fished around in Maria's handbag. I was just half asleep and assumed that there was a tube of toothpaste or something in Maria's handbag. Why would there be a tube of toothpaste in Maria's handbag? I'd bet my ass you dreamed the whole thing. Battler vaguely remembered Rosa entering the cousin's room, and Maria, who had woken up first, had started rampaging around, saying that someone had opened the envelope that she had been keeping safe. And so they started wondering whether Rosa might have come and opened it. A letter from the Golden Witch. I wonder what was inside. Who knows? But the envelope was one with the Ushirimiya family crest on it for father's per grandfather's personal use. Pother. <laughs> oh, my, my grandpather. It's hard to believe that there was... Uh, that what was in there doesn't have anything to do with the family conference. She hadn't let anyone touch it, but yesterday Maria had bragged a lot about the envelope to Battler and the rest, so they remembered it well. <laughs> Mama, give it back! Mama, give it back! <laughs> if you're right, George Aniki, it sounds pretty important. But if it was so important, why did the witch give it to Maria? I don't have a clue. The refreshing morning atmosphere had been completely wiped out by the occasional sounds of thunder. It was only natural. Since the time they had woken up, they hadn't met anyone other than themselves. It felt like the mansion had become an empty husk, leaving only them behind. Hey! Anyone there? Answer me! After Jessica called down into the hallway, an answer finally came back. It was from the entrance hall. I can hear you. Has something happened? It's Dr. Nanja. Great. It looks like everyone hasn't disappeared from this island but us. Dr. Nanja, good morning. Um, sorry, but do you know where our parents went? Mm, dear me. I've only just come here after waking up, you see. I have no idea, I'm afraid. It was only natural. Nanjo was a guest like the rest of them. He had just now come to pass the time in the parlor until breakfast. <laughs> Dr. Nanjo, Mama took it! Mama took my letter! Give it back! Give it back! <laughs> Maria buried her face in Nanjo's well-built stomach, sobbing and crying. Nanjo could do nothing but be bewildered at what was going on so early in the morning. Mm. Someone's running this way. Jessica! Someone's coming! From down the hall, they could sense people running hurriedly. When they looked, they saw that it was Goda and Canon. Running inside the mansion should have been immodest for a servant. And yet, Battler and the rest didn't think to even question that now. 
Maria's sobbing had become so unmanageable they wanted to ask someone, anyone, where Rosa was. But these two servants ignored Jessica as she waved her hand. Gota flew into the servant room, and Canon, noticing that Nanjo was there, bowed and approached him at a quick pace and whispered something into his ear. What did you say? Rosa saw this? Yes. I will guide you, so please accompany me. All right. This way. Without saying anything more than that, Canon finally noticed Jessica and bowed to her, but he wasn't calm. He dash dashed back down the corridor by which he had come, followed by Nanjo. By looking at how hurried they were, Battler and the rest realized that something bad really had happened. They saw Gota through the door to the servant room, which had been flung open. He had the telephone receiver in hand and was violently pressing the hook. From that, they realized that he was trying to call a hospital, or the police, or in any event, he was trying to call someone because a serious emergency had occurred. Let's go see what's going on. Yeah. Mama, give it back! Give back my letter! It's an invitation to the Golden Land! They didn't know what, but something was happening. Battler and the rest chased after Kanon and Nanjo. Ah. Uh, and then we realized. Kanon couldn't have called Dr. Nanjo, but he hadn't called us. So we never should have followed. I wonder if Alice didn't regret her excess curiosity when she chased after the rabbit holding the clock. No! You mustn't come in! You mustn't look! Jessica-chan! No! <laughs> yeah, I, I can't even... I can't even reach the volume that I'm gonna need for that one right now. You know what somebody in grief screaming sounds like. <clears throat> Mom! Dad! What? What happened? <laughs> What the hell is this? There's a limit to how degenerate you can be! Is it taking someone's life enough? What the hell is this?! After you killed them, you'd actually bother to sit them on chairs, slice their stomachs, and stuff a ton of sweets inside?! Why? Why the fuck would you do something so sick?! Fuck this! Fuck this! Great work, shithead! Looks awesome! Looks fucking awesome! Ugh! It would be better if you all went outside. There's no way that you they would want you all to see them this way. Nanjo told the children to go outside, but no one lent him an ear. Rosa-san, please tell them. If they keep looking at something like this, it will do nothing but harm. Rosa regretted her own carelessness. She should have been able to anticipate that the children would eventually come here. She would have quickly locked it instead of standing around. So now the children have come. They had seen it. Surely, in this very moment, they were having a sight burned into their eyes, which was far more grotesque than the gross out food Rosa had seen in her youth. While she hugged Maria, who seemed to have forgotten her emotions as she stared dumbfounded at the horrible scene, Rosa shed copious tears for them and their parents. The four groaning and crying, crying voices, their sadness, continued to echo into a place which should have known God's love. You piece of shit! Again! Another one of these murders! And yet again, you made an elaborate... You made it all elaborate, killing them like it's a perfect joke! <laughs> I was hoping I'd hear words of gratitude rather than grief from you. Gratitude? Did you say gratitude, you old bitch? Damn it, if there's something wrong with your ears, I'll cut them both off so you can hear better. Why should I have to say, Oh, thank you very much, Beatrice, you some, uh, about this supremely fucked up way of killing. I'll beat you to death! <laughs> in the last game. You were grieving that you couldn't see your parents' faces when they died, I believe. So I left them. Didn't touch them. Take a good long look and see that without a doubt your father and the others have been killed. Really? Wow! You deserve full marks for top service. I'm so happy. I swore that if I choked the life out of you, I'd plow your face, but I take that back. I'll drag out your guts. <laughs> Don't give in to emotion and stop thinking. My game has already begun, you know. <laughs> I decided to leave the corpses clean this time. Do you know why? When you denied my existence in the last game, you denied me by thinking in the following way. That is, their faces are crushed so the identities of the corpses cannot be confirmed. Therefore, the possibility that fake corpses had been prepared to create an alibi cannot be eliminated. 
As long as that possibility cannot be excluded, the human culprit theory can be maintained. What did you say? <laughs> Come, Battler. Are you sure you wish to leave the examination of the corpses to Nanjo? Isn't it a traditional in mystery novels for the doctor who performs such examinations to be an accomplice? <laughs> then don't leave the examination to Nanjo. Do it yourself. Make completely sure that without a doubt the six corpses are the people claimed. That they aren't pretending to be dead. That they really, really are dead. To make sure that your father and mother really have been killed by pulling, the, having their stomachs cut open and their entrails pulled out. I suggest you stick your hand inside their stomachs and feel around inside. <laughs> I won't cry. Damn it. Damn it. I won't cry. Battler suddenly yelled. His tears were still dripping down, but as though scolding himself for being girly, he slapped his face hard several times with both hands. Even so, the tears still wouldn't stop. However, he felt a hot blaze ignite in both of his eyes. Whoever the bastard is who pulled this detestable bullshit, I'll make him pay back his debt completely. So this isn't the time to cry. Think about what you're gonna do. Uh, this is no good. It's no goddamn good at all. If you have no enough time to spare to cry, then think. This is not the time to be working your lacrimal glands. Rather than pure hatred, maybe it was more of an evasive hatred to blot out his sadness. However, it gave a little courage to George and Jessica, who were being crushed by sadness. That's right. And even if we cry, the reality of what's happened here won't change. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. What am I supposed to do then? What am I supposed to do for mom and dad? Rosa Soma, I have returned. Godasan, what happened with the police? What did they say to do? Did they say when they think they'll be able to get here? Regarding that, it seems the telephones are out of order. I also tried for the emergency wireless, but um, perhaps it's the weather, but that isn't working either. What did you say? So you're saying we can't contact the police? It's her. She did something to the phone line and made it so we can't contact the police. When she heard that the telephones were out of order, Jessica immediately decided that it was the work of that mysterious guest. Her eyes were bright red after so much crying, and they began to grow even more red with rage. There's not even any room for debate anymore. I understand everything. I know the truth. Who killed Mom and Dad? It's obvious. It's her. It has to be that witch or whatever who came yesterday. I'll grab her by the collar. Damn it, damn it, damn it! Jessica chan wait! Gudasan, Kanonkun, go! I yes. Uh, my lady, wait! Covering her unfocused sadness with anger, Jessica ran outside, torn apart by emotion. Thinking about it hastily, maybe the mystery guest, Beatrice, who had arrived yesterday, was suspicious. However, at the current time, there was absolutely no proof that she was the culprit. At this moment, she was nothing more than a simple guest, and only one of many. So Rosa had to make an adult decision and stop Jessica in her hasty rampage. Goda and Canon realized that immediately and chased after her. Could Beatrice, the guest that no one invited, be the culprit? I understand how Jessica feels. I also want to make myself think that. It doesn't matter who. I want to make someone the culprit and bash them right in the face. But before that, we have to understand things clearly. Who is this Beatrice? I haven't even seen her face. <laughs> If you're looking for her face, it decorates the big portrait in the mansion. You still don't remember her face after looking at it for so long? <laughs> Come on, Maria. What's so funny in a situation like this? Beatrice is a witch, and the ritual to open the door to the Golden Land has finally begun. These six people are sacrifices. <laughs> now the witch's banquet shall begin. Tonight is Halloween. The witches gather now in celebration. <laughs> Maria. Oh, no, wait, that's... Maria, how many times have I told you to stop laughing in that creepy voice? The crisp sound of Rosa slapping Maria's cheek echoed through the high-ceilinged chapel. It kind of feels like, ever since the rain started yesterday, no, ever since the island had become wrapped up in the typhoon, something has gone crazy. 
I had arrived in Rokenjima while it was clear and had taken a nap because I had gotten up early. When I woke up, it had already started raining. And after I got up, that's when it all started. Suddenly, a mysterious visitor had arrived, calling herself the Golden Witch, Beatrice. And it feels like the, word had started skew the world had started skewing bit by bit into something insane. What happened while I was taking that nap? During that time, had this island been cut off, trapped in a different world where common sense doesn't apply? Who is this person called Beatrice? Is she some unknown person trying to involve themselves with the inheritance problem like our parents were freaking out about at dinner last night? Or is the culprit the witch from the Legend of the Gold like Maria says? Even if Jessica hadn't let her short temper get the better of her, in this situation, the visitor was probably the most suspicious. But we mustn't jump to conclusions just like that. Yeah, that's no good. No good. No goddamn good at all! I smacked my face with both hands again, cooling off my brain before it overheated even though it might have been a waste of, waste of effort. This is one of Grandfather's envelopes. On a tray piled up with sweets that decorated the table, oh, George Aniki found a western envelope which had the Ushiramiya family crest done on it in golden leaf. And it was opened. Unopened, rather. So, doesn't this mean it was sent to us? It was something that Dad and the rest... If it was the, something that Dad and the rest had read, it should be open. It seems your reasoning is correct. Look what's written here. It says, to those who remain. Is that a letter the culprit left? What's inside? Aniki, let's open it. After nodding silently, George Aniki opened it. A folded letter came out. I'll read it. Welcome to Rokenjima, ladies and gentlemen of the Ushiramiya family. I am Beatrice, the alchemist for this family, under the employ of Kinzo-san. That letter really was a joke. This Beatrice, who called herself the family alchemist, had announced that she was collecting the gold she had lent grandfather, along with the interest. Uh, did they add the letter to- yes. And, uh, yes, it is the exact same letter from last time, as far as I can tell. Yes, it is the exact same letter that they, uh, read at dinner in episode one. And that interest was everything the grandfather had created. Since this tragedy was right before our eyes, as this paragraph was read aloud, it clearly wasn't referring just to the wealth the grandfather had built up. It was literal. Everything the grandfather had given birth to. In other words, all of grandfather's descendants were included in the interest. Batshit insanity! What a screwed up contract! So lives are the interest for gold, are they? That's like a deal with the devil. Is this how you pretend to be a witch? Ha! Real goddamn funny! Special clause. However, if someone is able to discover the hidden gold of this contract, Beatrice must abandon these rights for all time. Hmm. Kinzo-sama has already publicly displayed the location of the hidden gold within the epitaph under my portrait. So, it's something like this. If the motive for these murders was a collection of the interest, the condition for stopping them is to find the hidden gold she gave to Grandfather. Is that what it's saying? Is what it's saying. And it also says that the secret to this is hidden in the epitaph from that portrait. So, this is a letter of challenge from the witch. Break the ciphertext de describing the location of the hidden gold, if you can. And it's saying that if we can't, the collection of the interest will continue as planned. I'll beat you to death, no problem! Batlerkin, look, look here. The table had been full of sweets. So even though they had been right in the open, we had assumed they were just sweets. I mean, come on, you'd find stuff like this a lot, right? You know, boxes of chocolate, shaped like golden ingots. Th these are not boxes of candy. They're the real thing. These are real goddamn gold bars. It's inscribed with the crest of the one-winged eagle. I've heard Mother talking about this before. This is a gold bar from the legend of Grandfather's Gold. Gold ingots, three of them, weighing a full 10 kilograms each, were piled up in the very center of the table. It was where the cake would be placed if it was a birthday party. In other words, this was without a doubt the birthday cake of the party known as the family conference. If these really are four nines, purity ingots. <sighs> They're worth about 60 million yen. You stupid bitch! That's way too cheap! Six of our parents have been killed, and the gold you throw our way is a measly 60 million yen? 
Don't take us for fools, damn it! <laughs> so it has begun, Beatrice. It's not like anyone can solve this riddle anyway. So, Beato, you definitely win! Hurry up and open the gold door to the Golden Land and take me away. <laughs> boy. All right, we'll go for about 30 more minutes. I don't think we're going to finish this chapter, but uh, we'll see where we can get. Milady, please, calm yourself. We still don't know who the culprit is, and Beatrice summons an important honored guest to the master. So what? If we grab her by the collar, she'll definitely confess. If we can look her in the eye, we'll know. I'll see through her. A witch? Beatrice? I'll expose her for who she is. Jessica never stopped moving. Goda and Kanon chased after her, doing their best to convince her, but Jessica never lent them an ear. Eventually, the witch's VIP room came into view. This VIP room was always sealed and never used. No matter what kind of guest came, Kinza wouldn't let them in this wouldn't let them in this room. And yet, the servants were always made to clean this room so that it could be used at any time. So the servants had started calling this room the witch's VIP room after their other shapeless master. Jessica also knew this, and she couldn't stand that woman's arrogance in calling herself a witch by staying in that room. Oh no, yeah, we're not finishing the episode in this stream, that's for sure. Um, oh, whoops, I did not mean to do that. Uh, I would say that we probably got at least two more streams of episode two left after this, I would imagine, something like this. The Golden Witch was just a fairy tale. Come on, a witch? To Jessica, she was nothing more or less than the murderer who had just brutally killed her parents. Question her, make her give painful excuses, make her spit at the ground painfully, make her breathe painfully. No matter how hard she pretends to be a witch, I'll teach her that she's just a stinking, sweaty human. Ezra with the $10, your ability to seamlessly voice so many characters is super impressive. Thank you for your awesome performance. Thank you so much. I'm really putting a lot of effort into it. <laughs> And I, and I have to give props to Austin, who is just sitting behind me playing TF2 while I have to exclaim like these people are literally, like, losing their fucking minds. <laughs> what, what the fuck is going on? I'm sorry. Uh, the first murders happened in this episode. Uh, uh they deserved it. <laughs> you know, fair enough. D don't feel bad for them. Don't cry for them. They're already dead. <laughs> Jessica hit the door to the VIP room while yelling with all of her strength. It definitely wasn't a knock. That sound of the beating of her anger's hammer, whose message was clear. If the woman didn't open the door, she'd break it down. Open it, Beatrice! Come out! You hear me, right? Open up! There was no answer. Jessica twisted the doorknob without any reservation, but she felt the resistance of the lock. Jessica turned to the two servants and spat at them demandingly. The master key opens this, right? Open it! Milady, that would be horribly rude. Although Goda was flustered, he was still tried to somehow calm Jessica's anger. After hanging his head silently for a while, Kanon pulled a master key from his jacket pocket. Kanon-san, is that all right? I'm aware that this will be rude if she's there. And in any case, if Beatrice-sama has nothing to do with this, she just has to explain herself so that we can believe her. Th that's right, exactly! Give it here! Jessica snatched the master key from Kanon's hand and violently shoved it into the keyhole. Immediately, there was a light sound and she felt it unlocked. And without excusing herself, she flung open the door. Beatrice! Where are you? Show yourself! Jessica rudely barged into the room. The witch wasn't anywhere to be seen. Bitch! She's not here! Where the hell did she go? She doesn't appear to be here, does she? Jessica, thinking that she might be hiding somewhere inside the room, peeked behind the curtains and under the bed, but she couldn't find anyone. However, there definitely were signs that the bed had been used. And although it's an odd way to say it, the atmosphere in the room had grown a little softer. It wasn't the hard atmosphere of a place normally devoid of people, like the chapel. You could definitely tell that someone had, been sp had spent the night in this room. But she could not be seen. I'm gonna grab a Coke real quick. <clears throat> mm. 
No, not Code Red. I'm not a Code Red drinker. That's all Austin. <clears throat> In reality, neither Jessica nor Goda had met Beatrice yet. They had only been told by those who had met her that she was the spitting image of the person in that portrait, so they were doubtful about what her face really looked like. However, Canon alone had met her, and he understood what kind of being that witch was, and what kind of character she had. So he knew that if they were to force their way in here searching for her, she wouldn't let things go as they planned. See, mu she must be watching us bitterly flail about in vain from somewhere, sneering at us. She's that kind of person. Because he was looking at things that way, Canon was the first to find it. The other two were concentrating on finding the shape of a person, so they hadn't noticed. Near a water jug on the side table, there was a single sheet of writing paper. It was accompanied by a short message and a fountain pen, which had probably been used to write it. Canon understood the witch. The witch would definitely ridicule them, as they found the six corpses, forced their way in here in rage, and were unable to find her. Ridicule has no meaning unless it is communicated. So in other words, this was definitely that. Milady, there's something written here. Written? What? Jessica quickly dashed over and violently stole the piece of paper. She probably wasn't trying to be violent. She just couldn't control her strength now. What? <sighs> she... she's mocking me? As soon as she read the message, Jessica went into a wild rage, crumpled the paper up, and threw it. Then she grabbed a table lamp that was by the side of the bed and violently swung it around, mercilessly hitting the walls and furniture with it. The light bulb shattered at once and scattered its shards across the room. M my lady, please, calm yourself. You'll hurt yourself. Let go. Damn it. Damn it. Show yourself, Beatrice. How could you do that to mom and dad? Are you that damn scared of me? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Come out so I can beat you to death. I told you to let go of me, damn it! This was written on that paper. Did you think I'd waste my time waiting comfortably in this place for you to barge in here? You're too wild to be suitable for this intellectual night. What kind of faces must your parents have had after raising you to be such a hapless fool? Yeah, I saw them. They had perfectly stupid faces just like you. Now they're in Candyland with their bellies all full. It sounded like something that witch would write. It meant that she had predicted that one of the children who had lost their parents would come running in here. If she was hiding somewhere in this room, she would surely be rolling around with laughter. The witch was that kind of person. She sneered at people's misfortune, using it to stave off the boredom of a thousand years. Hand it over. I'm telling you that you'll hurt yourself. I said let go. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> Goda grabbed the table lamp Jessica had been swinging around and took it from her. Because if she kept swinging it around, she might hit something and get injured. To Goda's eyes, Jessica probably looked mad with rage, burning with the flames of anger. But Canon's eyes saw it differently. They were probably tears of sadness hidden by rage. Therefore, when at the moment the table lamp was taken from her, Jessica dropped to the floor almost as if groveling and started crying and scratching at the carpet. Goda was surprised, but Canon was not. Her way of crying by brandishing her anger had been stolen from her, so this was inevitable. Considering that she was the daughter of the Ushiramiya main family, she was in a very shabby state. She scratched at the carpet with her fingernails, and even her feet writhed and scratched at it. Jessica cried very, very hard. Because if she didn't, her rage would start building up again and swallow her up. But over and over again, she remembered that letter's humiliating message. What kind of faces must your parents have had after raising you to be such a hapless fool? <laughs> they aren't stupid! <laughs> Both mom and dad were smart. They weren't like me. They really were smart. 
They are stupid. Take it back. Take it back. Yeah, I saw them. They had perfectly stupid faces, just like you. Now they're in Candyland with their bellies all full. Her stomach and make her meet the same end. <laughs> As Jessica cried and screamed, she triggered an asthma attack. The servants watching over her ran up to her hurriedly and rubbed her back, but that only provoked Jessica's wrath. <laughs> if you have time to do that, search for the bitch. Find her and bring her to me. If you won't go, then I will. And I'll kill her with my own hands. I'll slice her stomach. <coughs> Don't touch me. Fuck. Fuck her. <coughs> Jessica got up unsteadily, and as her asthma continued, she went out into the hallway. Milady, your medicine, quickly. I'll call Dr. Nanjo. Go to son. Would you leave this to me? Kenon had noticed. Gerda, who was much older, probably couldn't feel the tears in Jessica's heart. Kenon, who had noticed that himself, had to support her. Kenon, son. Is that all right? I believe the milady needs some time to cry for now. After seeing her parents, when they were killed like that. <sighs> You're right. Gerda also understood and he knew of the modest relationship that Jessica and Canon shared. So he understood everything and left it to Canon. I understand. I'll go back to Rosasama. Please take care of my lady. Yes, leave it to me. Canon's voice was frail, but he nodded forcefully. After looking at his eyes, Gota also nodded forcefully. Gota was a veteran with many years behind him. He had seen a great number of people in his life so he knew of the vigorous sparkle that could be found in the eyes of those who had self-control. He had seen that clearly in Canon's eyes. Therefore, he would leave this to Canon. Thinking about it, this may have been the first moment that Gota had trusted Canon and relied on him for a job. It seemed Jessica was heading towards her room, leaning against the wall as she suffered from her asthma. Canon followed after her wordlessly. If she had asked for a, for a hand, he would have jumped over and supported her. But as long as Jessica didn't ask for that, he hid himself watching over her from a distance where he could come to her rescue at any time. As Canon remained in that spot where 10 billion people would hope for someone else to be where their hearts felt like they would... Wait, okay, hold on, let me try that again. As Canon remained in, a, in that spot where 10 billion people would hope for someone else to be when their hearts felt like they would explode from sadness. Okay, yeah. He silently watched Jessica's back. Then, finally, she was crouching in front of the door to her own room. The asthma attack had stolen all of her strength, and her thoughts had gotten hazy from the lack of oxygen so that the, she could no longer stand up. But right now, Jessica wasn't thinking that she wanted someone to lend a hand, because she still hadn't been able to overcome the flames of anger. Because even if someone had offered her a hand with good intentions, right now Jessica would start wanting to grab it and lacerate it, and she understood how unreasonable that would be. Until she could overcome the flames of her anger, she definitely wouldn't ask for help. Probably, Jessica no longer even had the willpower to call for help. But Canon heard it. He definitely heard it. Canon definitely heard that wordless call for help, which is shared by those from across the world who are grieving, and which, though they scream and scream, cannot be heard by anyone. Canon softly knelt by Jessica's side, and wordlessly offered her a shoulder. Even as Jessica kept coughing painfully, she accepted it, unlocked her room, and entered. This way. I'll prepare your medicine right away. <coughs> <coughs> Jessica had often said that when she let her asthma run its course, it hurt so badly that it felt like she would vomit her whole stomach. Her face was pale and her gaze wavered, and yet the coughing continued. Even so, her sadness was probably even stronger. After having her sit on the bed, Kenon took an inhaler from a cute basket on a side table by the bed and handed it to her. Jessica sometimes forgot to walk around with her medicine. When it seemed that this was the case, Kenon would take notice and secretly carry around the inhaler from the first aid kit in the servant room, but he hadn't done so today. 
He scolded himself, as though wondering how, after failing to bring it with him on a day like this, he could call, call, he could call himself furniture. Then he remembered the day when he spoke that word. He had spoken that word, and somehow betrayed Jessica's feelings, which jarred Canon's heart. But compared to Jessica's current sadness, he thought of that as a far more shameless emotion, and he suppressed it in the depths of his heart. When she inhaled her medicine, Jessica's wild breathing calmed down bit by bit, and she was finally able to regain her composure. But the strength and willpower she had lost wouldn't allow her to rise up from the bed. <clears throat> Are you all right, milady? I'm all right. I'm all messed up over mom and dad. But after I cry a little longer, it'll be all right. Kenon regretted misspeaking. He had said, are you all right, to her. Was he really unable to notice the pain in her heart? This was why he was ultimately mere furniture. This was why he couldn't become human. I'll be in the corridor. If you need anything, please call me immediately. Cannon understood that she still needed some time to cry alone. He told her to call him any time, bowed and made to leave the room. Is there something? Jessica had spoken as though she wanted him to stop, so Cannon had stopped. If she asks it, I'll do anything to help her. If I could heal the pain in her heart right now, I would even become a cane or a chair. If by doing that, I can repair the pain in her heart I gave her that day. For a while, Jessica stared into Cannon's eyes, as though, despite stopping him, she had nothing to say. For a while, neither spoke. Jessica broke that silence, with a small voice. Sorry. It's nothing. Could you tell Auntie Rosa that I want to be alone for a while? I won't let you be alone. I won't let you be alone. So, I will be in the corridor at any time. Call me. For just an instant, it looked like some kind of hope flew to Jessica's eyes, but it was very faint and disappeared like the first snow does on the surface of a river. Thanks. For just a while, let me cry alone. Yes. Excuse me. Kenon bowed once again and closed the door. He thought he had said something to give her courage, but for some reason it felt like he had actually hurt her. Why? He didn't know. Surely that was because he was furniture. So even now, he couldn't grasp human sadness. As Kenon repeatedly questioned himself, he walked down the corridor. He felt like the window at the end was coolly calling to him. In the end, am I nothing more than furniture after all? It was still, still pouring outside, a dark gray world. Even on days like this, Shannon would surely look at the ocean and know it was blue. But to my eyes, even if it cleared up, I would only see gray. As long as I cannot tell the blueness of the ocean, I'm nothing but furniture imitating a person. You really don't understand a woman's heart. In times like that, you should silent really, bleh, silently remain by her side. I fucked up the line. Don't make fun of me. God damn it. <laughs> That's why you're furniture. You, you. There shouldn't have been a trace of anyone in this corridor. It should have been empty and cold. But those scoffing words approached Canon from behind. When he turned around, he saw that witch. That witch who hadn't shown herself when Jessica had searched for her with a rage bordering on madness, who had left that sneering letter to toy with her. There are three ways to hurt a woman. Let me teach them, just for you. One is to hurt them with a knife, another is to hurt them in their heart, and the last one is the most difficult and the most effective way of hurting them. And yet, it can hurt them without you even realizing it. Do you know what it is? How, 
How could I know? I don't even want to know. It is to betray their hopes. No living being is more of a dreamer than a woman. They dream by themselves and hurt by themselves. A distant man like you hurts women the most. You couldn't understand. You don't have a clue how much you've injured Jessica. Because you're furniture. <laughs> I have no intention of going along with your nonsense. Did you appear only to sneer at me? Don't be so full of yourself, furniture. You aren't worth sneering at. <laughs> Still, even though you may not be worth it alone, if the two of you are gathered, well, it's more than enough. I never get tired of the pleasure that comes from laughing at the fate of a young couple. What did you say? You, you aren't thinking. Not my lady. I need two who were close as sacrifices for the second twilight. The two of you truly are convenient. Wait. Don't misunderstand. Milady and I don't have that kind of relationship. We can't become the next sacrifices for the second twilight. <laughs> That's why you hurt Jessica. That's why you cannot become human. Very well. If you won't admit that you have feelings for Jessica, I can accept that. But I'll kill Jessica. Why? You idiot! Isn't it obvious? It'll be fun to kill her and see the pained look on your face. Why else? Following the rules of the ritual, I will arbitrarily select 13 people as sacrifices. However, there's no rule saying that I can't kill any more. I think if I think it's fun, I can kill any number of people. So I will kill. Make me laugh as hard as I can. All right, furniture. Can on. At that time, Canon definitely heard Jessica's scream. The instant he blinked and looked down the corridor, the witch who had been there, making a perfectly ordinary face until a second ago, had disappeared. Right now, it was just him, standing alone in the corridor. And the person he wanted to protect was asking for help, and was right over there. It was obvious what he should do. It wasn't logical. It was an electric reaction, without a trace of hesitation or idle thoughts. That person he wanted to protect was there, and asking for help. So in that moment, he genuinely felt he wanted to be the person who was there with her. When he flew into Jessica's room, his eyes latched on to a bizarre scene. The room was a fantastical world where a blizzard of golden powder danced, almost as though gold leaf had been scattered inside a snow globe. No, that's not it. I've seen this spectacle before. You know, even though I was like, oh, we're only gonna go for about like, you know, 10 minutes at this point, we're pretty far midway into this scene. So I feel like even if we go a little bit over, maybe I should finish this scene just because, well, you'll get, you guys will see. <clears throat> it won't take that much longer though, I don't think. This isn't gold leaf. It's countless gold butterflies, Beatrice's minions. Jessica was surrounded by countless butterflies and was waving her hands around, trying frantically to bat them away. Milady, Canon can help. <coughs> Canon rushed towards Jessica and violently brushed the group of butterflies away. The butterflies, beautiful yet filthy, surrounded Jessica's face. Face. Why did I? Okay, whatever. Trying to crawl in through her mouth and nose, Jessica gagged violently almost as though the butterflies were triggering her asthma attack, sneering at her. Indeed, when Canon ran towards Jessica as she choked, the butterflies stopped attacking her, and at this time they began to elegantly dance a rondo around the two. Canon could Canon could It's all right. While there's still life in my eyes, I won't let anyone lay a finger on you. Show yourself, Beatrice! Are you satisfied now? As he guarded Jessica, in pain and using her inhaler, Canon yelled into the empty air. When he did, the empty air definitely laughed back, satisfied. Then she showed herself. It wasn't in response to Canon's demand. 
It was obviously because appearing and sneering humiliated them even more, and it was, and was more fun. <laughs> now everything follows the plot. Now you are carp on the chopping board. Now, no, since the two of you are together, should I call it duck with green onions? Uh, let's check the cultural note to understand what she is saying here. Duck and green onions are the primary ingredients for a duck stew, and this gave rise to the Japanese phrase, a duck comes bearing green onions, in which a duck approaches carrying its own seasoning, ready to be eaten. This metaphorically refers to a situation where a series of lucky coincidences benefits you without any effort, or alter alternatively, when a naive person brings you what you want while unaware of the disadvan disadvantage to themselves. Perhaps because of this, a mark, or a sucker in terms of scams, is often called a duck in Japanese. <clears throat> <laughs> you, you, Beatrice! Please stand back. I'll protect you, my lady. It's essential that the witch appears when the princess and knight are together. Come now, won't you show me how much power Kinzo's furniture holds? She snapped her finger, and there was a piercing sound. Oh, we're getting to it. When she did, a bizarre cloud of a, a blizzard of gold butterflies started up, and they began to form a small mountain as they whirled around in a circle. Just like how a cold, wintry wind swirls and creates a mountain of leaves. From that mount, mound of gold, a hand sprouted, and it appeared as though a resident of the world below was crawling out. What, what is this? What's going on? Jessica couldn't comprehend what she was seeing right now, and her mouth kept flapping open and closed. It was a literal attempt to take in and digest knowledge, to understand the incomprehensible. That which was crawling up was probably an attendant serving the witch. It appeared to be wearing a uniform following the pattern of those who serve, but its face was different. It was strange looking. It was covered with pitch black hair. It breathed rotten breath, and its eyes were filled with the same strange subterranean glow as lava. And the symbol of those who are not human, a pair of horns. It was the figure of a goat-faced attendant who served the witch. <laughs> Jessica could no longer decide what to say. All this happening in front of her couldn't be explained with common sense, and she couldn't do anything except open and close her mouth. Jessica hadn't noticed that this island had already been cut off from the rules of this world, but even so, she could understand that this goat attendant was the witch's familiar, and it was after her life, and it seemed that the witch had already ordered that, and she faced Canon with an expectant gaze. She faced him with a provocative gaze filled with expectation, as though asking him how he planned to protect this maiden. The attendant had look as, looked especially like a beast when it had been crawling up, but in its composure, you could see that it had more than enough dignity to be called worthy of serving the Golden Witch. And you could tell that it was overflowing with the joy of furniture, wanting to meet its master's expectations. Why don't you show me the power of Kinzo's furniture? Don't get it wrong again, understand? Don't forget that you're furniture. If you continue acting like a human even now, this won't be settled by your death alone. <laughs> the goat attendant made a gesture that seemed to be a silent bow. Was that in response to its master, or was it offered to the opposing canon? Then, on the attendant's hand, a blade of wicked malice appeared. What is... what... that? Jessica had been unable to understand what was happening in front of her for a while now. All she understood was that this thing was gleaming for the purpose of threatening her own life. And right now, that was enough. Canon spoke quietly to Jessica, who was hiding behind his back. My lady, please stay back. Against the wall. Never let your back leave the wall. What? <laughs> The maiden should be obediently hide behind the great knight's back. Relish to the full the pleasure of having a man protect your own life. Come, Canon. Show me your blade. Be 
beautiful. At least when it comes to giving birth to furniture, Kinzo might reach up to my feet. Something like this. Can't even be used to trim the roses. Kenonkun, what is... I didn't want to show you. So, you had the courage to draw your blade. How does it feel to have exposed the fact that you're a subhuman being in front of the girl you have feelings for? Shut up. <laughs> so you feign composure even though you're really burning with wrath? I see. They say the truly hot flames burn a cool blue. Is that how you are now? There's no way I can kill you with my powers. You are the moon. There's no way I can smash the moon by throwing a rock. However, in order to manifest yourself, you had to reflect your image on the surface of the water. If you throw a rock at the surface of the water, you might be able to disturb the moon for some time. But that doesn't mean the moon has been smashed. So... <laughs> Until this life of mine is over, I'll keep on striking your reflection! I like it, Canon. Begin, furniture! Top 10 anime battles, let's fucking go. Oh, a beautiful trail. The witch's words of admiration broke the silence, and for just an instant broke Jessica's paralysis. Uh, am, am I dreaming? Come. Furniture of the witch. I'll beat you down to the hell you came from! A strand of red remained on Canon's cheek. The witch saw this and grinned broadly. <laughs> you may mutter excuses about not being on your game if you wish. Canon-kun, stay strong! It's all right. I won't die yet. The trail drawn by the goat attendant's blade drew a large arc in empty space. Canon wasn't there. He was behind it. Back whither you came, and await your master! Die! In this, if this battle of drawing sparkling trails was chess, then Canon coming from behind was check and press, and press, and press, and press, and mate in seven. Had the goat attendant not even been given the right to go into death throes? As its knees buckled and it fell over, it crumbled softly into a bunch of gold butterflies. So there was no sound of it hitting the ground. Even those who couldn't understand this battle could definitely at least realize that Canon had been magnificent. Hmm. So it couldn't win against one handmaid. It seems... Against one hand, handmade, uh, one, again, uh, yeah, whatever. It seems that you aren't so pathetic. You're next, Beatrice! Cannon's blade sliced diagonally through the witch's form like a hot knife through butter, and in that instant she burst into gold and scattered. She scattered into several thousand gold butterflies, and for just an instant the room was filled with the color of twilight. It was just as Canon himself had said. Attempting to slice Beatrice was just the same as slicing the surface of the water where the moon was reflected. The witch's form was there, with an ordinary expression on her face, as though she had been there the whole time, behind Canon. <laughs> it was quite an interesting show. 
In deference to that, I was going to let you get away, but now your rudeness has caused me to change my mind. Don't lie. I won't let you kill my lady. Even if that's impossible, I won't let you kill her before me. You can't even do that much. Speak not, furniture. Be silent, furniture. Know your place, furniture! Kyonon-kun isn't furniture! Oh? And why do you say that? I don't need a reason. Kyonon-kun is Kyonon-kun. No, his real name is different. But a name doesn't make him furniture. Kyonon-kun has his own way of living. That's a very noble thing, and it's up to him to decide. Seeing he can't have an opinion because he's furniture, or can't have his own life because he's furniture. That's all just crap! Milady, you mustn't provoke her. No, I'm gonna say this clearly. Kanon-kun isn't furniture. He's human. Why? Kanon-kun rushed to save me of his own will. And he stood in the path of you, a fearsome witch. Even though he had many chances to just abandon me, he didn't. Self-sacrifice is part of the noble spirit that only humans have. So Kanon-kun is human. So take it back. Don't ever call Kanon-kun furniture again. Malay. <laughs> Don't speak, human. Let us end this quickly. After all, this is only the second twilight. Now I will sacrifice the two who are close, who accept each other's dignity. Come, arise, forgive the sin. One of the seven stakes of purgatory, lust. The witch summoned her own furniture with a mixture of laughter and anger on her face. Asmodeus the Lustful, right here. I've had enough of this farce. Quickly, execute the second twilight. Do not permit me to blink thrice. As you command. What? Another weirdo's shown up! <laughs> it took Canon less than an instant to understand. That goat face from a second ago had been nothing more than a pawn to the witch. However, there was a marked difference in the value of this piece, of this furniture that had been newly summoned. How lucky I am to be granted such gorgeous prey. <laughs> you scared? How cute. <laughs> Come, furniture of the witch. I won't be killed by you. <laughs> You're acting pretty smart for a slowpoke who can't even follow my moves. Here I come. Hey, hey. Where do you want it? Where do you want me to pierce you? Answer me, cutie boy. Wherever you want it, I'll run you through hard. <laughs> Come on, answer me, cutie. D don't call me cute. <laughs> Here I come, slowpoke. Come on, try to follow me, you blind idiot. follow it with my eyes, but my guess was spot on. Serves you right. Cannon's back had been the target, but Jessica had predicted it. She had predicted that the sneering witch's target would be the complete opposite of fair and honest, his back. But she had no way to block it. She had no aspirations to martyrdom. She simply thought that there was no way other than this to protect Cannon's back so she could do nothing but block it with her own back. The furniture of the witch, which had changed into it, its form into a demon stake, was struck deep into Jessica's back. It was obviously a fatal wound that reached as far as her lungs. When she saw this, the witch let out a loud, evil laugh, because it had hit where the witch had predicted. Everything, everything was as the witch had predicted. What's wrong, Canon? I thought my lady Jessica wasn't going to be killed before you. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it, that's it, that face. That look on your face is what I wanted to see. <laughs> this has been more fun than I... This has been fun, more than enough of it. Enough now. Die, die, make me laugh. 
<laughs> Come, arise, forgive the sin. One of the seven stakes of purgatory, wrath. Satan the Wrathful, right here. The prey is yours. Eat him right now and close the curtain on this stage. If you were a human, I'd say it's time for you to step down. But since you're furniture, maybe I should say it's time for the stage manager to carry you behind the stage. I am not furniture anymore. I won't tell that again. <laughs> oh, you're going to be killed by me again? Your chest, it's so warm and it feels so good to stick myself in there, you know? Come on, let me have another taste. Make me feel good with that hot, hot, fresh blood in that warm chest of yours. <laughs> there was no way to block it. The sound of a woodpecker filled the room, and before he could blink, it was already right in the center of his chest. When you take a piece in chess, it's impossible by the rules for your opponent's piece to defend. So this was an obvious result, and one even specified by the rules. Cannon landed on his knees, and he apologized. Not to the witch, and not to Milady. He apologized to Jessica. Sorry. I couldn't protect you. Don't worry about it. You were really cool. Canon finally fell over. He landed next to Jessica, and the two lay there like Gemini. You know, Canon, you aren't furniture anymore. Yes. I was too late in, in realizing that. I wanted to ask you what your real name was. My real name is... In his last moments, Canon wanted to tell her his real name, but Jessica had already fallen into a sleep from which we would, she would never wake. So Canon's real name which he had protected until today. In the end, he couldn't tell it to Jessica. I became you. <laughs> Those were the last words Canon left behind. Make me laugh, furniture. Even after a hundred years, furniture is furniture. Have you ever heard of an idiot who will dig a grave for furniture when they throw it away? You smash furniture to pieces and make firewood, so though all that's left is ashes. <laughs> that's how it is. No tombstone can be carved for furniture. It seems you believe that when you die, you cannot receive any more humiliation. But that's naive, you see. I'll teach you what it really means to disgrace the dead. <laughs> After taking a puff from her pipe, the witch breathed the smoke at Canon's corpse. When she did, Canon's corpse softly floated up into the air and disappeared as though it had been eaten by a mouth in empty space. The witch played dirty until the very end. The two who had understood one another in their last moments, she would not even permit their corpses to be close. If someone had been watching, they would probably mourn that this was indeed a disgrace to the dead. However, Beatrice was far, far crueler. That would become immediately apparent. Well, I believe that marks a good uh, stopping point, probably. So I'm going to go ahead and save. And uh, you guys, go ahead and give your theories as to what's going on right now as I uh, put up Kyrie MatPat for one.
go ahead and talk about your theories um, while I get Austin and we're going to have the discussion. Hi. Oh, okay, you have your headphones. No, yeah, no, I, I saw we were coming up on midnight, so I wanted to be prepared. <clears throat> it's time yeah. to talk about Fortnite sauce. Yes, okay, so I think I've come up with the answer that's satisfactory in my mind, but I, I suppose it depends on a person's... Uh, personal taste. So, let me ask you, Marcy. Uh-huh. Would you consider salsa a sauce? Um, yeah. Like, yeah. I think it, like, for a second I was kind of like, it's almost more like a jam, but I think that's really cursed to say. Yeah. I mean, like, technically that's true, but for all intents and purposes, like, though you do use it for dipping, you can also use it, you know, you can, you can like, put it on, like, a sandwich or a mm -hmm. taco or mm -hmm. whatever. Also, real quick, let me catch this. June Pop 45 with the $5, gonna cry BRB. Uh, yeah, me too, buddy. Okay, anyway. So, like, obviously, all you really need in salsa to really make it salsa is, like, the mashed tomato. And, like, you can add spices and stuff. Too. Mm -hmm. but basically, mm -hmm. salsa is just mashed tomatoes. Oh, so salsa is Spanish for sauce. So, yes, we're yes, on the right track we're here. literally correct. Uh... So, you know, in Fortnite, they have all these different character costumes with, like, fruits and vegetables and uh -huh. stuff. So I imagine that a Fortnite sauce would be, like, the costumes of those fruits and vegetables all, like, sort of, like, mashed together uh. into, like a, like, a fruity, like, a fruity vegetable sauce. Uh. Interesting. I think you, yeah, you would have to be very deliberate with the amount on that because yeah. you... If you just willy-nilly shove it all together, I think that could get bad very quickly. I think you could do it in, like, a like a certain way, though. Like, it would take some tinkering. You'd have to mess with it. But I, I think if you did, like, a like more vegetable than fruit sort of ratio and you just let, like, some of the sweeter fruits, like, you know, have a have their small place in it sort of, like, as a garnish to the rest of the sauce, you could find a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, David J., thanks for becoming a channel member. Fruity, you say. Depends on the salsa. Pico de gallo isn't a sauce, but people call it salsa in English sometimes regardless. Eh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. That's, um, it, it's all sauce to me. Okay, but so now we've covered the sauce, but as we've established, it also has to be like part of a dish. Yeah. So what's a, like, I don't know, is there like a Fortnite cookbook? Do we have to like just spontaneously make a Fortnite dish? Yeah, we, we just have to like come up with this on the fly. I don't think there's a Fortnite cookbook. Okay, so, like, I know they have, like, Chug Jug. I've never really seen anything about, like, food in the Fortnite universe. Like, they have food costumes. Like, I think they have, like, a hot dog costume or something. But, like, mm -hmm. I don't know what these guys eat. Because, like, I don't know. What's the Fortnite lore? Like, why are they building shit? Why are they dropping from buses in the sky? Like, is the world topsy-turvy? How'd they get Goku there? Yeah. Can, can somebody in the chat please explain Fortnite lore very uh, shortly? Does, is somebody in the chat familiar with Fortnite lore? Also, while you're doing that, let me scroll up and look at a couple of these theories real quick. Um, I don't know what's going on, but I feel witches represent try freedom or some sort. Like, free from reality, logic, and limitations, you enter a deal with them to gain some freedom at a cost. It's an interesting way of looking at it. it certainly seems fitting for some certain characters, considering the whole deal with the Shannon canon and all that. Uh, not a theory since I've read this all before, but having a 19th person makes this story less creepy. The ending of episode one, being all alone, everyone dead, no answers, is so spooky. Very true. I love the horror tone of episode one. Uh, the first chapter, Goda's corpse was actually Kinzo's, uh, which is why all their faces were smashed in. That's an interesting way to think about it. But there's still the matter of the toes. Remember the toes. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, we have to think about the toes. This is, this is vital. Uh, this is crucial. Um, okay, the original Fortnite game was a survive zombie night game. I don't think Fortnite Battle Royale has a story as such. Um, hmm, okay. They gotta build the fort before the night. <laughs> um, I listened to a podcast that once explained the lore, but I already forgot. <laughs> so it does have lore then? I gotta say, none of you are very helpful. I know Fortnite has an explanation for why all the universes crisscross called the zero point. I see. Okay. So does that mean, like, technically, like, any food from any of these universes is, like, 
applicable? I mean, possibly, but I feel like that's getting a little bit broad yeah. at that point. Like, you can just kind of grab anything at that point. Like, I don't, I don't think you can truly have a Fortnite dish if you're like, and my main ingredient is from Rick and Morty. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> just... Wait, Marcy, Marcy, we're stupid! What? We forgot the Fortnite burger! <laughs> 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 Go to Fortnite Burger, ask for it at McDonald's. The look on the workers' faces will be epic. True. Okay, so then it has to be a... Wait, okay. Should it be a pickled sauce? Pickle for a... For... Oh, my God. Um, okay, so... So, yes. So some kind of, like... Some, some kind of, like, fruit sauce. Like, mash. Maybe it's like a like like a like a sort of like candied like jam like salsa mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like you know how like some burger chains have like like the candied bacon like marmalade. Like I think Wendy's had like a thing like mm -hmm. that for a while, mm -hmm. and they added like God, onion sticks right now. and stuff on top of it. Uh, I think maybe it's something like that. Okay. Yeah. I think I think you could do something with that for sure. Uh, it just you know you kind of have to balance the sweetness and the savoriness. Yeah, I yes. I think you also should add a little bit of a little bit of spice to it. I, I feel like maybe I don't know, adding like some pepper jack or like some Monterey mm -hmm. Jack or something like mm -hmm. that would be good. Okay, and then, I mean, obviously you can have chug jug on the side, I guess. Yeah, like a big old chug jug. Uh, I, I think you need like a like a Badlands chug like boot glass, and you just need to like have like a couple gallons mm -hmm. in there. <laughs> This is such a stupid conversation. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let's read a, a couple more theories. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know what this really explains, but at this point I'm convinced that the Golden House is transforming literal couches and dressers into servants. Then love literally completes... The transformation. So, like, you're thinking a reverse Beauty and the Beast situation. Like, Candelabra Canon was the, his original form, and now he has become regular Canon. Watching this as my first reread is a really delightful experience. I have to say my brain was just continuously exploding the stream with all of the layers that have now been revealed to me. Oh, yeah. Umineko becomes almost a completely fucking different book when you read it a second time. It is crazy. Um... Also working under the assumption that Kinzo is the most based person in the family to the point that he doesn't even realize how right he is. Like, all of his magic stuff is right, but he can't see it. Can you imagine? He's just, like, casting spells and shit, and he's like, Oh, the demon's roulette, please come to me, Beatrice. And he's, like, sitting in his room, and he never comes out, and all this magic shit is happening in the hallways. And he's like, Damn, why nothing happening, though? No, Kinzo's the funniest character in Ubi Neko to me. Like, uh, uh, personally, uh... I hate him. But oh yeah, I mean, but of I, course. I, I, I love him. He, he's, he's so fucking funny. Uh, if there was like a dream character that I could voice, uh, like if, if for some reason the seventh expansion was like, okay, we're re-releasing Umi Neko again, and we need to find an English dub voice cast, I would voice Kinzo in a heartbeat. <laughs> God, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, please no uh, Higurashi spoilers in the chat for people who haven't read Higurashi because, you know, uh, this, is, this isn't a Higurashi stream series, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, oh my god, Avadon with the gift of 20 memberships. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to have to sit here and let them all appear on stream, a screen before I uh, leave. So I guess we have to talk about something else until that finishes. Okay. Well, we can't go back to the Fortnite uh, burger yeah. conversation. We put that to rest. Mm -hmm. Should we make the Fortnite burger at some point? I don't know. Like, Do you guys want to see the Fortnite burger? I, I feel like we could potentially do it, but like even though I can cook, I don't know if I can cook that well. It doesn't have to be good. But I want it to be, though. If I'm going to eat it, it might as well be good. I mean, yeah, but... I don't know. I don't know that we have enough material to do a cooking stream, but maybe if we if we end up doing this stupid shit, we'll like record it and put it as like a stream intro or yeah. something. You know what we should do? Like a like this could be like a part of it. I, I think we should like do a cooking stream someday. Like once we have enough content accumulated, we we'll uh -huh. do the cooking stream, and it's all just like a bunch of recipes and stuff we've like mentioned on stream oh yeah we have to keep coming up with joke recipes so that we can have like a big 
a big thing. Yeah, a big powwow, a mukbang. Mm. Those are are those still popular on YouTube? Do people still do mukbangs? I don't know. Uh, try not to burn the kitchen down challenge. We'll lose. Yeah. But uh, it won't be my fault. I won't have to pay for it. The the laugh just continuously going on. Oh, like the uh, the titular Umi Neko laugh. Yeah. The. <laughs> yeah, it it plays for every channel member <laughs> notification. Awesome. Uh. Do I recall my theories when first reading this? God, during this part, I had no idea what the fuck was going on. To be honest with you, I was just kind of like in a in a in a in a moment of like. Just being like, all right, uh, I'm just gonna let this take me where it goes. I have no idea what to think. I'll figure it out later. <laughs> and I did figure it out later. Um, I wonder how many people have just stopped thinking after seeing a sword fight. Well, you know, they did say in the intro text that Beatrice was gonna come at you with her strongest moves. She was gonna try to make you surrender all at once. So if you are doing that right now, then I hate to break it to you, buddy, but uh, you're falling right into the witch's trap. Uh, if it were me, I wouldn't be fighting Beatrice. I would just give her a hug. True. True. Uh, I'm different than all these Yoshiro Mio people. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna finish the story. I haven't actually fully solved these mysteries. Yeah, it's it's tough. I let Beatrice beat me. <laughs> Don't give up, gamers. Never stop thinking. So true. I take Beatrice to an IHOP. I feel like she like, be mystified. Put a, just like put a hand on her shoulder like, hey, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong, Beatrice? You haven't even touched your funny face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, another theory. Maria's related to Beatrice. Like, I feel like she was born under Beato's special sauce and is now like a special vessel for her as a piece of Beato within her. Hmm. That's that's interesting. Like she's like a little matryoshka doll or whatever. Is that? I don't think that's how you pronounce it. It's it. matryoshka that... doll. Okay. Yeah, I was right. I did it. You you just kind of like pronounced the end slightly wrong, but you basically got it. Special sauce. The sauce. The sauce. You're using a little too much sauce. I don't know. That's a perfectly adequate amount that's of sauce. That's a perfectly adequate amount of sauce. Really? I don't know what you're freaking out about. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with the amount of sauce that you put on there. I, I need chat to know <laughs> that, like, we actually have, like, it, it's not a physical counter, but we have, like, a mental counter. Because every day, me and Marcy will just do, like, these over-elongated Spongebob bits. <laughs> and, like, I don't think we can not do one, like... Every, every two hours, like... No, literally, like, uh, Tyson has, like, multiple times, like, heard us doing a Spongebob bit and then been like, and the counter resets to zero. <laughs> like... I, I feel like there's, like, some sort of, like, itch in our brains that will go off and drive us mad until we're convulsing on the floor if we don't do a Spongebob bit at least every two hours. Yeah, you call that Spongebob syndrome. Yeah. They put me in the squid ward. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think we've uh, we've we've lost the plot a very long time ago. I don't think the membership notifications are still going off. Um, I think this is probably a good time to wrap things up. What do you think? Uh huh. Yeah. I I don't have a say in this. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I mean, shit. I, I mean, I was deferring to your opinion, but actually, I'm never gonna ask your thoughts on anything ever again. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't run the stream. I don't have the controls in my hand. You can't just like hand me a nuclear bomb and go I'll figure it out. I can, I can I kill them all. I can kill them all right now. Okay, now we're just doing Nixon. <laughs> my favorite SpongeBob character, Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, 
Okay, okay. We need we need to get out of here. We need to get out of here. S- see you guys later. See you next time. Say goodbye to Kyrie, Matt Pat. Say goodbye to me. Goodbye. <laughs>